time being 5 p.m. Uh, on June 17th, I would like to call the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to order. Uh, Secretary Ringgold, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Commissioner Severson. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Vita. Present. President Cogill. Here. You have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Secretary Ringgold. Um, now I will ask for a motion to the, approve the agenda with two uh, amendments. Uh, one is to under um, the reports from standing committees for the planning committee, uh, taking from the table resolution 2020-206. Uh, pertaining to a retaining wall along Lakes of, Lake of the Isles, and uh, then adding to the, uh, under new business, a resolution uh, 202253, which commissioners should have received uh, about an hour ago pertaining to uh, homelessness uh, and the encampment at uh, Powderhorn Park. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the approval of the agenda. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. I'm sorry, I came late. What are we what are we voting on? Uh, the, agenda. The, the agenda. The uh, agenda. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Thank you, that carries. I will uh, ask now for uh, a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May the 20th, 2020, and Wednesday, June the 3rd, 2020. Do I have such that a moved. motion? Second. I have a motion and a President second. Cogo. Yes, Commissioner Meyer. Um, I brought up an issue with Secretary Ringgold regarding the minutes for May 20th and resolution 22210. I don't think it accurately really describes that, so I'd ask to refer that one, but we would still move the June 3rd one. Are, are you asking to split the question, Commissioner Meyer? <laughs> um, usually, don't we just. Uh, Refer them back to the secretary when someone brings up an, brings up an issue. Uh, so, so in this case, we'll just be. You're calling into question the the to to be clear, calling into question the accuracy of the minutes from Wednesday, June the third. No, May the twentieth. Okay. So I would so, still pass the June third one. Okay, so I will then just ask for this to be a motion on. Uh, the minutes of Wednesday, June the 3rd, 2020, and we'll return the minutes of Wednesday, May 20th. So moved. Second. Second. a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the minutes. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Hassan. 
Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. I'm sorry, aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. You muted. Vice aye. Pre Thank you, Commissioner Forney. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Uh, the minutes for Wednesday, June 3rd carry. Uh, we'll now move into reports of officer, officers, and I'll turn it over to uh, Superintendent Bangora to give us uh, an update on the system. Great. Thank you so much, President Cogill, and commissioners, um, welcome. Um, we'll start off with uh, updates for June 17th, today, 2020, and we'll start with athletics, aquatics, and ice arenas. We'll start with adult sports. So working in partnership uh, with the USTA, we'll be offering modified adult tennis lessons this summer in six locations um, starting on July 6th. Um, ice arenas, uh, modified figure and hockey dating instruction rentals will be offered um, beginning uh, June 8th. And uh, well, began already and community interest has been very high and the sessions are filling up. That's great news. Ambassador program, 90 staff are working in 26 beats during 300 or doing 364 shifts for a total of 2,366 hours. And they continue to do great work in the system, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, golf, golf is approximately uh, 6,000 rounds ahead of our 2019 pace, which is significant. Uh, it has increased revenue by, by up to 33% over expectation. Fort Snelling Golf Course opened on June 4th, uh, 2020, and it booked nearly 2,000 rounds and sold out several days. So it's great news uh, around golf. Uh, recreation centers and programs. Recreation centers will be rolling out uh, distance appropriate programming in all areas of the city this week. We are excited to uh, re-engage youth and families uh, with our offerings. Each service area is planning on a minimum of 35 activities each. Uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Recreation Cox will give a update on that later in uh, the meeting, on the board meeting. Very excited about that. They're doing great work. Youth Development, Rec Plus began Monday, June 8th. Uh, with 313 children enrolled in 13 recreation centers, 30 Teen Teen Works uh, youth ages 16 plus are working in the program. So we're very excited about that, those 75 youth that we hired, uh, they, were, they were hiring, 30 of them are currently working uh, in our Rec Plus program. So what a great opportunity and great experience. Forestry, forestry crews are finished planting uh, 9,400 trees in record time. Arborists have then uh, begun pruning trees to keep them healthy, uh, as well as continuing to remove uh, ash trees. So again, a wonderful year. They planted 9,400 trees. It's pretty impressive. Great work and thank you to the forestry department. Asset management and maintenance. Maintenance staff continue to prepare uh, the park system for visitors, solving issues brought on by the pandemic and while continuing to navigate social distancing uh, guidelines. In addition, uh, due to the civil unrest in the city of Minneapolis, maintenance staff have uh, secured park amenities and buildings while uh, tending to their regular job responsibilities. Uh, they did a phenomenal job um, and very proud of uh, the care for our uh, park system during this very difficult time. So thank you again to the maintenance staff and the work they provided. Elliot, NPRB staff worked in record time to prepare Elliot Park for the large number of attendees uh, for the George Floyd um, funeral services. And um, thank you for uh, the work on that very difficult day and the work that our staff provided 
uh, at Elliott Park uh, to make sure we provided the services for the people that were there. So again, thank you very much for that. Maintenance, staff have begun working to prepare our facilities for Rec Plus programs to resume. Uh, below our in picture number one uh, is Tom Severson from the cement shop at Audubon uh, Park replacing a sidewalk. Uh, in picture two and three are Joe Murdoch and Bill Scott from the plumbing shop uh, repairing a broken pipe at Armitage near the building. And in picture number four uh, is Greg Olson from the carpentry shop installing new glass at Matthews Park. Job well done and uh, they got this done on time for uh, the programs to open. So again, thank you very much for the work uh, that our maintenance team has done out there to prepare these buildings. Um, at Theodore Worth uh, and Gross Golf Course, a new EV, uh, Greens Moor Hybrid Fairway Moor, was deployed and it mowed all greens in a single charge. The hybrid mower uses substantially less uh, gas. So excited about this one. That's just fantastic to see and what a cool machine. And um, boy, I tell you, that's, that was really exciting. So thank you. And I'm really excited to see as we continue to move towards our carbon footprints and this EV uh, mower is, is doing the job. So very proud of that. Environmental management, Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden opening. The Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden and Bird Sanctuary uh, opened on Tuesday, May 19th. The garden is operating with the reduced hours for the season. Staff has implemented new systems to help with social distancing, including a single entrance, a one-way one trail route, staggered entry times, and informal signs, and digital visitor's guide. Uh, in the first few weeks of the 2020 season, over 3,000 people had visited the garden. So new this season uh, are the garden Instagram account, the weekly Facebook Live story time, and the weekly Facebook Live tour of the garden. Fantastic job. So um, the showy lady slippers, Minnesota state flower, are now in bloom. Uh, this species is indigenous to the garden. Several clumps have been added in recent years by staff through rare plant rescue efforts in partnership with the state agencies. And so just beautiful, so thank you for that. Uh, Conservation Corps, the Minnesota and Iowa Youth Outdoors Program. Uh, one conser uh, Conservation Corps of Minnesota and Iowa Youth Outdoors uh, crew started work for the MPRB on May 4th, 2020. The second crew started work uh, the week of June 8th. This year we have a total of nine crew members, one of our largest number of CCMI participants ever. So fantastic, very proud of that. Uh, CCMI uh, Yo is working, or youth, is working uh, for environment management, natural resources, and manage natural areas throughout the park system. Uh, they started the season at Theaterworth Park, putting back to Buckthorn. The crew works uh, with youth ages 15 to 18 on conservation, based on education and service projects during the spring and fall school terms. Uh, this spring, the youth education program did not open due to COVID-19 uh, restrictions. At present, we are anticipating a fall term starting after Labor Day. Uh, quick update on Parks for All uh, virtual summit. Uh, there is still time to participate in the Parks for All community listening session that takes place virtually on Thursday, June 18th from 4 to 6 o'clock p.m. In early June, the, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board postponed the Parks for All virtual park summit. We uh, are outraged and grief-stricken uh, about the death of George Floyd. We also know that racism and violence are systemic issues that we need to address now and into the future. The MPRB's comprehensive plan has the potential to catalyze uh, changes around historic and current inequities. And we invite you to be part of setting that vision. In the virtual, um, the Park Summit, is a midpoint in the NPRB's 2020 comprehensive plan process is a virtual event to share out and collect feedback on draft policy ideas for the next decade of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation System. Originally scheduled as a day-long in-person event, the Park Summit the Park Summit shifted 
online to accommodate the need for social distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Park Summit reconvened this past Monday, June 15th, and will run through this Friday evening. The recent events have made it clear for us to move forward in our work to untangle systemic racism from our system. One of the keys, the, one of the key ways we can do this is by crafting new policies that address the root causes of those issues. Uh, when we reconvene the park summit to continue planning for the future of our park system, we will hold on to the realities of the past several weeks and the past um, several months as we set the course for our policy direction for the next decade. We hope you will join us. A special thank you to almost 5,000 people from across Minneapolis who shared their thoughts and dreams uh, for Minneapolis Parks and Recreation over the past year and a half. The Empire B is grateful for the thoughtful insights and hope you see many of your ideas represented in these recommendations. So please participate, it is critically important uh, at this time. So um, thank you for the work that this team has done around um, the Park Summit. Um, what is next for Parks for All? Uh, June, July, 2020, the draft comprehensive plan will be developed, written and designed. August and September of 2020, the draft plan published for a 45 day public period, um, public comment period, fall of 2020, the plan is revised based on public comment period feedback. And the winter of 2020, the revised plan considered by the NPRB Board of Commissioners for review and adoption. Thank you to volunteers. I would like to give a special thank you uh, to the staff who volunteered to provide support to our community. Uh, in the days following the unrest, NPRB staff volunteered to distribute food and essentials to those in need, to help clean up broken glass and remove graffiti, and to assist while assessing, while uh, with assessing 1,055 locations across 58 square miles of the city of Minneapolis. Thank you so much for your work. It is deeply appreciated. Um, and again, I think that is everything. So thank you, President Colgill and commissioners. Um, thank you. Thank you, Superintendent, uh, for that report. We do have a couple of questions from commissioners. I'll start with Commissioner Musich, followed by Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Kogel. Uh Superintendent Bangora, you gave us a total number of hours that ambassadors were out in parks. Could you tell us which period of time that, that reported total covers? Um, I will uh, pass over to Assistant Superintendent of Recreation uh, Cox to give a very specific number. I would probably be guessing, but she can give us a more accurate uh, time frame. Okay, thank you. President Kogil, uh, Commissioner Musich, I'm sorry, I can't give you the period of time. What I can tell you is we operate seven days a week with the exception of rain days, um, and each person does a shift of 12 p.m. until 6.30 p.m. So I could do some math in my, maybe do some math in my head to tell you if that was a week's worth of, uh, of scheduling or not. Okay, thank you for the additional information. Um, while I've got you on the screen, I have a, a couple of additional questions about um, recreation components of the update. Uh, you men Superintendent Bangora mentioned that there will be activities occurring, um, 35 different activities occurring in service areas. Will those be, will those activities be equitably distributed across commissioner districts as well within those service areas if they are shared? Uh, Commissioner Musich, I can tell you, I don't think that they are, the number of activities are entirely um, equitable. They are more equal. The types of, of programs are more are considered more equitably. And what I mean by that is uh, where people may have access to different kinds of activities or resources, we thought differently about what to put there versus where we put things where people may not have as much access and may be relying uh, more on parks to provide some of the recreational activities. So um, 
And that is the base level. That is not our, our end goal. We wanted to start with every area having at least 35 activities. There are some who have more. That's the base level number. Okay, thank you for that additional information. Um, Assistant um, Superintendent Bangora, you did not mention, and maybe this is coming later this evening, but um, is there a timeline for when we're going to know which outdoor facing restrooms are going to be made available for public use this summer? Yes, that'll be uh, later as we give our uh, update on COVID. Okay. It's going to be later on in the, in the presentation. Okay, I can wait for that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, or Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Kokio. Superintendent Bangora, I just think, thanks for everything. Thanks for the presentation, but I just have a quick clarifying question. Did you say that there are 30 youth out working or 13? 30. 30. Okay, thank you. 30. That's it You're for welcome. me. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, seeing no other questions um, for the superintendent, thank you, superintendent, for the update. Uh, and we'll move on to um, our uh, consent business. Um, I'll ask for a motion uh, for resolutions 2020-228 uh, through 2020-230 and then 2020 dash 238 through 2020 dash 245. Do I have a motion? So second. A motion and a second. Is there a discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing no discussion, I'll ask the secretary to please uh, take the role on the consent business. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine, uh, or sorry, eight ayes, one absent. Thank you. Uh, the uh, consent business carries. Uh, we'll move on to reports of standing committees. Chair Meyer. I'll move resolution 2020-222, a resolution accepting the non-appointed citizen advisory committee recommendations and approving concept plans for Perkins Hill Park. The moved. <clears throat> the resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, i uh, ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-222. Commissioner Bourne. Absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. Chair Meyer. I'll move resolution 2020 223, a resolution granting storm sewer easements to the Blake School at 511 Kenwood Parkway, located on Kenwood Parkway in Minneapolis. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne, absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Uh, that carries. I'll move resolution. I'll move resolution 
224, a resolution approving uh, the part components of the coordinated plan at the Upper Harbor Terminal. Resol Very good. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on resolution 2020-224? Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on uh, resolution 2020-224. Commissioner Bourne, absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. Uh, Chair Meyer again for the uh, amended additional item, which is resolution well, 2020. I need you to read that one because it's not on the published agenda in front of me. So sure. So the, read the item that you want on table, please. The, so the motion is to untable resolution 2020-2006, a resolution approving encroachment permit for use of 92 square feet of land in front of the subject property at 2388 West Lake of the Isles Parkway, encroaching upon parkland at West Lake of the Isles Parkway within Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park and collecting appropriate fees associated with this encroachment. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yeah, Secretary Ringgold. President Cogill, this is a clarification maybe for legal counsel. Do we have to take an action to pull it from the table and then an action to approve it, or is it one action? Okay. Um, it's one action. It was added to the agenda at the beginning of the meeting yep. by motion. All right. So this is, again, Resolution 2020-206. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-206. Commissioner Bourne. Absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That uh, carries. Um, the time being 529, I think we'll pause ahead of uh, legislative and intergovernmental committee and um, go into open time. Let me put my mask on here. Thank you. Uh, we do have. Uh, Many uh, comments uh, for open time. Um, we have a small, smaller number of folks who are uh, here at headquarters to speak, and uh, we'll start with them. Uh, I'll just uh, start with by opening with um, this is uh, open time. This is our opportunity for the board to hear from the public. I will uh, designate one minute of time for each speaker. Um, this uh, is an opportunity for you to speak on any issue. Uh, uh, we, we just don't tolerate any uh, harassing comments uh, and also uh, want to make sure that uh, you do not discuss any pending litigation matters. Um, but otherwise, this is our opportunity uh, to hear from you. We don't respond, um, but rather uh, just, just listen. Um, we have six uh speakers signed up uh who are are in attendance and then i'll turn it over to secretary ringold to begin re reading the written um submissions uh, we have over i believe 700 written submissions so we will keep uh the open time to to an hour um and all uh, of written submissions will be Trump. part of the public record yes commissioner french a point of information. I, I, I was wondering if the, the folks who are appearing at uh, Park Boy headquarters, is there a way for those folks to appear on camera so the people who are watching at home can see them and the commissioners as well? 
Uh, that is a good question. I will ask. Yes, that is that is uh, that is possible. Thank you, Commissioner French, for clarifying on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, President. Yep. All right. Um, our first speaker uh, here uh, this evening is Joe Tamburino. Uh, Mr. Tamburino, if you'd come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have uh, one minute. Uh, good evening, Joe Tamburino. I live in downtown Minneapolis. I'm here to speak against the resolution 2020-232 uh, that this body passed on June 3rd, which prohibits the cooperation between Minneapolis Police Department and the, and the uh, Park Board Police for two reasons. Uh, first, that it does not help public safety, and second, that it's impractical. I would like to go through the impractical part first. Uh, this board does some many good programs over the year. One of them is the Minneapolis bike tour. That bike tour has over 30 miles in its tour, and it would be completely impractical to have simply 34 park board officers do that tour. I've been doing that tour for six years in a row. Obviously this year with COVID, it's been canceled. You go on Minneapolis streets, you would need some cooperation with the Minneapolis Police Department. Second, in terms of it not being uh, good for public safety, if I could just point a few things. Just recently on June 7th, we had an overdose death at Washburn Fair Oaks Park. We also had a man shot at Farview Park. There's been sexual assaults in parks or near parks and we need the cooperation of both the park board and the Minneapolis Police Department so crimes could be solved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tamburino. Our next speaker is Jake Bearden. Uh, President Cargo, I, I, we can't see the speakers. I don't know if there's a technical issue right now. Okay. okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner French. I'll ask Secretary Ringgold if there's any information. Yeah, President Cogill, Commissioner French, there isn't a way to be able to see it on the Zoom call, but the um, speakers are being broadcast. So if you are able to, to see the meeting from either a web, so the website or the cable, the um, public will be able to see the speakers. Okay. Mr. Verdon. Hello, I'm uh, Jake Verdon. I was raised in Northeast Minneapolis. I currently live in the Phillips neighborhood in South Minneapolis. And I'm here to speak in support of my neighbors who are currently camping at Powderhorn Park and for the goal of making Minneapolis Park sanctuary spaces for people who have been failed by our housing system. I think. I'm glad to see the park board rescind the eviction notice and offer immediate support. I want to see that support extended and committed to, and it's not just allowing people to not have to fear eviction, but also supporting people with resources and the infrastructure that's there. I've been a part of a project at PV Park that was providing mutual aid with folks experiencing homelessness, and it was so frustrating to see park board outlets there, people needing to charge their phone to handle essential business, but the electricity cut off. Things like that could go a long way. The park board is the largest landholder in the city of Minneapolis. This is stolen land. The park board has to decide now, were you all elected to serve the leisure class or were you elected to serve the poor, the oppressed, the work classes in Minneapolis? It's a racial justice issue. So I really encourage commissioners to support the sanctuaries in Minneapolis parks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vierden. Our next speaker is Alexis Kramer. Alexis, if you'd come forward, state your name, uh, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have uh, a minute to address the board. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexis Kramer, and I'm actually currently homeless, but staying at Millennium Hotel. Um, I've been homeless for almost a year now due to child protection because they removed my two children from me. And I will let you know that I represent an organization called Freedom from the Streets. We help people experiencing homelessness, on the verge of being homeless, and formerly homeless. But my role is I help people who are dealing with child protection. And I ask that the members of the board will look into this racial or systemic racism that is going on, and that they will look at both the child protection area and not only that, but they will actually look at the homelessness. We have been fighting for housing for 40 years now. 
And it's really sad to see that there are so many people experiencing homelessness outside, have nowhere to go except for parks, and we have police officers harassing us left and right. I ask that you all take action and that you help us get housing immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Um, the audio is really bad. I, I'll, I'll note commissioners are having uh, online are having trouble hearing. So for, for the next speakers, if you could step a little bit back from the mic, that would be helpful. Our next speaker, I'm ap I'll apologize if I get this wrong. I can't quite read. Is it Lane? Uh, Lane Sh Shell? I, I don't know if I have that right. I, I don't. That's Oh, Jan Janelle Anderson? Oh, that's the next person. Janelle. I'll have Janelle come up. What's up? Yeah. Hi, my name is Janelle. Anderson, uh, I am. Uh, I, I have a group called Freedom from the Streets. I am so sick and tired of these work, these people telling us how to live because the simple fact that um, the people that have never been homeless telling people how to live and how to do things. They don't. They have never been homeless. How is you gonna tell us how to do things? And um, I live around the corner from from right here. I live on the north, but I've been organizing, I'm organizing the stuff that's been downtown because it's due to the fact that I, I am currently on the verge of being homeless. I live at PPL, PPL housing. Um, I got my housing on um, my boyfriend, my fiance passed away <laughs> last year over here. He killed himself because we didn't want to go back to homelessness. On June 14th, he killed himself. So I got his place, but due to the COVID, um, this COVID stuff, it stopped where they're not looking at me, but I will be out in the streets as soon as it left because of the simple fact that my rent is paid, but I do not have three times the rent, whatever y'all want, I don't have it. So what I'm saying is that and, um, y'all got to do something and y'all got to listen to people that's homeless, not just listen to these people that never had nothing. Y'all been doing this for 40 years. And not only that, I'm from Minnesota. Not only that, I am half Indian. And what, what Alexis said about child protection is so real. They stay, steal your kids, they take your kids, everything. So I got Indian in me. And what saves me is being Indian, having an Indian card to an Indian. Um, and I, that's so messed up that I have to have that card to say that I, what I am or who I am because I am a mixed race, a black and Indian. And I just, I wish y'all hear everybody's cries and everybody's, um, everybody's pain. Um, I just want to say is that, you know, last, I mean, last time y'all had those officers come into camp, I was there watching the camp. I was one of the security guards watching the camp. And I'm telling you what happened to that man that died. His police officer stuck his foot on his neck. And I'm just saying, the police officer wanted to open up the, cam the campers. And it's black man's in here. We're not over this stuff. We're not over slavery. We're not over nothing. Like, we ain't over it. And then not only that, the, the um, you need to change the, the amendment rights of 13, 14, and 15, and 16. Um, tell me when I'm done. Because <laughs> I don't know. I'm nervous right now. I just wanted to get it. I mean, I want y'all to listen. And um, I know y'all on day, on a homeless day of the hill. There's a lot of y'all be there. Like I seen him there. I mean, y'all support the homeless day of the hill. Won't y'all do something about it? Not just support it. Do something about it. And a lot of us got, some of us got mental illness. So y'all not doing anything about that. When y'all let people out in St. Peter's, Minnesota, y'all let them here. Y'all ain't doing anything about it. Y'all just let them roam around. So they're roaming around with all these other people. And so I'm saying, there's a lot of issues going on. Yes. There's a lot of things going on. Yes. But this is your fault. Thank, thank you, Janelle. Our next speaker is Fred. Frederick. Frederick Cogill, can I just say that I, I couldn't hear anything. I can't understand Nothing. anything that the speakers are saying. It just, it's a lot of static and like, I, I couldn't hear I mean, like maybe a few words that Janelle said, I was able to hear. Okay. Yeah, same. I could hear about half the words, 
we we need to fix that before we, we have to fix something before the next speaker well let's do a mic well thank you uh vice president let's do a mic check for for our next speaker okay how did that sound can you hear me thank you how did it sound i can hear you okay then. good hello That's my good. name is frederick i'm a northeast resident of northeast minneapolis uh, I'm on the Envision Leader Board. I'm a, I sit on the MICA board. I'm the Secretary of MICA. Um, we, we're is an organization for tiny houses, tiny living, a small community, intensified community. Uh, what we're trying to do is trying to get the land and development for for people who experience homelessness into housing, and how would that look? And having a strong community to have that support. And right now we're looking for the land. We have a show unit coming up. Uh, maybe a week and a half from now in Elam Church over Northeast on 13 and Monroe. And so uh, our idea is to, that we can house people. We come with an idea, we come to the blueprint. We fought to have the zoning law passed. Um, you can find us on envisioncommunity.org and you can find some of the blueprints and ideas of what our tiny house is living. And so we, we're really trying to get this up thing up and running for the homeless community. And with your support, we can have that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, am I missing any other speakers? Maybe? I didn't sign up, but can I? You're welcome to speak. Yeah, you have. Um, State your name, uh, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have uh, one one minute to address the board. And if, again, if you could step back and maybe do a quick mic check um, so that commissioners can hear you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. My name is Noah Chan, and I'm a resident of Minneapolis and downtown. I've been spending the last few days down in the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary, and I have not seen very much support from the Minneapolis Park Board and Recreation. I would like you to see them as human beings, as our neighbors, because that's what they are. We tend to look at all these people as invisible boogeymen that we don't know, but I challenge you to come down and meet them face to face to see the mothers and uncles that live down there. I would like you to support the idea that parks can be sanctuary for our unsheltered folks when they have nowhere else to go and to put in the extra effort to get them the housing that they need. That is all. Thank you. Um. That concludes our uh, in-person speakers uh, for open time. We'll move on to uh, speakers who submitted written comments. Um, and we will start uh, with uh, Allison Bross White. Turn it over to the secretary. President Cogill, as I begin this one, we had um, by 3.30 today, we had 869 comments. 763 of the comments that came in are similar to the one that I'm going to read. So I'd like to read this one in its entirety so that, um, that it reflects the entire uh, piece. If it's, I think it will get it done in a minute, but just in case. Again, we had 763 of this, of this version. As a resident of Minneapolis who cares about housing in my community, I call on you to make concrete commitments in support of the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. Our neighbors deserve a safe and dignified place to stay. I call on you to meet the demands of the residents of the sanctuary so they can stay where they are long term. First, recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary and providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long term. Open basic services like park bathrooms and provide hookups to electricity and water. Give permission to other nonprofits and agencies at the city, county, and state to provide immediate needed resources to our neighbors like additional porta potties, including at least one ADA accessible at each site, a city drinking water station and connection to city water source, at least one hand sanitizing station at each sanctuary site, one curbside trash dumpster on the street at each with the regular pickups to relieve pressure on the park system. 
I also call on the city, county, and state to provide the support and infrastructure needed for residents of all sanctuary sites across the city to be able to stay where they are. Homelessness is the virus and housing is the cure. We will not allow our neighbors to be evicted or hidden away for your convenience. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Megan Downey. Although I'm not a resident of Minneapolis, I urge you to cut ties with the Minneapolis Police Department and further to begin to dismantle your own park police force. The nation's eyes are focused on Minneapolis right now. You have an important chance to lead organizations and local governments around the country by example. Your commitment to finding sus sustainable community alternatives to police will affect not only your city and its residents, but all our cities because we will be able to look to you in our local activism. The journey toward improved social services will not be an easy one, it's true, but you have the opportunity to take the first step on the long road for all of us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Roche. I am writing to ask that you please pass the resolution to terminate your relationship with MPD. We, the citizens of Minneapolis, do not have faith in the Minneapolis Police Department. Time and time again, they target people of color and their presence is not welcome in our parks. Every citizen should be able to enjoy our beautiful parks without fear, and that cannot happen while you allow MPD to patrol there. Please do the right thing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Denman. I call on you to urge you to support the proposed Park Board resolution to terminate the relationship between the MPRB and the Minneapolis Police Department. The MPD has a long history of cruel, racist, violent, and dangerous behavior, and they have no place in our parks. This is a matter of life and death. Minneapolis has an amazing park system, and the residents deserve to enjoy these spaces without fear of police terror. This is particularly important for black, brown, and indigenous park users who are consistently over-policed in our park system. Please also dismantle the parks police. We have other and better ways to keep one another safe in our parks, ways that aren't harmful and don't result in violence and loss of life. Our, our next speaker is Hope Davis. I would just like to say thank you for severing ties with the MPD. It really shows that you are there for the community and gives me hope that there is real change happening. Our next speaker is Claire Lovell. I am contacting you to encourage you to vote in support of today's resolution to end the, MP, or the Minneapolis Park Board's contract with the Minneapolis Police Department. The recent murder of George Floyd, the murders of other black community members, and the police's hyper-militarized responses to last week's protests have made it clear that the MPD's violent tactics have no place in our community. Least of all, safe spaces such as our public parks as someone who lives near Loring Park, I want all residents, regardless of age, race, disability, orientation, or nationality, to be able to fully enjoy the crown jewel of Minneapolis Park System and all our other beautiful public spaces. I hope you will vote in the best interest of families, children, residents, and community in support ending the MPD contract today. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker did not provide a name. M6. Maybe we should move to uh, the next speaker whose name is provided, Ka Ka Kayla Weiss Weinberg. I strongly urge you to divest all of your funds from the MPD and put them towards paying community members to lead workshops or racialize, on racialized trauma and healing, daycare for kids, whatever other awesome activities you can think 
of that bring people together and get people outside, just not the police. They are not needed in this space. I demand that you use these resources to create more opportunities for people to come together and share space. Parks are a duty to create community. I demand that you uphold the values of your racial equity mission statement and make Minneapolis parks a safer place for everyone by ending your contract with MPD. I also urge you not to accept any funds from police unions or better yet, redirect the money to, bail, to a bail fund or other local black organizations working towards true equitable city, tr a truly equitable city. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Johnson. In order to beautify the rose garden, the roses need to be pruned every day when they bloom. The roses, the roses will grow better if they are irrigated at their roots. To protect the roses from being eaten, the Japanese beetles must be managed. This rose garden, having more than 2,500 rose bushes, needs more than one rose gardener. We are proposing five additional rose gardeners. Continued uh, divestment of funds for maintaining the roses which presently is a three-hour volunteer Saturday instead of maintaining the roses at a weekly rate of 225 hours. This gar rose garden is there with us for more than 110 years. Can we make the rose garden last another 110 years? To make the garden last for generations, the rose garden does meet two of the strategic pillars in the 25-year Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. Take care of what you have and connecting people to the outdoors. This Rose Garden project also. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jordan Burnt. Jennifer, as a citizen of Minneapolis, I urge you to stop evictions of the current homeless encampment in Powderhorn Park. This is a desperate time for these folks and we owe it to them as fellow citizens to take care of them before a better solution is, is made. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Genero. I live, a, I live about a block from Powderhorn Park. I'm also um, a Potawatomi resident living, in Stolten Dakota, living on Stolten Dakota land. I support the sanctuary that is blooming there and will do all in my power to make sure it is a safe and, a, and allowed to prosper. I'm sure you will have received emails outlining the needs that the sanctuary has. I will not reiterate them. Listen to others. Do the right thing. I will not tolerate forcible evictions on land you have no right to. All our neighbors deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Emma Reese. I'm a Minneapolis resident and I live within three blocks of the Powderhorn Sanctuary. Like many of my neighbors, I use Powderhorn Park regularly for recreation and rest. I am honored to welcome new neighbors who need to use this space for housing. I call on you to make concrete commitments in support of the Powderhorn, Sanctu Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. Our neighbors deserve a safe and dignified place to stay until everyone has a permanent home, apartment, or tiny house that meets their unique needs. We need to support parks as sanctuary. I call on you to meet the demands of the residents of the sanctuary so they can stay where they are long term. Recognize publicly that our parks are sanctuary and provide a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long term. Open basic services like park bathrooms and provide hookups to electricity and water. Give permission to other nonprofits and agencies in the city. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alice Wellna. My name is Alice Wellna, and I'm a community member who cares about housing and my neighbors. I was elated when the park board divested from the Minneapolis Police Department, but now I'm calling on you to stay true to those values. Building a Minneapolis without police violence is just about is not just about what we say no to, it's about what we say yes to instead. I'm calling on you to say yes to safe housing for all, to caring for vulnerable community members, to stopping the spread of COVID-19 among 
among at-risk people to ensuring parks serve those serve their purpose as a haven for the people of Minneapolis. Say yes to the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. I'm calling on you to commit to the demands of the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary's residents and the community that supports them so they can stay where they are long term. Recognize publicly that all our parks are sanctuary and provide a safe home to people experiencing. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Gomshe. I'm a resident of the Powderhorn neighborhood. I have lived at 3201 14th Avenue South for four years. I am right down the street from the recently established sanctuary site on the east side of the park. This site joins the sanctuary site currently on the west side of the park at 10th Avenue and 32nd Street. I do not want the neighbors at either of these sites removed until more stable housing can be secured for them. I love my neighborhood and I love Powderhorn Park. The fact that these sanctuary sites have arisen in this neighborhood reinforces my love for where I live. I am proud of my neighbors for welcoming unhoused residents with a safe location to stay as they reel from the ongoing housing crisis, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and the ongoing uprising against the broken police system. We need to continue supporting them. It is uh, unsustainable and cruel to keep pushing unhoused neighbors. Thank you. Our next speaker is Allison Johnson Heist. Every day I pass a small but growing homeless encampment at the intersection of Franklin Avenue and Highway 55. Today I noticed a porta potty and hand washing station on site across the street. This is the very least the city can do, and I know we can do better. People deserve housing, and they also deserve to be treated with dignity and respect until arrangements for permanent stable living can be made. I ask you to support the folks living in Powderhorn Park by making restrooms available to them and also providing needed services like water, dumpster, and ADA accessible portable toilets. Homelessness is a growing public health emergency, and it's time our city leaders treat it as such. I look forward to hearing what specific steps you will take to make sure the health and safety of the most vulnerable among us is prioritized right now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Hessler. Superintendent Bangora, Minneapolis Park Board Commissioners, Councilmember Cano, and elected officials. With the terrible housing crisis that is unsolved in our city, parks should be sanctuaries for the homeless. Please support the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. Make sure they can stay there, stay where they are long term. You must open basic services like park bathrooms and provide hookups to electricity and water. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brianna Olson Carr. Our neighbors deserve a safe and dignified place to stay in this time of COVID. Please support residents at, of the sanctuary in Powderhorn to stay. Homelessness is more important issue than recreation. You can provide drinking water and portable toilets and a curbside trash bin. Please support and the infrastructure needed for residents of all sanctuary sites across the city to be able to stay where they are. Our neighbors should not be evicted or hidden for public convenience. Thank you. Um, moving on here, we have uh, our next speaker. Um, I believe we're gonna have um, Director Arvidsson now read. Um, Chef Sheffield is our next speaker, uh, Dr. Arvidsson, are you able to read? I am, thank you, President Kogil. Hello all, my name is Chef, they, them, theirs, and I am a community organizer who works at Centro de Trabajadores Unidos en Lucha, and I currently live at Columbus and Lake. Last Friday morning, my coworker, who lives on 10th Avenue South on the northwest corner of Powderhorn Park, watched as park police cars tore across the grass to threaten and terrorize unsheltered folks living in tents in the encampment. How the park board and police responded to the people living in our community, 
finding shelter the only way they can during a deadly global pandemic is entirely indefensible and not new. As a resident of Minneapolis who cares about housing for all community members, I call on you to make concrete commitments in support of the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. Our neighbors deserve a safe and dignified place to stay. I call on you to meet the demands of the residents of the sanctuary so they can stay where they are long term. Recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary and providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sophie Fesser. To whom it may concern, as a member of the human community, it makes no sense to me, a human being, to force other human beings out of Powderhorn Park simply so white folks can have their park back. What, the grass needs to be empty? Need more room for white people's dogs? As a human being, you must secure the occupation of the sanctuary. To do this, please take action through the following. One, recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary and providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Two, commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long-term. Three, open basic services like park bathrooms and provide hookups to electricity and water. Four, give permission to other nonprofits and agencies at the city, county, and state to provide immediate needed resources to our neighbors, like additional porta potties, including at least one ADA accessible at each site, a city drinking water station, and connection to a city water source. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nellie Bruce. I live in St. Paul, but all of the Twin Cities are my home. I care about the well-being of each and every one of my neighbors, and if there is something I can do, even trying to persuade the parks through a simple email, I will try and do it. That being said, I am writing to call on you to support the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. Housing is a human right, and when housing is denied, all members of our community deserve dignity and a place to rest. Please, please publicly recognize that parks are sanctuaries for all people. Providing shelter to the homeless is far more important than making sure kids have a place to play. After all, there are unsheltered children in Powderhorn who have nowhere else to go. Please, please allow the sanctuary to stay where it is. Let residents of the sanctuary use park bathrooms and give them access to electricity and water. These too are human rights. Not giving people access when they have nowhere else to turn isn't just standing by. It's actively denying the human rights of the people there. Finally, if there's only one thing. Oh, was that the beep? Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Brown. Okay. Everyone deserves a safe space to stay. And for some, that place is at our parks. While it's our community's responsi uh, responsibility to continue working for safe, high quality housing for all people, that isn't the reality we currently live in. I'd like to stand with my fellow community members in requesting the following. One, recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary and providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Two, commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long term. Three, open basic services like park bathrooms and provide hookups to electricity and water. Four, give permission to other nonprofits and agencies at the city, county, and state to provide immediate needed resources to our neighbors, like additional porta potties, including at least one ADA accessible at each site, a city drinking water station and connection to a city water source, at least one hand sanitizing station at each sanctuary site. Thank you. Our next speaker is Allison Jesse. Hello, I'm a Minneapolis resident and voter, and I'm writing to say that I support the continued use of Powderhorn Park as a sanctuary for those experiencing homelessness. Although I have young children who enjoy playing in local parks, including Powderhorn, I feel that, provide a, I feel that providing a safe home 
is more important than my children's playing in those parks, although the two are certainly, certainly not mutually exclusive. This is especially important during this pandemic and the corresponding economic issues related to the pandemic. Until the city of Minneapolis is able to better, is able to make better strides in reducing and eradicating homelessness, it is inhumane to remove peaceful people from the park. These neighbors deserve support from the city, and I hope that you will commit to providing it. Simply evicting or moving these people from Powderhorn will not address the underlying issues contributing to their homelessness. Further, they will simply move somewhere else, only to again have to move somewhere else again in repetition. Thank you for your time. Allison Jesse. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Panetta. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Panetta and my, ad my address is 2844 Columbus Avenue, Apartment 3, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55407. I'm a social worker under the state of Minnesota and I have dedicated my personal and professional life towards providing trauma-focused care to youth experiencing homelessness in a harm reduction framework. Many of the youth that I currently work with are staying in places such as the sanctuary at Powderhorn Park because they see them as safer and more accessible than adult shelters or their childhood home, especially with the lack of funding for housing programs during COVID-19. I find it not only unethical, but incredibly harmful to our communities and our young people that you all have not publicly recognized that all of our parks are sanctuaries and have not committed to allowing the sanctuary to stay undisturbed. The Parks Department needs to open basic services like park bathrooms and provide electricity and water. The Parks Department also needs to give permission to other nonprofits. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gwen Jenkins. My name is Gwen Jenkins. I live in Ward 10 and spend a lot of time in South Minneapolis, particularly Powderhorn. I am deeply concerned about the lack of concrete action taken to provide basic services to our neighbors living in tents in the rapidly growing Powderhorn Sanctuary and other sanctuaries around town, including at PV Park. The people living in these parks need and deserve safety, services, and a dignified place to stay long term, while more permanent solutions are developed in collaboration with them. I support and call on you to publicly support and respond to residents' demands as stated below. Commit to naming all Minneapolis parks as sanctuaries for the unsheltered. This is more important than recreation. Commit to allowing the sanctuary to remain undisturbed long-term. Mm -hmm. Provide basic services, including bathrooms, electricity <laughs> hookups, and water hookups. Allow other nonprofits and agencies operating in the city, county, and state to provide desperately needed resources to our neighbors. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Capistrant. As a resident of South Minneapolis, Powderhorn Park neighborhood, who cares about housing and my community, I call on you to make concrete commitments in support of the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. Our neighbors deserve a safe and dignified place to stay. I call on you to meet the demands of the residents of the sanctuary so they can stay where they are long term. Recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuaries and providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long term. Open basic services like park bathrooms and provide hookups to electricity and water. Give permission to other nonprofits and agencies at the city, county and state to provide immediate needed resources to our neighbors like additional porta potties including at least one ADA accessible at each site, a city drinking water station and connection to a city water source, at least one hand sanitizing station at each sanctuary site, one curbside trash dumpster. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zach Moore. Hello. I am writing to demand that you, that is every person here emailed, Take action to protect the rights of our houseless neighbors living in the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary and sanctuary sites across the city from eviction or anything of that nature. I have lived in Minneapolis all my life and one issue has been abundantly clear, homelessness. 
Too often, we see the Minneapolis Police Department mobilized to tear down encampments, box people in, and arrest, terrorize, and harass our homeless neighbors. No longer. We cannot, we will not accept any such treatment of our neighbors. They have a right to a safe and dignified place to stay, and that right must be fulfilled and protected. These are the demands presented. One, recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary and providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Two, commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long-term. Three, open basic services. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alessandra Bongiardina. Hello, my name is Alessandra Bongiardina and I'm a resident of Minneapolis. I am reaching out to ask for commitments in regards to the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary and the safety and security of all of our community members. The residents of this sanctuary deserve to stay in this community long-term and the health and safety of our community members is more important than access to a park for recreational purposes. We cannot continue to criminalize the homeless, especially amidst the pandemic that leaves this vulnerable population all the more vulnerable. I'm calling on you to meet their demands to stay their uh, to meet their demands to stay there long term and open basic services like park bathrooms and setting up water and electricity, as well as giving permission to other nonprofits and city agencies to go in and provide additional porta potties, a city drinking water station, hand sanitizing stations, and curbside trash dumpsters to relieve pressure on our park system. I beg the city, county, and state. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kendall Bergman. Hello, I am a Minneapolis resident. I was born at Fairview, Fairview Riverside Hospital. And while I grew up in St. Paul, I now call the Powderhorn Park neighborhood my home. When my husband and I brought our, bought our home in 2018, we did so in part because of the vibrant community. We love our neighbors, both owners and renters. We love our parks. We love May Day Cafe and La Moranita and Modern Times. We love that we can see people from all walks of life enjoying the beauty of Powderhorn. Because I care deeply about my community, I am asking you to make concrete commitments in support of the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. My community is not only made up of those with mortgages or lease agreements. All Minneapolis residents deserve a safe and dignified place to stay. I ask that you meet the demands of the residents of the sanctuary so they can stay where they are long term. This includes one, recognizing publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary. Providing a safe home for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. I say this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Walls. While I am currently a resident of St. Paul, I care deeply about my neighbors in Minneapolis, especially those who don't have access to shelter. I support the Powderhorn Park Sanctuary. If you feel that houseless people should not be living in our parks, I understand. But the fact of the matter is that all of our neighbors need a safe, stable place to live in the midst of a pandemic and every day. If you do not want the sanctuary to be in our parks, then you need to create a sanctuary in our building. Sanctuary that is financially supported by the city, state, and or nonprofit, that is lasting and not subject to conditions that exclude or endanger the most vulnerable of our community. People deserve a safe and dignified place to stay. I call on you to meet the demands of the residents of the sanctuary so they can stay where they are long term. Recognize publicly that all of our parks are sanctuary and that providing a safe home to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness is more important than recreation. Commit to allowing the sanctuary to stay where it is undisturbed long term. Oh. Thank you. I'll now move. We do have uh, one more speaker signed up that's here this evening. Um, in, in the interest of them being here, I'll uh, have you please uh, come forward. Uh, Sally, is it? Uh, if you want to state yeah, your so name. I'm and first, I'm representing uh, the West Sally, could I just uh, quickly, before you start, if you could step back a bit. The commissioners who are on a line are having trouble hearing when folks are close to the mic. So if you, that, that seems good. Um, and if you could state your name first, then you have a minute to speak. And go for it. 
and I'm a member of the SPANO board, which met last night saying, uh, and wanted to present this to the NPR. Be regarding the agenda item 10.8.2 Pioneer Statute. The Pioneer Mon Monument has a checkered past van vandalism because of how indigenous peoples are presented on it. Not all pioneers were stoic white settlers as this memorial, memorial depicts. The Stano neighborhood raised the funds of $75,000 to relocate the statue to the Via Nelson Regional Park in 2010, which is the land that came from the Dakota Chibwe. There have been good discussions with staff from the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and Stano since the fall of 2019. MPRD staff has already met with indigenous leaders to begin a dialogue to explain the context of this memorial and how views our culture have changed since its inception. Currently, Stano is requesting design funds from St. Anthony Heritage Board at their July 13th meeting to support telling the story. We expect funding to be approved. Stano respects the current concerns and supports the indigenous leaders with the neighborhood to be a part of this decision. This decision could be removing the statue or making it a bigger story. So thank you. Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, uh, with that, we'll conclude our open time. Um, Moving on in the agenda, um, I will turn it back over to, uh, we're now in the Legislative and Inter Intergovernmental uh, Committee, uh, so Chair Vice President Vita. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Legislative and Intergovernmental Committee, I would like to move Resolution 2020-34, a resolution calling upon the Minnesota State Legislature to repeal the Hispanic law. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the resolution? I, oh God. Uh, Commissioner, oh, no, Commissioner gonna, French? Oh uh, yeah, I, this is, this, this law, this uh, repeal of this, this the standing, um, the standing law is really important to me. I believe the folks who police our neighborhoods in whatever uh, rendition that may be after the reforms that may take that are going to take place, I, I believe those folks should live in the community that they actually serve in. So this is really meaningful to me. Out of the 900 or so cops that actually patrol Minneapolis, including our park cops, only about 50 or 60 of them actually live in the city of Minneapolis. And I think that's a big problem. And I think uh, one of the one of the ways we can solve some of the issues we have, uh, just the disconnect between our police and our community members, is to make sure that those officers who are arresting folks or or policing folks have an opportunity to bump into those officers at the grocery store, or bump into those officers at church, or just bump into those officers in a in a in just in a, um, an organic way. Uh, that happens in community. But if that doesn't happen, when only time those officers interact with people in our community is when they're you know, on their worst day of their life or the worst day of their week or whatever. So I think this is, a, 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 I think this is needed. I think it's warranted. I think it's long overdue. And I hope other municipalities and other people get aboard this and help change this, this law, which I think is archaic and it hurts black and brown folks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. Anybody else wishing to speak? Seeing no other hands raised. Um, I'll just say I appreciate uh, this being brought forward and Commissioner Meyer's work on this and uh, the support of the board. And um, I'm, I'm glad that this is going to be on our legislative agenda. Um, with that, I'll ask the secretary to please uh, take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. You muted. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Um, that carries. Moving on to unfinished business.
Uh, we have a couple of discussion items uh, pertaining to uh, a resolution we passed at our last meeting, as well as the COVID-19 response. We'll start with uh, the uh, first discussion item regarding Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board safety plan, um, as directed in uh, resolution 2020-232. Uh, which was pertaining to changes we were making to our relationship with the Minneapolis Police Department um, for uh, events and other kinds of safety support. Um, and I will get over to Chief Ohado to uh, start kick off this presentation. Superintendent Van Gore, did you plan on introducing this or do you just want me to start? Uh, Chief Ohado, go ahead and get started. Thank you, sir. Uh, President Cogill, commissioners, good evening. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, as you mentioned, Commissioner Cogill, uh, as part of resolution 2020-232, uh, staff were directed to put together a safety plan. Um, so that is what we have done. Uh, the safety plan is really a summary of what our summer safety objectives are. Uh, it will go over some police staffing and collaboration uh, with other departments and divisions throughout the MPRB. So, Secretary Ringel, could you please uh, advance the slide? So, I'd like to start with just uh, setting the stage, uh, especially for the folks who might be watching at home, to understand the, the size and, and scope of our park system. Uh, we are very proud in our, our park system to say that more than 90% of our residents uh, live within a 10-minute walk or, or a six-block walk uh, to a park. Uh, that means that we have a very expansive park system. There are, are about 180 park properties across the city of Minneapolis, and we experience more than 26 million annual visits. Uh, in addition, uh, we service uh, 49 recreation centers throughout our park system, and there are about 2,000 permitted uh, events or activities every year across the Next slide, please. Uh, today's Park Police Department uh, has an authorized staffing budget of 34 sworn licensed peace officers. That includes me as the Park Police Chief uh, and then the support staff um, of two lieutenants and eight sergeants and then 23 patrol officers. Uh, in addition to our police officer staff, we also employ one youth violence prevention coordinator and depending on the time of season, we employ 15 to 25 park patrol agents. Uh, park patrol agents, although they wear a uniform, are not uh, sworn or licensed peace officers. Um, they assist with many of the support duties, uh, low-level enforcement, um, and they have limited arrest authority, uh, essentially the same arrest authority uh, as any citizen. In 2020, the approved uh, park police budget is $6.4 million and that represents 5% of the total MPRB budget. I think it's very important to note that the Park Police Department has a unique mission. And I've, you know, that mission comes from the vision that's adopted in uh, the comprehensive plan, which states to ensure a park system that is safe for all to play, recreate, contemplate, and celebrate. Um, when we talk about some of the things that, that make our Park Police Department unique or different, I would really hone in on our values of service, community, support, and dedication. And I wanna talk for a second about the support component of our values. The Park Police Department for the size of, a, of our park system and, and the city of Minneapolis is relatively small. We don't employ a, a lot of staff. Um, Really, our, our most important role, our vital role in our park system is being a resource to all of the field staff that exists throughout the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. We collaborate with field staff across the MPRB collaboratively uh, and proactively uh, to ensure that our parks are as safe as we can make them. Um, being a resource for staff is critical in how they do their work and how we do ours. Having a limited number of staffing means that we can't be in all 180 parks on any given hour. 
And so we look to our, our colleagues to be the eyes and the ears of our park system, to identify problems when they are small, and for us to work through problem solving together to prevent them from becoming bigger problems. In those times when things do happen, when there is violence in the park system, we also can lean on one another to, to respond effectively and quickly. So I just highlight that support uh, component of our mission. Please advance the slide. Our current patrol staffing with our licensed sworn police officers, we run uh, three shifts in the Park Police Department and cover 18 hours a day. Uh, so our, our shifts start at 7 a.m. in the morning and our patrols end at 1 a.m. So there's a gap between 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. that historically has been covered by the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, you can see the breakdown of our staffing. I will note that uh, our power shift, which runs from 11 a.m. until 9 p.m., uh, is tasked with fulfilling our 2020 budget goal of providing dedicated coverage uh, downtown and in the Phillips neighborhood um, every day. So historically, we have not covered uh, this service area uh, with its own dedicated um, patrol. Uh, we've, we've always covered that service area by borrowing patrols from the adjacent service areas, but, but the demand for emergency services uh, downtown and in Phillips uh, justifies us redeploying our resources and, and providing that level of coverage. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of our 2020 Park Patrol agent beats. Uh, so every day we provide um, support in the form of a, a beat assignment at Minnehaha Park, uh, East Cedar Beach, uh, parking enforcement across the park system. Uh, and then when staffing allows, we also cover the Central Riverfront, the Chain of Lakes, and dog enforcement assignments. Next slide, please. I want to take a moment uh, just to highlight the volume of uh, the Park Police Department's work. So we've done some analysis uh, of 12 months worth of uh, data collected by the Minneapolis Emergency Communication Center. And this dates from November 1st, 2018 to October 31st, 2019. Uh, during that time, Park Police staff recorded more than 23,000 activity entries. Uh, that's an average of 63 activity entries per day. Our high, our high daily average was 81 activities in the month of July, and our low daily average was 36 activity entries in the month of November. Of those more than 23,000 uh, activity entries, about half, actually a little bit more than half, uh, were proactive discretionary activities. So these were officers um, checking out on community meetings, recreation center stops, foot beats, and, and activities of that nature. Next slide. Uh, the other half of our work, we're responding to 911 calls and emergencies. And so I've, I've given a breakdown of some of what those calls are, ranging uh, from disturbance type calls, um, people who are reported down in parks, uh, unwanted persons fights, uh, calls to assaults, robberies, and shootings. Um, and I've also broken down our, our top parks for, for calls. Uh, with Loring being number one. Next slide, please. I've mentioned this already, but really the, the key to safety is staff working collaboratively across the organization and with community partners uh, to really work on issues and, and work towards solving problems uh, before those problems result in, in significant violence. Um, this fundamentally is a community safety approach. And uh, I've asked some of my colleagues from across the organization to join us today uh, to talk about how we interact uh, in working towards safety across the Minneapolis park system. So I'd like to start by introducing from the recreation division, uh, Adam Laris and Yvette Grafia Gray. Uh, Adam and Yvette, could you maybe just briefly introduce yourselves and then proceed with your part of the uh, presentation. 
Yes. Good evening, President Cogill and commissioners. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys this evening. Um, again, my name is Adam Wattis. I'm a recreation manager for the North Service Area. I've been in the organization for roughly 16 years. And um, I'm going to speak a little bit to the recreation division and the collaborative work and support that uh, the park police do with the rec centers division. So Yvette, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, um, my name is Yvette Grafia Gray. I have been with the park board since 2007. I'm currently serving as the center director at North Commons Park. Um, and just thank you for letting me speak with you today. Appreciate that, Yvette. Um, so yeah, briefly, I just want to reiterate um, also what uh, Chief Ojado had mentioned regarding support. Um, I have that very much highlighted in my notes today. Um, and more importantly, the collaboration and the proactive approach that we do with the Park Police within the rec centers, um, with our ambassador program, uh, mainly uh, many of the departments within the Recreation Division utilize the resource of the park police in a variety of different ways. Um, our youth program specialists that work directly with teens also have a, a strong relationship with both the park police and the SROs in the high schools um, that do collaborative work. So if things spill over from high schools, middle schools, they also work with park police um, and those SROs in those schools. Um, also the street reach component of our recreation division. I know chief and our street reach leaders um, and supervisors work collectively on heightened issues um, that probably occur um, in the later evening parts of our parks. So they try to work with um, the street reach to make sure that street reach is kind of those professionals that intervene on the front end so that uh, park police don't really come in and have to kind of do punitive citations, but they're really trying to work with a street reach rather than having park police come in right away. Um, and then also with our beach and our aquatics and our pools and our wading pools, uh, the police have a great relationship with that department to make sure that we're keeping those places safe. Um, but I really wanna speak a little bit more to the rec centers and programs. Um, in my 16 years working at the park police, um, it, it's very important that that relationship that they build with the staff, both at the director level and uh, part-time staff level is crucial into keeping the park safe. Um, not only just for staff, but for patrons. Um, I think the, the, the relationship that is built over time um, really enhances the experience of users in a positive way. Um, and more importantly, for the staff to feel safe in some of these centers and these locations throughout the city. Um, every part of the city has its own challenges. And it's important, critical, and crucial that staff and park police work together to better the experience of all of the patrons. So. Uh, I want to kind of hand it off to Yvette, who will have a little bit, uh, want to give a couple of examples of some somehow those relationships work and have kind of worked throughout time. Yvette? Okay, good evening, President Cogill and commissioners. Um, as I mentioned, I've been with the park board since 2007, and I've served at a variety of parks in our system since that time. Um, and I have had the opportunity to build a positive relationship with the park fleet. Um, and, and I think that is beneficial to our goal of creating and maintaining safe spaces um, for people to play and recreate in our system. Um, one way that I've been able to contribute to the goal of safe parks is by participating in the hiring process for park police and um, park patrol agents, um, and that I've been able to help on the front end select individuals that are ultimately going to be responding to our parks. Um, and I look at that particularly with an eye towards young people. In my heart, I'm a center director now, but in my heart, I will always be a youth worker. And so when I sit on those panels, I am looking for individuals who I believe will serve um, young people well. Um, I would also say that most of the engagement that I see from park police falls under two categories. And um, one of those is preventative that has been mentioned. And I would say an, an example of that is um, sometimes, you know, there might be something that happens at school during the day. And a community member or a volunteer coach might say, Yvette, I think this is going to spill over into the parks today. Um, will you call the park police just as a preventative measure so that we can um, either deter some negative behavior or prevent escalation of some incident that happened at a 
another location during the day. And I would also say uh, a large part of what I see is relational. Many times the park police come to the park and there's nothing wrong. They're just coming to check in with staff or check in with kids. And um, I can honestly say that in 2007, when park police would come to the park, I would hear kids say, um, well, what's wrong? What happened? Right? And now I can honestly say that I don't hear kids say that anymore. When police show up at my park, it's, you know, hello, officers. Uh, you know, people, the kids know these officers by name, and they're really a part of our community, especially at North Commons and other parts that I've um, participated or served in. Um, but there is another part that I want to speak to, um, which is there's sometimes where I do feel concerned for my safety, for those of park patrons, and also for my staff. Um, last fall, we had a basket, or I'm sorry, a football practice during the evening. I would say maybe five or six o'clock. They were for our, our our little players, the nine and ten year olds, and someone in the community was having a fight, and they moved through the football field with. Um, a gun. One of the individuals had a gun. Um, so needless to say, the coaches were very upset. The families were upset. But after calling the park police, they were not only able to apprehend the suspect, but they were also able to recover the gun. Um, and so that's just one instance where, you know, I feel like, who would I call in a situation to deal with something of that nature? And then I also have a personal example where in the course of my normal day, I was serving a park patron who, um, after I concluded my meeting, he decided that um, I should take him home. And um, I found myself in that situation, literally hiding in my office, in a corner in my office, until the park police were able to arrive. And so, again, this is a situation where the park police showed up, they facilitated the situation, and they were able to take the man home in that instance. And so I would say, you know, one of the reasons why I can show up to work every day after instances like that, um, it's not only because I love my job and I love work Commons and I love the community, but also because I have the type of support that I feel like I need from staff and from the park police. And I feel like we work together well, we collaborate together very well um, to provide safe spaces for staff and employees. Um, and I'm not sure how it would answer, you know, how, what I would do in those situations if I didn't have park police as a resource. I can definitely say that I believe that, um, I believe that our spaces would be negatively impacted. And I also believe that um, the work, the relational work that we've done over the years um, for positive policing in the community would largely be lost, and I think that would be unfortunate. Um, so really, that I guess that's what I would have to say. Thank you, Yvette, for those those, those examples and stories. And um, just to kind of piggyback on that, uh, President Colgill and commissioners, I have just two brief examples I'd like to share as well, um, kind of to those points about that collaborative work and that proactive approach. Um, Managing the North Service era, we, we definitely have its challenges at times. Um, but just like Yvette's stories, there's probably hundreds of those across the city for our field staff. Uh, but in the recent years, we've had uh, challenges with some community members um, having concerns with the kickball league over at North Commons, which really kind of outgrown its space um, for, a good, for a good reason. Um, people are gathering, people are having a great time, um, but there's concerns with some of the activity that was happening Again, going back to that punitive approach where it'd be really easy to come in and start writing citations and intervening. Um, after they kind of outgrown their space, we met with the leaders of that group um, and they really wanted to say, hey, we need help, we need support. Um, and we understand things are happening that aren't kosher, but what can you do to help us? And uh, we engaged and worked with the park police, uh, Chief Ohada himself and some of his sergeants and officers actually came and met with the group and said, what do you need from us? How can we support you? Um, what's the best way to do that support? Uh, we really don't want to in, engage in, in a negative context or a negative way to make it something that doesn't need to be. So over a course of several meetings on the front end, 
Uh, we found a resolution to move him to Falwell um, Park. And the park police came and enjoyed some of the kickball with them. I mean, they, they walked and intervened, but also more importantly, the park police also worked for a street reach crew and a rec staff to all get up there and kind of be all hands on deck. And it was really a positive approach. Yes, do we still have um, community members not loving or liking the kickball league, but at the end of the day, it's the community that's a win here. And they all love it. They participate in the kickball league. And there's still community members, again, that don't have that um, positive atmosphere with them. But again, the park police really helped um, kind of corral this this kickball league and make it work. So very much appreciative of that. And, and so are the leaders of that kickball league in the community. They're, they're appreciative that the police worked with them and came together with them. So that's one example. And then the last one um, is really near and dear to my heart because it could end very tra tragically. Um, before I became a manager, I was the park director at North Commons Brick Center. Um, it happened to be a Halloween night. We were doing a community event. Um, and just to save, uh, save this individual's name, we had an ex young person come into the building. Um, we were gonna close down for an hour to get ready for the event. Well, this young person has kind of grown up in the parks. Um, he's kind of has a little bit of name for himself, but he aged out. He was in his mid twenties, but he really looked like a young person still. Um, he was in a, re uh, a local group home. Um, he had some mental health issues, um, but we've always accepted this young man with open arms um, and our field staff and the park staff knew this individual, but when he asked to leave, he got agitated and then pulled out a knife on all of us. Um, we immediately contacted park police. Um, fortunately enough, we kind of knew somewhat how to handle the situation, but as he vacated, park police arrived immediately and we kind of let them know what happened, but we also let them know that this young man has some mental illness. And lo and behold to us, they also knew this young man. And um, as, as this young man's running through the park, they find him on the other side of Broadway, he's fashioning, he has a, a, a weapon in his hand. And, but knowing the park police and knowing the situation and knowing that they knew that this young man was harmless, he just needed a little bit of help and support, they were able to resolve the issue with no um, potential um, harm to this young man. And as we followed up, we had the Sergeant Roland come and follow up with us a day later and kind of let us know what they did with the process and that he ended up back in the care of his group home, unharmed, unsighted. But we were all felt welcome by that because, and at ease because we knew this young man and we, we cared for him. And it was really nice to see that the park police also knew this young man and cared for him. And they could have ended up gravely, but it, in, in a great way, it did not. So. Again, I'll echo the, the, the relationship with the Park Police and the support for them. And um, it'd be a different world potentially if we didn't have them in, the, in those roles. So thank you for that, President Colgill and Commissioners. Thank you, Adam, and, and thank you, Yvette. Um, now I'd like to introduce Jenna Tuma, a service area manager in the Asset Management Department. Jenna. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a, a dear piece to me, and I really value our Park Police. And so, uh, Thank you, uh, Chief Ohado and uh, President Cogill and commissioners for this opportunity to share uh, the asset management side. So as the chief has said, my name is Jenna Tuma and I'm the asset management operator, operations manager for the asset, I'm sorry, for the asset management um, overseeing the maintenance function in the self-service area. I wanted to share with you the collaboration between maintenance and the parks police on safety strategies to better serve our users, improve operations, and provide valuable resources for our staff. One of the primary duties for maintenance is to inspect, uh, clean, and prepare amenity use. For park keepers, uh, for our park keepers, they can encounter suspicious or illegal activities or are approached by unhappy or sometimes hostile customers in their daily routes. Staff often have a relationship with the park police and they rely on their, them to support and assist them through these difficult situations. Um, in addition, the park police have assisted the uh, park maintenance staff to better be prepared for these scenarios through assisting us with staff training, offering tips on how to deescalate a situation, how to effectively work through them. In 2020, it was our goal to offer a spring and fall training for all our maintenance staff, but due to the pandemic, it was postponed. In 2019, I was asked to join a committee that Chief Ohado was leading around the discussion of how to best support and balance the number of unauthorized encampments in the park. Representatives from the city and St. Stevens were also part of this discussion. The goal was to design an efficient process 
while adhering to the park ordinance to arrange for site visits by St. Stephen's and offer avail uh, available shelter, healthcare, and mental health resources to them. To do this, we created a, a call tree uh, was put in place for maintenance to initiate because we were usually the first people to site the camp. Once we uh, identified the camps, uh, we contacted the park police. The park police coordinated an outreach team all prior to the camp being served and noticed to vacate. I can say this approach left my staff feeling much better uh, about how to taking action with the hope of providing potential of helping people. Because these situations can be emotionally tough on us. In addition to the frontline staff, the park police have been an important partner supporting maintenance staff in crisis situations. And my final example tonight, last summer, our maintenance staff had an increase of traumatic and trauma exposure to discovering deceased bodies in the park. I had two staff in one week discover three deceased bodies. These deaths involved what appeared to be either crime scenes or suicide. The impact on their subconscious mind was beyond my understanding of how to help them deal with such events. Chief Ahado guided me and the staff in debriefing providing real examples of how, to, how the mind and the body respond. And he stayed in touch with these staff for weeks after the incidents, checking on their well-being. This situation sparked a bigger organization discussion of how better to support all of our staff and develop a debriefing protocol for future situations. Although these are just a few examples of our park police and asset management partnering together, um, these are the ones that come to mind. And I just thank you and thank the Chief Ohado and your team for the support and asset management. Thank you. And the, the last partner we're gonna have talk uh, this evening is from our customer service department. Tom Godfrey works in the permit. Tom? Thank you, Chief Ohado, President Calgill and commissioners. Uh, I'm here to touch on the positive relationship and collaboration that uh, customer service permits and events has uh, with our Minneapolis Park Police. Uh, one of the key reasons our citywide events, park board events, and our permitted events uh, take place in such a safe manner uh, is our relationship, positive collaboration with park police. Uh, another big reason for these events consistently going off in a safe manner is the proactive approach that we take. Uh, and that's really led a lot by our park police. We have meetings every Tuesday uh, throughout the year, uh, park police, permits, customer service, citywide events and recreation and maintenance uh, to review upcoming events. Um, and we look at those events months in advance and kind of review the, the safe, potential safety issues, uh, risk, risk issues. And then if we see anything, um, and park police plays a key role in this, if we see any safety issues, we reach out to that permit holder or uh, the citywide event staff, park board staff, and be, uh, you know, we work through those way ahead of time. So that proactive approach has really minimized any, um, you know, safety issues at, at any park board event or permitted event. Um, customer service uh, events department and the permits department, we're given a point of contact within the park police. And we work with that point of contact, whether it's a lieutenant or sergeant, to meet several times beyond these Tuesday meetings. We meet several times leading up to events to, to establish a risk management plan, safety plan, and again, review any, any risks or anything that we see in advance. So, and that always includes an on-site visit uh, of the site of where the event's gonna take place. And again, Park Police really heads those up um, and really gives us uh, a look at what we need to look at. Sometimes as an event um, organizer, you look at your, your event site and anything really around you um, near the event site, but Park Police really looks at the outside. So uh, we're not just looking at the event site, we're looking at the traffic control, you know, two, three, four blocks around the event. This minimizes headaches for people that live in the area. Uh, it gets them safely in and out of their residence. Um, so Park Police really heads that up. So we're not just looking at the immediate uh, event site in our risk management plan and safety plan. Um, Park Police also plays a key role and looking at the appropriate number of officers for an event, um, they really have that matrix down. And in our safe plan, they let us know, they let permit holders know, and they work with permit holders and us on what's an appropriate number of officers that is really needed to make that a safe event and to have a positive result at that event. Um, one other thing is traffic control. 
like I talked about, when, we, when we're making a plan for blocking streets, blocking roads, a lot of times that can be a head, headache to residents, but uh, Park Police really help us look at the big picture and making sure, like I said, people get in, in and out of their residence safely and it's not too much of a headache for them. Um, event safety and security has been a major issue over the past several years, past 10 years. There's been a lot of unfortunate tragedies and uh, incidents like bomb threats, bombings, um, you know, vehicles driving into a large event crowds. So working with park police, you know, we've been able to minimize and make sure this, those things have not happened here. Um, and without them, I don't know how we would, how we would do that, to be honest with you. So a good example is uh, about four or five years ago, there was quite a few large gatherings and events that had vehicles drive into event crowds. So Chief Ohado, Park Police came to us, and in particular, we looked at our 4th of July event, which draws thousands and thousands of people. Um, so we looked at what plan we needed to do uh, as far as bringing in not just your regular barricades that we use at every event, but we brought in some uh, larger concrete barricades to make sure that Minneapolis, you know, our events wouldn't have some of these tragedies that had been taking place. So, um, you know, without the expertise in that area from Park Police, it's not not things that we think of a lot of times, um, but that broad spectrum that Park Police brings, that expertise that they bring has really helped us to make uh, make our events successful and safe. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to touch on today, that positive collaboration that has made all our events very safe. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for your, your partnership. Um, Secretary Ringgold, could you advance the slide, please? So, President Cogill and commissioners, as part of Resolution 2020-232, um, in conjunction with, with our safety plan, I also want to give just a, a quick update um, around special events. So, as I've noted, the, the MPRB uh, hosts or permits about 2,000 events or activities each year. Um, there is a board approved alcohol in the parks policy that requires police uh, for most events that serve alcohol. Um, the customer service department, not the police department, is charged with permitting and, and coordinating events within the park system. Um, we use best practices, uh, the alcohol in the parks policy, uh, uh, information from event planners, permit holders, maintenance and police to do security assessments. Uh, for many of these events. Out of the 2,000 or so permitted uh, events or activities each year, approximately 400 require some sort of law enforcement support. Uh, these can range from wedding receptions uh, that need a police officer because of uh, alcohol distribution or to large festivals and athletic competitions. Uh, I would point out that our two largest events in the park system are Twin Cities Pride, which hosts their festival at Loring Park, and the Twin Cities Marathon. Uh, typical duties involving park police include uh, crowd control, traffic control, anti-terrorism, anti-crime, cash security, and sometimes overnight security if event uh, holders have assets within our park system that they want kept overnight for staging. Nearly all of these events take place on the weekends between April and October, and police wages for event security are not part of the general fund or park police budget. Uh, they are recouped through um, permit fees charged to the event holder. Next slide, please. Uh, in years past, the MPRB relied on the Minneapolis Police Department to supplement event security after the Park Police Department has exhausted our staffing resources. Um, in 2019, MPD officers worked approximately 2,200 out of 5,700 total extra duty special event hours. Um, as part of resolution 2020-232, um, the ability to use MPD officers at park sanctioned events um, has been terminated. Um, I guess one of my questions for the board, just to be abundantly clear is, does park sanctioned include permitted third party events? So not events that, that are produced by the park board, but uh, events that are produced by uh, an outside third party um, that are having those events uh, in, in our park space. And then I would note that uh, I have approached some 
um, other partner agencies like the University of Minnesota, uh, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, uh, and the Minnesota State Patrol. And they have all declined to provide um, assistance with, with these events. Um, we have not received a response uh, at this point from Metro Transit. So that is uh, the update around special events. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Superintendent Bangora. Uh, thank you, Chief Ahato. Um, <clears throat> thank you, President Kogel and, and commissioners. Uh, I know nothing planned, but I wanted just to express a few things um, to echo the fact that, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Jenna and Adam and Yvette for coming by today. I can tell you wholeheartedly there's hundreds of more of those stories that you could hear from staff and what the park police and the relationship and the collaborative efforts that has been going on for years, years that has been developed for years within our park system. And it's across the organization. And if you were to speak to residents and talk to people also who have experienced the same things that we do during events, our young people who rely on these officers, who know them, neighborhood associations, we can go down the line. The relationship has been built for years. These officers in this organization has built truly a community policing model. I wrote down a note because this is truly what community policing is. If you look at the spectrum of work that these officers in this organization should be proud of is that they have done the work around racial equity. They've been sitting at the table with us, with, with us through all of our racial equity work. I've spent 19 years in the field and those 19 years, I can promise you, these officers have literally saved so many situations I can't begin to tell you because of the fact that they knew the parents, they knew the kids, they knew the staff, they knew the neighborhood because they were already ingrained, they already were relationships built. This wasn't about rolling into a facility or to a park and not knowing anybody. This is true community policing. It's a false statement to say that 2% of the crime that happens in the park is because 98% happens outside of it. The 2% happens because of the fact that we have people that are stationed in these facilities that have built relationships with our officers. We de-escalate before officers get there. And when they do get there, we have the relationship that de-escalates and we do compassionate, compassionate policing. I've watched it many, many times. I guarantee if you ask Jenna or Adam or Yvette or the hundreds of people that work this organization or the people that are in our community, they will tell you the same thing because of the work that they do. The 2% is because of that relationship. It's because of the history and building upon that. We're not perfect. You know that, but this organization, this, this, this police department has worked hard for years to get to the point that they are now and to have the relationship with our staff. And if you think about Chief Ahado when he brought forward last year around the Pathways Program, which was innovative, $20,000, innovative. I'm talking about community policing beginning from literally someone that is in our neighborhood and have them go along a pathway, we would pay for that. We would guide them to become then park police was an innovative approach. We did that. We knew that that was not approved by this board in the budget. We understand that, but it was innovative. That's what we do. We are an example to a lot of organizations out there about what policing is. I encourage this board to really ask the questions, talk to people, talk to staff, talk to the community understand what we do and who we are. And I'm asking that because a lot of information comes around this stuff about these questions about our police department. And I just wanna encourage commissioners to really take time 
ask the question and talk to people. And it's because of this police department and because of the relationship that we have, this organization is the best park system in the country. And we are known nationally. The work that we do around our officers, around racial equity, around inclusion, around safety, that's what makes this department, this makes this organization great. I only want to make sure that my moment to tell you all this now because I've experienced it for years. And I will tell you there are times I've dealt with some very serious trauma and really, really violent situations that happen. And I promise you our officers were there and they just and they they did it compassionately, they worked with the organization, they worked with us. And there were times where I would go home and I would get a phone call from an officer checking in on me. How am I doing? Are you feeling okay? That was the relationship. That is unique. I worked with Chief Ohado for years. I worked with the officers I sat with yesterday for an hour talking to them because I know them. They've been here for a long time. They're good people. So I just wanted to share that to this board and take this moment because I'm not sure if I have a moment again to do it, but I want you all to know, talk to people, ask the question. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. President Cogill, that is the end of our prepared remarks. Um, we're, we're happy to take any questions the board might have. Okay. Uh, thank you to uh, the chief and to the superintendent and to all of the staff who also uh, spoke. Uh, do commissioners have any questions or comments to provide given the information that was just shared? Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Kogil. So I have a couple questions, but first I want to just say thanks to everyone for, um, you know, providing this safety report. I was a commissioner who asked for this, and um, I appreciate the time that was put into doing this. Thanks, for, thanks to the staff who um, attended this meeting tonight and shared those great stories of relationship and collaboration with our park police and our um, park staff. Uh, that was a big concern and I heard a lot of people from North and Northeast in particular reach out about those relationships. So it was good to have you all, uh, you know, the people who are boots on the ground speaking directly to those relationships where the services are needed, rather it's good or bad. I really appreciate that too, that this wasn't just like about the bad things that are happening around policing. I like that you all shared some positive uh, stories and messaging around the work that's been put into, um, you know, getting to know police officers and young people knowing who the officers are when they walk in the building. Um, I've done a couple ride-alongs and I witnessed that myself. You know, we went to certain parks and the kids knew the officer and just ran up to her and started talking and sharing family stories and what happened at school. And, you know, it makes you feel good when you when you walk in and you see that there's no fear and that, you know, there's obviously a positive response to a police officer. Otherwise, children pick up on those things right away and they stay away. So thanks for sharing. Um, you, Chief, you mentioned that, you know, we have these Four, I think you said 400 events, and you've reached out to some other police forces uh, to support us in those. What is our plan for these? I mean, we may not have them this year because of COVID, but what are our future plans for having support uh, in these events? President Cogill, Vice President Vita. Um, the, the, the board took action at the last meeting uh, without us having time to prepare a plan. And at this point, uh, frankly, we, we don't have a plan on how to backfill um, those more than 2,000 hours. Um, what I can say is that our current capacity within um, the Park Police Department cannot take on those, those um, hours that are beyond 
uh, our capacity. We're, we're stretched extremely thin uh, in the summer season between events that we would host in a non-COVID year uh, and our regular patrol assignments and responsibilities. So there will be more work that needs to be done. Um, we will uh, meet with our partners in customer service. We will probably meet with some of our bigger uh, event sponsors and uh, see what what ideas people come up with. And then the you talked about like uh, needing law enforcement support for permitted events. Is that typically supported by MPD as well, or do the park police usually uh, fill all those ships for um, license and liquor involved events? Um, President Cogill and Commissioner Vita, almost all of those 400 events are third party permitted events. There's only a handful of MPRB um, produced events that include things like the bike tour, uh, the 4th of July, um, Juneteenth are, are few. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you very much for um, answering those questions, Chief. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Commissioner Musich, followed by Commissioner French. Thank you, Commissioner Kogel. I think Commissioner French can go first because I had turned my hand off. So go ahead, Commissioner French. I can wait. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I don't know, but I think I might be the only, uh, maybe Commissioner Severson, uh, are maybe the only park commissioners that were former park employees, and I actually worked directly in the rec department as a code eight worker for years, and I've heard some uh, testimony on how park work, how park police are in interaction with with uh, youth, and I can say, you know what, that's not always been my experience. It's not always been my experience. So my experience sometimes is when a cop, cop comes inside of a building, a gym or something like that, the kids get a little nervous. They get a little scared. They may want to leave. So the, some of the testimony I heard today was a disservice. And I don't think we need Minneapolis police to be working in our parks. We watched Minneapolis police kill a man, let's say, three weeks ago. Maybe we need to think about having non-armed uh, police, non-armed folks uh, patrol our event. Maybe we need to start hiring maybe the Black Masons or somebody, or maybe a private security firm don't carry guns. Maybe we need to open up uh, and think about stuff differently. We don't always need the police. The police were never meant to protect people who look like them. So you may feel protected, and other people may feel protected, by the police, I don't. I don't have had some horrible interactions with police. And I don't feel safe, especially with MPU. So I, I think some of the testimony is, I don't know, I guess I guess everybody has their own opinion, everybody has their own experience, but my experience has not been great. And the, the interaction I've seen with, with uh, park police and kids has not always been great. We had an incident maybe a year and a half ago where park police put guns on our youth. So I'm not buying this story that we have cops somehow are, are, are benevolent. I don't buy it. I watch them drive on grass. I watch them chase kids around. I watch them harass kids. I don't buy it. So I mean, I, I just want to give my opinion as a former as a former park worker of how I think police interact with kids. I watch them drive up on grass and chase kids around. That's what I. And so I, I just want to give that opinion on, on, on what I see about our workers and my interaction with some of the park police workers in the past. So uh, I just I, I just want to say that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Fred Kogel. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Musich, followed by Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President Kogel. Uh, I appreciate the, the complexity of the situation that we put put the institution in with the resolution we passed. 
very quickly at our last board meeting. Um, as we now try to chart a path forward in a non-COVID world for our events and um, park safety just in general, uh, I'm wondering if we're able to look at the available data around uh, the interventions that were required by police at the events that we've had in the past, um, particularly uh, during events that alcohol, alcohol is served at, uh, and if we could collate that data with the size of those, those events to determine whether or not there is an opportunity for us to change policy around um, what sort of events actually require uh, police presence to maintain order when alcohol is present. And I don't expect you to have an answer for that today, uh, Chief Ohato. It's just something that I hope we can consider as we, as we continue to try to figure out how to do things in the future. Um, I've heard from many of our recreation and maintenance staff in the past week or so um, since the agenda item looking at you know, discontinuing the park police popped up on our agenda. Um, a lot of people have shared stories similar to the ones uh, that we've heard this evening about early intervention, about helping uh, staff put safety plans in place that help them to, uh, to avoid and avert um, situations becoming serious enough that someone is harmed either emotionally or physically. And it seems very clear to me that our staff feel that the park police are an integral component to their ability to provide a safe experience for both themselves as employees and, and park patrons in general. Um, am I convinced that, that every interaction with the park police is a good one for people? Uh, no, because that's just not the nature of being a human being. There is always going to be an opportunity for things to go wrong, and I hope that uh, people are open to understanding that you can learn from a bad experience and find ways to allow that to shape future interactions in a positive way. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I do hope that the next time we get an update on um, safety plans and how we move forward with events uh, that we can include some of that data that, that I was talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Forney, followed by Meyer. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, th thank you all for the presentation. It's um, a lot of depth here and a lot to consume. Um, a couple questions. Um, regarding um, having police, I believe I heard you say it's our policy to have, to require police or wherever alcohol is present, I mean, whatever event. Are there other entities that have that same or similar or, you know, is it a state requirement, federal, or is this just us? President Cogill and Commissioner Forney, it is pretty, a pretty common practice for municipalities to require police officers when alcohol is served um, in public venues. Uh, it's, that's not uncommon. Um, there, are, there are alternate uh, approaches that other municipalities have as well um, around licensing and private security. And then um, I can't believe, I think um, whatever the open time speaker, uh, Mr. Tamburino was talking about the bike event. Um, we've used always, you know, um, uh, the, the MPD, you know, could that be done by um, volunteers or something like that? The, um... so, so I think, you know, there, there is always a role for volunteers and for um, private security, but, but we also have to understand um, what their statutory authority is. So, you know, the Twin Cities, Twin Cities in Motion um, for the Twin Cities Marathon does a great job of mobilizing volunteers to really um, install and monitor barricades across um, the marathon route. But if somebody um, goes around that barricade, the volunteers have no capacity to enforce the road closure. And so we need to have people who have the authority and capacity 
to en enforce that road closure um, in positions to intercept um, when somebody gets onto the race course. So it's not a it's not a and or it's a it it has to be um, a partnership. Thank you, and and I think that's what we we've been looking at is you know what what are our limitations? What's our you know uh, what what are we losing as a result of um, our motion to or you know that we um, are now discontinuing with the the city police anyway? Um, and then um, superintendent. If, if um, yeah. the, the, the biggest concern for me, frankly, are, are you know, 10 to 20 um, really, really large events where we have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people gathered in park space. Um, I think that those are um, the events that would most likely be targeted in a case of domestic terrorism or mass shooting. and um, we just do not have uh, enough officers to provide the sort of security that's necessary for those massive events. So, you know, if we're talking about a 5K at Lake Harriet, yeah, that's pretty easy to absorb the impact. If we're talking about 200,000 people on the riverfront on 4th of July, um, that becomes almost impossible for us to do alone. Thank you for that clarity, um, Chief Ojado. And I don't know if um, Superintendent uh, Bangora or Chief Ojado would like to speak to, but um, uh, you brought up the Pathways Program um, that was proposed last year. Number one, what happened to it? How, what would the cost be? And what what was it about? Um, please, if you can uh, go through that again, I would really appreciate it. Either one of you, whoever feels comfortable in speaking. Uh, President Cogill, um, Commissioner Forney, I will uh, turn this over to um, Chief Ahado, who was the author and the uh, vision behind the program. So uh, go ahead, Chief Ahado. Um, President Cogill, uh, Commissioner Forney, that was part of our 2020 um, recommended budget. Um, it was a $20,000 budget request that basically allowed for us to hire people in an apprenticeship job and then send them to college to get them um, certified and licensed as police officers. And then they would transition to park police officers at the end of that two to three year um, um, time span. Um, we figured with $20,000, we would start with one or two candidates, um, which is a pretty good um, attrition uh, it's predictable attrition for our, our agency. Um, and we would see how it goes and, and expand the program um, based on its, its success. Uh, that, that budget, recommended budget um, initiative was uh, removed uh, by the Board of Commissioners upon adoption of the 2020 budget. Thank you. It seems to me that that's the type of thing we should be implementing today. So thank you all for the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Um, I, I felt the vast majority of the presentation uh, was a lot more relevant to uh, resolution 2020-252, which, you know, is coming down later on the agenda. So, I mean, you know, they could what was said under advisement for that, but didn't really uh, spend much time um, uh, addressing anything that you know, has been raised by the resolution that we passed up to now. I mean, just a little bit, and you know, the questions that commissioners have asked have been getting to that, and I hope that's um, something that we, that we uh, look at further. Um, I really want to know, like, uh, can we downsize uh, the number of hours that we require uh, police officers to be at events, and what are the barriers to it? So that's my, that's the main question I want to get at tonight is, um, what what are the statutory barriers? Like, um, and if we were to switch over to say a um, park ranger model or something like, um, like is that a a state law that says that only like a, an officer could stop someone who went into a 5K route or something? I'll let you answer that question first, and then I'll have a couple others. Uh, 
Um, President Cogill and Commissioner Meyer. Um, so, so first of all, the, the only people authorized by statute to um, do a traffic stop, for example, are licensed peace officers. Now, one of the parts um, that, that I think is yet to be determined is um, what, what are you proposing that the park police be replaced with? And I, and I keep hearing this ranger term, but nobody has um, described to me what, what a ranger is. Um, is a ranger a licensed peace officer? Um, if the answer is yes, then that ranger could conduct a traffic stop. But I, I'm hearing um, I'm hearing many different things that that lack um, the level of clarity I need to make an assessment. Yeah, well, that's one of the exact things that I wanted to have more conversation about, like, um, and that, that I don't know. I mean, you know, at, at the last meeting, uh, the changes I interpreted was. Um, was nothing more than a cosmetic change. So then everything that um, the park police do now, it, that change would have done nothing except change the name. But I'd like to consider um, different options and, and want to know, um, you know, what, what would work and what wouldn't. Like, I mean, taking the question, for example, of whether they um, would need to be armed. Like, does the, does the statute require that, you know, a, a peace officer, whether it's, um, you know, if, if it was switched to a, an unarmed person, could they still have statutory authority? President Gill and Commissioner Meyer, I, I might defer to Council Wright on this. I think um, potentially you could have a licensed peace officer that was unarmed, although I'm not aware of where that exists anywhere in the state of Minnesota. And as I said uh, at the last meeting, um, with the amount of gun ownership and, and gun violence that takes place in the city, uh, I don't know of anyone who would work in a, in a police officer or peace officer role um, and, and be unarmed. I don't, I don't see that as feasible with, with the amount of gun violence and the prevalence of guns. Um, in our state and in our city. Okay. Um, um, certainly, yeah, certainly, Council. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Meyer, I'm, I'm keeping track of your questions, but I, I think that uh, Chief Bojado has stated that correctly. Um, we can't hear you, Council Rice. Can you please get, turn on your mic? To answer Commissioner Meyer's question, could you hear me now? Yes. Um, Commissioner Meyer, you would ask the question about um, uh, police officers' use of weapons. I think that uh, Chief Otto answered that correctly. Um, peace officers are licensed by the state of Minnesota. They're authorized to use deadly force and they're authorized to carry firearms. Um, a department, I think, in theory could hire a peace officer. Um, and direct them not to carry a weapon or limit the type of weapons they could carry. Um, but again, I would defer to the chief as to the advisability of, of doing that. Okay. Um, and then for the, for the alcohol requirement, I mean, you said that most cities have that, but it, so, okay. Um, if, if the park board just made the change, would that be sufficient, or would there be other jurisdictions that, like, would the city also have to make a change? Because I saw, I saw that they made a change recently, but I didn't know the details of it. Um, President Cogill and Commissioner Myers, so the, the Board of Commissioners does have authority over the alcohol um, in the park's policy. That policy is what governs how many park police officers, uh, at a minimum, are assigned to alcohol-related events. And the board, I think, has uh, clear authority over that policy. Um, I'm not aware of any police officer requirements linked to liquor licenses at any of our establishments, but I don't know that with 100% assurance. Okay. Um, so I, I think what I'd uh, like to see happen is for more analysis of 
um, how we can, um, you know, shrink the number of hours that are needed from, sounds like the total was like 5,000 or something and 2,000 were MPD and 3,000 were park in 2019. Um, you know, we have time because presumably that those event hours will be a lot lower for as long as, as COVID lasts. And I assume that they're gonna be a lot um, less needed during the winter than they are during the summer. So we have time to, um, to, to be thinking about that, but um, if MPD isn't substantially reformed by um, spring of next year, then I would want to, you know, I, I want to do as much as possible to um, reduce the need uh, so that we can work within our means and not depend on MPD. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Meyer. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Severson. Uh, thank you, uh, President Cogill. Um, I believe two nights ago, there was a um, pretty severe shooting uh, at Fireview Park with two parties uh, with some pretty serious guns, and, and one of the young people were shot in the neck. Uh, Chief Ohado, did MPD back us up in support at this tragic event? President Cogill and Commissioner Severson, what, what happened is there was um, the shooting that took place in the parking lot at Farview Park. Um, it did involve at least uh, two people with firearms. Um, the person who was shot uh, in that incident um, was actually able to, to self-evacuate from the park and, and found a Minneapolis police officer nearby on an adjacent street. So that Minneapolis police officer uh, is the one who provided initial aid to the victim and park officers managed the crime scene in the park. So it was a collaborative effort uh, to manage that, that very complicated call. Did this help um, the situation and the safety for the north side having MPD there? Uh, President Cogill and Commissioner Severson, um, the, the answer to that it is yes. I mean, we, we've talked about this at the last meeting. It's, it's with the size of our, our park police department, major incidents can overwhelm our shifts in a hurry. And without the, the support and partnership and collaboration with MPD, um, that would take everybody that we have working on any given night. Um, there was another shooting at Fireview Park last night, from my understanding, uh, with lots of groups of people there. Um, and I believe the shooting from my interpretation of the events that I'm reading on social media and emails and phone calls I'm getting, that it was stemmed from large fights of multiple young people that turned into a shooting. Did, did MP, uh, MPD back us up on that call? Commissioner, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Severson, I don't have the details on the call from last night, but I can look into that for you. All right. Um, I, a few other questions. Um, I, I guess, you know, I have a lot of questions and concerns, um, and maybe this is geared um, towards uh, President Coville. Um How do we, on the north side, with the high violence rates, particularly with guns, how do we community police that? Or I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking a question of the board. How do we community police the multiple shootings that have taken place here on the north side. Commissioner Severson, I think that's a great uh, discussion question uh, that we could have uh, at another time. I mean, it's a large question. Uh, I think that uh, certainly uh, questions of systemic uh, issues around safety and how safety happens and uh, what kinds of investments help deter violence, uh, also what role we can play in uh, reducing the amount of guns that are on the street. I think those are all important questions. I think it's also important that we think about how our officers are trained, um, who is responding to what kinds of calls, et cetera. Um, but I don't know if there's a, a larger answer to that question at this time. All right. I would like to caution every park commissioner this evening making decisions about how we move forward with our police. I'm very concerned about the safety and well-being of the children in our community, the young people, 
our families, our seniors. North Minneapolis has severe gun violence issues that have been ignored by this park board, this very, very park board, um, by the city council, by the county, by the state, by the federal government. I am very concerned about the well-being of our communities, and I'm very, I'm very fearful of what happens in this very community in North Minneapolis if we continue to go down a path and not listen to Northside residents or the voices of the people who live here and instead listen to outside influencers who are pushing an agenda. I believe there's a deep conversation to be held around changing what our policing looks like. I agree with that, but I also do not want my community to be on the back end of burying children and young people because this very board makes a decision without a plan to protect this very community that they should be wanting to protect. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, Commissioner French for the second time, followed by Vice President Vita for the second time. Sorry. Uh, question for Chief Ohado. Uh At the encampment at Powder Horn, we have about 200, maybe 225 folks stand. How many park police officers are assigned to that encampment? President Cogill and Commissioner French, there's currently no police officers assigned specifically to the encampment. Um, have, the, have, you got, have you gotten any calls of disturbances or violence uh, from the encampment? Disturbance? Well, I was made aware of an overdose that took place, I believe it was yesterday morning, by Vice President Vita. Okay, uh, that's, you got a, that's a population that suffering from drug addiction. So that that what I, what I'm why I'm asking this what the reason I'm asking this question is uh, I've been to the camp and you know there's about 200 some people there and you know who policing that camp the people in that camp police that camp and they've done a tremendous job of making sure that place is safe and I'm thinking that we need to start having conversations like that about who's policing us we can police. We can do that. We did it during the uprising. They're doing it at the camp right now. I, 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 I refuse to buy into this mob type mentality that says the only that the police can keep us safe. I, I'm not buying it. I don't. I don't believe that the police can keep us safe. Most of the time, when the police come, <laughs> the incident has already happened. So if you can tell me an incident where the park police came and stopped the shooting or stopped a, a, a bunch of people fighting, I would be interested. In you. Um, C Commissioner French, I've, I've shared with this board, um, and I, I send emails routinely to uh, Vice President Vita, who chairs the Park Police Oversight Committee, um, those interventions that take place routinely in our park system. And, you know, one that comes to mind was um, the, the young man um, at Cabell Park uh, who was spray painting graffiti and was approached by a neighbor who he then threatened with a firearm. And the park police were able to effectively follow up and investigate that case. I mean, there are- Did we ever find a firearm in that case? Um, did, we ever, did we ever find a gun in that case? We found the ammunition, magazines, and uh, video documentation of the firearm. So, but not the firearm itself. Okay. And he's been charged in, in Hennepin County Court. I, 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 I will I will I will say I think it's our youth workers who do a lot of interventions in our parks and I think that's what the resources need to do and we hire more youth workers and the top. So thank you, President Kogo, for giving me the opportunity to speak for a second time. Thank you, Commissioner French, Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, a few questions. Have we heard from any of these partners that you know that uh, we host these very large events that bring us a lot of money into the parks about our uh, previous resolution to uh, divest from MPD. Have any of these partners reached out and shared uh, any questions, concerns, you know, um, even, you know, sharing positive feedback for the resolution that passed a couple weeks ago? President uh, Cogill and, and Vice President Vita, I have not specifically heard from, from any of our events. Um, folks that, that have permits in the parks. 
I think one of the, the challenges right now is the COVID environment because we're not having events uh, this summer. We have not had um, the, the same stream of communication that we normally do. I don't know if, if Tom Godfrey's um, still on the meeting, if, if he's got additional information about that from the customer service department or not. I don't have those notes, but we can definitely talk to our permits department and see what type of feedback has been coming in uh, uh, here recently on that. Thank you. I would appreciate that. Um, the other thing is, I would, I mean, this conversation is really good. I like that we're all, you know, uh, sharing our questions, concerns. I would like us to have regular updates on this safety plan as it's being, you know, as that decision made two weeks ago is being implemented into uh, MPRB. So, you know, like maybe a monthly update on like some of the things that you brought up around like who's going to provide uh, backup, like who's going to, are, are we still going to be doing 400 events versus, you know, or maybe we go down to 200 events. I'm not sure, but regular updates would be greatly appreciated. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I think what's important here is that our city, you know, we have this uh, saying that we're one Minneapolis, but we're really not. The needs on the north side are very different than the needs on the south side. I, just based on the emails that I received around the decision we made two weeks ago, you know, the south side uh, emails were very encouraging and Oh, I'm so happy that you got rid of MPD, that you won't be working with MPD, but that is not what I heard from the north side of our city. North siders are afraid. They're worried about uh, knee-jerk reactions that we're making to policing. Um, I think we owe it to the people who voted for us to be extremely transparent and update them regularly on what is going on, around policing in the parks. There's a lot of confusion around the decision that was made two weeks ago and uh, things that are on the agenda tonight around park policing. I think we need to provide as much clarity as we can. People are really worried about what, what's happening in our parks around safety. Although some of us may not feel safe with police, some of us do. So like for those who do feel safe, and have that expectation that we are going to provide that service, we owe it to them to keep them posted on decisions we're making. We owe it to them to uh, allow them to have input before we start making decisions around policing. It is a big deal, you know, to a lot of people. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, I've been over to uh, the sanctuary a few times and there, there's a mix of how people, you know, want to be police. But overall, almost everyone I talked to, which could have been a total of 20, 25 people over the few times, have said to me, the size of the sanctuary matters if you need policing or not, or what they can manage themselves around public safety. If it grows bigger, they're going to need help. I had many people say to me, if something is going wrong in here, we are going to expect you all to come in with the police and help us out. If this, if this sanctuary keeps growing, which we, we have no clue, we have no control over at this point, if it keeps growing, if there are, there's a, a, a greater chance that there will need to be some support. Many of those people over there told me, it's fine at the number that it is, but if it grows bigger, it can get out of control. I've been in these situations in five, 10 different times and the number is good now, but if that changes, then like how we react to, uh, you know, crime or whatever is happening um, at these sanctuaries is very different. That's it for me. Thank you, uh, Vice President Vita. Um, you know, it's, been a while I do have a couple of questions um, for staff um, uh, I, I appreciate the overview though I, I do feel like it was a bit um, uh, broad um, and didn't focus on the unanimously uh, passed directives um, I'm wondering uh, if 
staff has reviewed or evaluated the city's action that they took two weeks ago when uh, Friday uh, regarding uh, event requirements for or police requirements for events um, and that impact on on our own system has that been looked at president Cogill I'll, I'll take that as being directed to me um, you know I, I I appreciate your sense that that this presentation was broad um, the directive from the board was for us to come back with a safety plan. And, and in my mind, um, that was extremely broad. I, I reached out to uh, Commissioner Vita. I shared the presentation with her in advance of the board meeting. And I was hopeful to meet the expectations of the board. Um, I have not reviewed what the Minneapolis Police Department has done around uh, their special event security. Okay. So there was an action taken by the city council uh, that uh, ended the requirement to have peace officers at events. Um, it sounds like there is a policy uh, at the board level here at the park board that uh, requires uh, peace officers at, uh, at uh, events that have alcohol. Um, I think that th we certainly should be looking at I don't know if council's looking at that, but also our chief looking at whether or not the city's, what the city passed uh, affects at all what our ordinance uh, is, and also whether or not the ordinance, uh, the, the resolution that we passed two weeks ago uh, would supersede uh, that resolution, or if the board needs to take some other action to clarify um, th the discrepancy between the two. Um, I also uh, want to ask uh you know th there was there's a substantial amount of time taken in the overview uh and the superintendent made remarks about how the park police are different from mpd that we do true community policing um what is the difference in training between the park police and mpd do they train together? Or are they separate? Is it a similar training regimen or is it different in any way? Uh, President Cogill and, and commissioners. So we, the, the Park Police Department um, does do pre-service and in-service training with the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, that is a function of a couple of things. Um, I think it's primarily a function of trying to provide seamless public safety services throughout the city of Minneapolis. Um, they, they have provided us that training without cost for, for many, many years. In fact, for as many years as I know of, um, that cost or, or that training is, is um, approved and required by the Minnesota Post Board. So if, if we did it from the Minneapolis Police Department, we would have to get it elsewhere and we would have to pay for it. And there are guidelines provided by the post board on, on what that training um, is comprised of. Um, so, so, but beyond that, um, we within the Park Police Department um, do extensively additional training beyond that. So, everyone that works for the Park Police Department attends uh, the same training that Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board uh, employees attend. So, for example. Um, the, the training around um, racial equity. Uh, all of our employees attend the same park board training um, that other employees would, would attend. Um, in addition, beyond both of those things, we also have uh, a contract with the League of Minnesota Cities um, to provide additional police officer training. And, and we uh, um, assign that training uh, based on our requirements. Okay, uh, that, that's helpful. Um, I I will just underscore something that I've said in in the past. But uh, when 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 we're telling this story about how uh, our public safety is different, I think we behooves us to evaluate every aspect of what how that how that is actually demonstrably true. And when we are still uh, 
part of a training regimen with the Minneapolis Police Department, which I think resoundly indicated um, with events uh, over the past month uh, that major reconstruction needs to happen um, and rethinking of what public safety is and rethinking of that department. Uh, our association with that department and our association with how um, the uh, training uh, occurs for our officers uh, needs to be evaluated before we say that we do community policing that is different than what city police do. Um, I see that uh, my time is up. I, I would just uh, want to uh, finally uh, indicate one thing. There was a question of what um, was meant uh, in the resolution. Um, again, uh, I'm not sure why there was a lack of clarity. Uh, the word is sanctioned, park sanctioned events. That is any event that is given official permission or approval. That's what sanctioned means. So that is any event that is occurring in the system that the park board has allowed to occur. Um, with that, that's, I, I think that I'm not seeing any other hands up um, and I will uh, ask the superintendent to kick off our COVID-19 response update. Sorry about that. Thank you, President Kogel uh, and commissioners. Um, I'm not seeing the slide come up yet, so I'm waiting for at least the presentation slide to come up and I can get started. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, so thank you, uh, um, commissioners. Um, thank you for this opportunity to provide another COVID-19 uh, update to the board. Uh, I have a few remarks uh, that I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Cox, Assistant Superintendent Barrick, and Director Weissman for um, additional recreation, environmental stewardship, and finance uh, updates. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is around the parkways, uh, parkway vendor selection and duration of closures, the vehicle. So as commissioners know, uh, we currently have sections of eight parkways closed to motor vehicles uh, to provide additional space um, for pedestrians and also, of course, for social distancing. On May uh, 6th, uh, the board or the commissioners passed a resolution that included um, a funding limit of $250,000 for um, the parkway closures. Um, these funds or the funding would allow uh, for closures to remain in place for an extended period of time uh, with the end date to be determined once a vendor was selected. Uh, staff solicited vendor bids, which were due by June 3rd. Closures will remain in place through Sunday, July 19th, uh, with removal of barricades on Monday, July 20th. Next slide, please. So on June, the, the executive orders, Governor Waltz's executive orders, um, on June 5th, uh, Governor Waltz issued an executive order uh, 2074 and announced phase three of the Stay Safe Minneapolis or Minnesota plan, um, which uh, began in June 10th. Uh, this allows for gradual turning uh, of the dial to reopen businesses and activities. Um, and this was, you know, while remaining, of course, prepared to dial back um, at the advice of public health experts. And what you hear from the governor, Walt, very often is he talks about dialing up or dialing back. So it really depends on how this pandemic or the COVID-19, uh, if we see a rise in cases, then that may be where the, the governor will dial back. Um, if we don't, then there might be a dial up again. So we are adjusting constantly around uh, those executive orders. Um, the, um, the executive orders and announcement were made uh, earlier than expected based on uh, the Minnesota Department of Health forecast. Um, and, and of course the peak of the occurring uh, pandemic in July, uh, but does not change of course the fact that social distancing um, still needs to be continued 
in order to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And the one thing the governor has very said, and also all the experts have said, the really only uh, cure we have right now, our vaccine is, of course, social distancing. The new executive order um, allows the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board um, to slowly uh, turn up the dial two, which we have been doing. And, and we turn up as our resources allow us to turn it up. So where I'm pleased um, to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent of Recreation, uh, Tyrese Cox, to provide an update on the recreation programs and services. Uh, with that, um, Assistant Superintendent Cox, this is all yours. Thank you, Superintendent. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about what's different today versus uh, what we've been able to do in the previous week. Next slide, please. So as Superintendent mentioned, um, the new executive order has made several opportunities available to us. Um, but I want to note that many of them are, will come with some restrictions or requirements or conditions that are kind of outside of or contradictory to the ways that we typically do business or operate our programs and, and services. So part of the challenge has been to balance those new possibilities with uh, what we have for available staffing resources, financial resources, um, and just what we can do in particular timing. But I'll talk about uh, some of those things uh, with a little bit more specifics in the next slide. So an odd place to talk about the kickoff to summer, but as you all know, we are hearing about what our new possibilities are in kind of short increments. So it's kind of like spoon feeding. We don't know what we what may be available to us um, prior to you know two weeks advance notice. So that doesn't give us long ramp up time. So we have been thinking recently about uh, you know considering Fourth of July weekend as the kickoff to summer for our board. Uh, next slide. So as part of that kickoff, we are going to turn on approximately 25% of our waiting pools and splash pads. Um, and we chose that number um, one to, it is manageable for us both from a service uh, perspective. Can we maintain them in cleaning and the, the, the uh, condition of the splash pads and can we operate them in ways that adhere to the current uh, executive orders? So while we have uh, some 20 of them named here, and you'll see the asterisk uh, next to some of them, those are where Rec Plus exists. I want to note that the current executive order requires us to have a, a kind of a monitor, uh, someone that kind of uh, monitors the the splash pads or waiting pools because they can only operate, I believe, 50% occupancy. And so we need someone to be at those locations to say, we are already at capacity for now, you'll have to wait your turn and or someone to encourage people to maintain social distancing. And given splash pads, splash pads and waiting pools, you can imagine how challenging that is going to be to, uh, to maintain four-year-olds, reminding them to be socially distant. So we've got our work cut out for us for that, but um, that's something that we can look forward to um, leading up to 4th of July weekend. We will um, provide lifeguard services at, five, at the five main beaches. And what, again, that's a capacity issue. We don't have the ability to do all eight that we typically do, and we certainly can't do the 12 that exist. The fact that we are doing any of them is a, a bit of a step ahead of some of our, our peers in the metro. Many of the uh, public service municipalities said, we're just not doing this at all. And they named that back in like mid to late April. They said the demand to, to do social distancing and do lifeguard services is more than they could take on. And so they just named that some of them will have their beaches open, but they will not be providing lifeguard services there at all. We, however, starting with uh, Worth Beach, Nokomis Main Beach, and the Thomas Beach at Padema Costco will offer lifeguard services on Mondays and Fridays for these next two weekends. And then uh, adding 
Harriet, Maine, and Cedar East by 4th of July weekend, we will have lifeguard services at all five, seven days a week um, during our normal operating hours, which I believe are seven, I'm sorry, noon to 7 p.m. Another thing that we're adding is what we're calling water orientation. Um, and that's for little people um, ages six to 14. They are not swim lessons. And the reason we can't offer swim lessons is because of the close proximity that's required with swim lessons. We don't have the ability to maintain social distance and be close enough to young people to kind of um, support them in the water, encourage them to move their bodies in particular ways. Um, so what we're doing is we are giving them kind of fundamental drills, stuff that we can do from a distance at, you know, waist high um, or knee high water, telling them what water safety means, how to practice that and how to do some low level, um, keep yourself safe in the water kinds of things. We chose six to 14, six because we want to orient young people, the little ones to water, but 14 is when kids start to venture off by themselves with their friends. And so we wanted to, them to have at least the base level. We are not purporting that this is going to be equivalent to swim lessons, but we want people, we want the big kids to at least start to understand uh, what water safety means and how to not venture beyond their skill level in the water. These sessions will uh, run um, Monday through Friday, about 40 minutes. They are $28 a session for residents, but we are offering uh, scholarships that will bring the price down to about $5 each. And we chose that amount so that people kind of have a little bit of skin in the game because we want them to see their sessions all the way through. Next slide, please. Night off, we are turning that back on and that will happen Monday, Fridays and Saturdays. Um, traditional hours, eight to 11 at the following locations, Farview, Botno, East Phillips and MLK Park. So this is something that's kind of interesting. We are uh, regularly looking to, you know, enter into partnership with neighboring organizations. And one of the things that we are doing along with the African-American community response team is something that's called Get on the Bus, and that is a mobile learning lab. So literally, um, luxury buses will show up in three of our parks that will hold uh, both, that will uh, have Wi-Fi and on-bus restrooms. And so kids will come to the park and they will, they will participate in one of three activities at a time. There'll be a STEM session that will happen out in the park in open air. There will be the academic enrichment part of it that will happen on the bus. And then we will, Park Board will provide the recreation activities. And so um, it's a full day, it's about six hours, and kids will rotate in two hour increments around those three things um, each day. Um, for, and they're, and I'm sorry, I don't have this memorized yet, but I believe they're happening in two week increments. And again, those are locations are Bethune Park, North Commons, and Farview. Recognizing that we don't have a rec center at Bethune Park, we didn't want to do it at Harrison because we have, we're working very hard to keep the rec plus sites pretty standalone, trying not to uh, intermix kids and programs where rec plus exists. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I'll talk about something that we are looking forward to. Um, I just wanted to note that we are continuing, uh, by we I mean the uh, event staff are continuing to think about ways to bring some of the traditional things that has meant summer for our organization and for the city, that is movies in the park and music in the park. Um, we are hoping that we can submit some plans for August that do kind of a summer ending celebration. And I know it's not quite the same as what we're used to, but given um, COVID conditions. We don't know what the mayor, I'm sorry, the governor may make available or dial back between now and then. So we are working, they are working feverishly to identify some ways to bring at least that experience to the end of the summer. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we hope to have more information in the coming weeks. Thank you. Good evening, President Colgill, Commissioners, and thank you. So Assistant Superintendent Cotton. <clears throat> Sorry, this is 
This is Superintendent Barrick, um, and wanted to share an update on all the things that are kind of going on in environmental stewardship uh, as well as we continue to, to support the park system through this time. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so we've talked a lot about hygiene stations in the past, and I've just put them in there because um, we've added an additional one at Whittier, um, and we will be opening Powderhorn's bathrooms tomorrow. Um, and we will operate that as a hygiene station being open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, several of these require two to three times a day cleaning, seven days a week, um, which uh, our standard cleaning regime is, a, is one time a day, um, and we obviously have more bathrooms turned on. But when you think about having six that are being cleaned twice, that's essentially like having 12 bathrooms turned on. So we're trying to um, get a grip on our capacity with bathroom cleaning and what's required. Um, one thing to note in our asset management group, we have about a 70 to 80% attendance. So um, with COVID leave or COVID concerns, um, we're, we're, we're not seeing 100% attendance and, and so we're not at full strength with the workforce. So trying to give you a snapshot there. We, um, another thing, we have also added the portable restrooms and hand washing stations at Logan, the mall, and TV. Those are actually provided by the city. And then portable restrooms that we've added uh, with no sinks, um, one at Franklin Steel. Uh, and then Powderhorn Park, we have currently eight BIFs on the east side of the park, and three additional are expected tomorrow. So we'll go to 11 BIFs in total on the east side of the park. And then we have five BIFs on the west side of the park. Um, and then uh, with a mobile shower that was hooked up today, and we'll go into a bit more in the next presentation um, on homelessness and parks, but then we also will be adding three additional BIFs to the west side. So we'll go to 19 BIFs in total at Powderhorn Park. And so uh, a lot of that funding that we're drawing on is coming out of the, uh, the fee, the uh, easement fee, uh, the $94,800 easement fee from the DOT. Um, so we go to the... Next slide. Um, so with the hygiene station, those are restrooms we're cleaning. As we move to open the waiting pools that Assistant Superintendent Cox just outlined, uh, we need to open bathrooms at every one of those facilities. So we'll be opening a bathroom uh, at each of them. It'll be the bathroom of the building. Um, so we're set to begin filling the pools on June 24th. Um, once they're filled, that's when we assess things and we can, can we can look at the conditions and if there's any required repairs to be completed, we'll make every effort to get those done and open the stated pools. If we come across anything that's um, severe and can't be done by the 4th of July, we would adjust that lift um, to, to the pool, the next closest pool, and again, opening the bathroom with each pool. Um, we're gonna op we're gonna start filling on the 24th to mitigate risk, and we're also in the process of bringing on some more seasonals. So we had originally started the summer in the neighborhood of 60 to 65 seasonals that were called back. We've lost uh, about 10 of those. And so we're working to bring back some more seasonals to get our levels back up. Um, we anticipate all 20 pools will be filled and balanced chemically by July 1 so that they can be open on July 4th. Um, we're also supporting the 13 Rep Plus sites throughout the city, and that support looks like early morning cleaning, frequent cleaning um, at the end of the day, or throughout the day, and then again at the end of the day. So um, supporting those 13 plus sites, the waiting pools and the hygiene stations um, are a lot of our time right now. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so some additional programming um, with the uh, the shelter and adult athletic permits are being requested um, at a pretty significant rate. Um, right now we're really focusing on trash and sanitized prepare uh, fields for athletics. The picnic shelter rentals are also full, so we're working hard again to keep the trash removed and get everything cleaned up for the next customers when they come through. Um, we've been maintaining beaches by you know, litter pickup. Um, which is also something we're seeing, we're seeing a, a good deal of use. And so litter and trash is, is becoming kind of a, a big thing for us. Um, we're working at the beaches for vegetation removal, the fish kill and carp cleanup. We had some fish kill and a carp virus come through 
and that that created a bunch of work there. Um, and then the uh, social distancing guidelines signs. So we've been doing a lot of sign posting uh, throughout the system um, as a result of the social distancing. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the la so the last thing I want to just make sure we got out there it's out of environmental stewardship um, is environmental management. So our environmental management through their environmental ed program, uh, the aquatic invasive species, uh, we're, we're busy there. Um, we're off we're still providing offering uh, the AIS, so the aquatic invasive species inspectors at the boat launches. We've seen uh, a record number of boats being inspected in May for us. Um, we have got the community garden program rolling still with four locations and more than 70 plots assigned. At the Eloise Butler Wildflower Flower Garden, we're open. Um, we're doing some, in, you know, we're doing some virtual stuff like Facebook Live story time, um, weekly Facebook Live garden tours. But the garden is also open with social distancing, so that's an amenity that's out there for folks. The JD Rivers Children Garden um, is open, and we have folks. Uh, youth growing produce for the nearby communities. We also have the neighborhood naturalist programs and 30 parks service weekly programming in park uh, prompts, yoga stories, strolls, imagination stations, etc. And then we are still engaging and working with um, volunteers in a modified way. And we have 68 stewardship agreements in place for the summer, and uh, with social modifications for social distancing. So initially groups no larger than 10, now new groups no larger than 25. And the one thing I should have mentioned too back at the asset management is we really we really kind of honed in on our big five, which we are looking at as um, trash, bathrooms, uh, rec plus, pools now, um, and the other one, and mowing. And so uh, we are stretched with mowing. We're doing the best we can. Typically at the early part of the summer, we use overtime to catch up. So as it gets hot and wet, grass takes off on us and we inherently fall behind. Then as the summer stabilizes, the growth kind of slows down and we're able to kind of catch up. But we typically use overtime. But given the COVID-19 budget crisis concerns, we refrained from using overtime and we've kind of stretched our rotation out um, in order to, to keep things going. So to go to the next slide, I think that's yeah, that was everything from environmental search up. So thank you. Thank you to uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrick, Assistant to Superintendent Cox. Um, we have a few commissioners with questions. Uh, Commissioner Musich followed by Meyer. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, <clears throat> can we get a list? of the 20 pools that will be opened. And I had thought there was going to be an update on restrooms, but I don't think I heard one other than the restrooms adjacent to waiting pools are being opened. Are we planning on opening any restroom facilities that are outdoor facing other than those restrooms? President Colville, Commissioner Musich, at this time, um, we, the correct, the, the, Waiting pool bathrooms are the ones we are opening publicly. We're okay. assessing our capacity to then move into the next phase of other public outfacing restrooms. Okay, so we so, still don't know which ones we're gonna open not, other than the ones that point. are near these these waiting pools and splash pads. Correct, we have, we kind of, we know where all of our BIFs are, know which of these we're opening, and then we'll be looking at that next phase and looking at can we, what can we take on? Yep. Okay. Could we get this presentation emailed to us so that it's easy for us to reference when we get questions by constituents? Um, as recently as last week, I was told we did not have enough trained and certified lifeguards to provide lifeguarding services at beaches. And I'm wondering uh, what changed since last week that we're now able to do that? And uh, will the people that are being deployed in this capacity be properly trained, drilled, and certified? Commissioner Musich, that is accurate. We currently, as we sit now, we do not have enough lifeguards to operate at uh, full capacity as we have in years. So we are taking the next two weeks to uh, to work towards ramping up. Um, and you know, we are 
we have some of our go-tos, some that are currently on staff, some of our uh, full-time certifieds. Um, and we are keeping our fingers crossed that all of the ones that have expressed an interest in working for us back in March are still interested and available. Okay, so I was told we have 35 people that are ready to go right now. Um, and with the number of beaches and hours that you just um, outlined in your presentation, I don't understand how we can actually provide the service we are now telling the public is going to be available. Commissioner um, Musich, that is correct. So why, that is why we are starting with the three in red, Worth, Nokomis, and Thomas Beach, just on the weekends for these next two weeks. You're right, we don't have enough to run all five of them at full scale. Um, what we typically hire in a year, now keep in mind this includes pools, we typically hire about 130 lifeguards and we don't have that on staff now. Right, and typically we would start training people in March and April for the summer. So I'm just, I'm very concerned that we are over promising to the public that we are going to provide a service. We do not have time to adequately prepare people to provide. Um, I do not want to see a bunch of uh, young people being put in the position to do a very dangerous and stressful job that they are not adequately prepared to do. That is a legitimate concern, um, but I, I hope that you and the rest of your colleagues trust that if we need to pull back and say that we don't have the amount of staff that we have, we can offer, we can only offer less guarded beaches or less hours. We hope that there will be a little bit of grace for that because we, we don't want to put neither our staff nor park patrons in the position to trust that they're being guarded and that our staff isn't adequately prepared. So, um, So we'll be receiving a regular update then from staff on the preparedness of being able to provide the services that we're now going to be telling people are going to be available? Yes. Okay. Um, for the night owl programs that are taking place, are they taking place outdoors or within, within indoors in the rec centers? Um, Commission Musich, it, it is a combination of so to the extent possible, our goal is to do as much outside as we can. The new uh, executive orders allow us to do some things inside, provided we can maintain uh, social distancing and we have the ability to do the sanitation in, um, in ways that you know, support cleanliness and, and all of that. So to the extent possible, we're gonna be outside as much as we can, weather permitting. And will we be providing participants with masks if they do not come with them to the site? Uh, we will make we will encourage people to bring masks with them, um, as we do with it, with all of our all of our other uh, programs. In the event that kids who are participating in uh, night outs don't have masks, we do have some available that were provided by the. Uh, the tw Minnesota Twins. Okay, and we'll in we'll ensure that anyone entering the buildings is wearing a mask to comply with the order put in place by Mayor Fry. Yes, we will. Now, I want to make sure we're clear that anyone who enters the building, we are being very careful not to allow people who are not program participants into the building. As you heard me say a couple of weeks ago, we're not even letting parents of Rec Plus kids in the building. We are doing the curbside. Uh, pick up drop off. And so only the kids who are participating in night out will be allowed in the building. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that we're being very consistent about mask wearing, particularly in indoor spaces. Um, when I'm out in the parks right now, barely anyone is wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And people seem to think that COVID is not a real thing. Um, that is particularly an issue at the beaches. I was at Nokomis yesterday, just before the water emergency occurred. Uh, there was no social distancing happening in the water, on the beach, at Sandcastle, in the parking lots, anywhere. Um, it is a huge issue. I did not see any of our staff out there um, trying to encourage social distancing. That was also very concerning to me. Uh, our spaces are in, at risk of becoming a hotbed for COVID transmission. And we really need to start educating the public that they need to 
they need to be more uh, respectful of each other's health. Um, and then my, my last question is about the on bus activities. Are we going to be providing masks to participants for those activities if they'll be entering the bus space if they do not have them? Um, Commissioner Musich, we will not be providing masks. The, um, the organizing agency will be handling that. Um, we are just providing direct, we're providing the space, the outdoor space, and the recreation activities. Our community partner will be uh, handling the mass part of it. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, followed by Forney. I was happy to see uh, the new lifeguarded spaces um, that we can do, and also appreciative of the innovation with the water orientation. Can't do the swim lessons. I think that it's great that we're still doing some kind of activity to help people with that. I wanted to ask about uh, drinking fountains. Is that anywhere on the dial-up plans? Like, is there any point that we could be able to to open them up, or do you envision them being closed for the rest of the season? I think that is a question for uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrett. Yeah, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Mayer. Um, Drinking fountains at the time, that now, um, we have not addressed them. Um, the, the last uh, public health direction guidance that I recall was that we should not be opening them up unless we can commit to cleaning them very frequently um, because of the proximity of nose and mouth to the bubbler. Um, so we have not opened any uh, drinking fountains external drinking phones. And I can't remember the conversation off the top of my head around at the Rec Plus sites if we left those drinking fountains on or if we left them, they're off. I just got a text from Jeff. So the Rec Plus uh, drinking phones are still off as well. Okay, and so you think it'll be close to this season then? Uh, they'll remain closed until we feel that the, either the guidelines um, from the health department suggest we can meet the cleaning criteria, um, or yeah, that, that's really what we're waiting on. Is if they tell us that you don't need to clean them at the regime they've told us, and we can handle it, then they would turn them on. And it's the it's the proximity to your mouth, not the like hand pushing on the button. That's the issue, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct, yeah. All right, yeah, because I was gonna suggest that maybe we could put up signs to like push the button with your elbow, but if it's the mouth part, that wouldn't work. All right, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Forney, followed by uh, French. Thank you, President Colgill. There's a part of me that just is like, wow, this is so exciting, you know, like we're going back to normal. And I guess that's the thing that terrifies me. Um, I just feel we have a, a really, really huge lift here as far as communicating to the public. <laughs> uh, what's open, what's not, you know, um, what are their liabilities, what are their, you know, uh, social distancing, all of that type of stuff. I just, that, that's, that's, like I said, there's a great deal of excitement hearing about this, but there's a great deal of angst. Um, you know, maybe because I'm the, I'm the <clears throat> vulnerable end of all of this, but uh, my first concern is the staff that we are looking to um, uh, be at these parks. Do we have a liability thing, kind of like what Trump is doing? And, you know, we're not going to hold, we're not going to be held responsible, you know, for COVID, you know, to our, um, lifeguards who may eventually have to do, you know, mouth to mouth, you know, resuscitation. Anyway, they're just all sorts of things that just are terrifying me in this. I, like I said, I'm excited, but I just, well, um, I think it was Superintendent Bangora said earlier on, you know, there is no vaccine except for social distancing. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm really terrified by this, and I'm at the same time so excited. And you know, whether or not we make it a requirement, you know, 
mask, you know, any place. I mean, I, I'm, just because we've got the city has indicated it, I think we need to articulate that as well. That this is a requirement. You have to wear masks. Um, do we have any, you know, um, liability as far as, you know, um, should somebody, you know, um, get COVID, you know, um, uh, as an employee, number one, and number two, you know, as, as a user, you know, do we have any of that? I mean, we have recreational immunity, but, you know, I don't know if anybody can answer this. Uh, yes, uh, Council Rice. Um, uh, uh, just to make sure people can hear me, I, to Commissioner Forney's question, the answer would be potentially. Could um, you please turn on your mic, oh, Council Rice? Sure. Just the oh. there we go. Um, Commissioner Forney on the question about uh, exposure to our employees to COVID 19, the answer would be yes, potentially it could be uh, considered a workers, uh, a, a workplace uh, related injury if the employee could prove that they um, contracted the illness as a result of their employment. Um, I do know a little bit about this area. To date, the number of claims by um, cities and counties has been fairly uh, low. Uh, but again, we're still very early in this process. Um, and uh, But yes, there is a risk there. Well, thank you for that clarification. So I, that's why to me, you know, please, can you couple along with all of this and everything messaging? We need to have some strong messaging about what other people's responsibilities are in this. Um, I, I mean, I'm excited that you are moving forward and we're, we're taking baby steps into it, but I'm still terrified. I just have to share that. Thank you for all you guys are doing. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, Commissioner French. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't know if this question is for um, Superintendent, uh, Assistant Superintendent Cox or Superintendent, this Superintendent Barrett. Permit, uh, when, have we started um, accepting permits for new events or small events in our park yet? We're making a lot of calls about permits. So, um, Commissioner French, I am. I, I think it depends on what we're asking about. Um, and I am not an expert in event kind of permits. That's not my area. So I may ask uh, Deputy Ringo to chime in here. Uh, but for the things that we are accepting permits for in recreation like field usage, if you are doing um, skill development around the sport, no competitive play. Um, we're accepting those kinds of permits and they must be, a your application must be accompanied by a safety plan. Um, but I can't speak uh, with any certainty to event kinds of stuff. So um, Deputy, if you have some comments. Are we accepting permits at all right now or? If somebody wanted to do an event, is, is, the, is the process, is it tedious, is it long, is it the same, or how, how quickly is the turnaround? Because I've got about six or seven calls in the last week about doing events in our parks, and I'm just, I'm not quite sure exactly what's open and what's not open. Or what's available and what's not available. President Cogill, uh, Commissioner French. So yes, um, we are accepting applications for events. Um, in addition to what would be a typical application, there would be questions around um, the preparedness of the event for COVID-19 and we'd have to be within the limits that are established by um, the governor, which I believe right now is at 250. Um, the primary new events that are coming into our system right now, I would say, are um, small weddings. That's probably the area that we've had 
one of the bigger upticks over the last um, several weeks is, is small weddings, not receptions in themselves, but the wedding ceremony. Um, I think earlier there was uh, a note that our rentals for picnic facilities, those types of spaces are filling up, so we're seeing that, that type of scenario. And then we continue to work with our larger events on a rolling schedule. I believe it's at a 60-day schedule right now to see if we'd be able to still um, have their events happen. Thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, will there be another presentation later about uh, the uh, encampment? Because I, yeah. and, uh, Superintendent Barrick, Assistant Superintendent Barrick talked a little bit about the BIFs. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what's the situation with power at, at, at Powderhorn? Because right now they're using generators, and I don't think that's the best, um, I don't think that's the best way we should be generating power in our parks. Um, Commissioner French, we, we do have a discussion item later. If I mean, if Superintendent okay, well, wants I'll, to address I'll, it now, that's fine. I'll table that for later. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Cogill. Just a quick question for Assistant Superintendent Cox. Did you say that there's going to be a staff member that is um, overseeing activity at the splash pads and the um, waiting pool? Uh, Commissioner Muse, uh, I'm sorry, um, Vice President uh, Vitor, yes, the, uh, the current requirements from the governor says that if you're going to operate a pool, you have to have an attendant to help maintain the uh, capacity because we can't operate at full capacity. I believe it's 50% capacity and you have to have someone uh, help maintain social distancing. So at every splash pad, there will be a staff member there. So will this be an adult staff who is like comfortable with telling three and four year olds that, that there's too many of them in a, uh, you know, in the waiting pool or, I mean, like helping them to maintain social distancing. So it's interesting that you asked that question. Uh, when we decided that we could do this and that we would do this, my immediate thought was this would be a wonderful job for a young person to be mm -hmm. able to kind of be out in the sun. There's, you're not need, you don't need to save anybody at a splash pad. It's, you know, so it'd be a great job for a young person. But one of my colleagues reminded me, Tyrese, what's going to happen when that mom shows up with three kids and you t and a 14-year-old tries to tell them that you're at the tower? Don't put a kid in that position. And absolutely. they were absolutely right. And so yeah. what, I, what I'd like to do, um, and this is still in development, pair a, that young person with an adult so that it becomes kind of a, a, a professional development opportunity for the young person, but, but the position has a bit of a teeth or muscle of a more mature professional. Thank you. I, I, that was my concern, that there would be possibly young people out there. And then, you know, in some cultures, speaking back to an adult is disrespecting your elders. And like, I can imagine that, you know, a young person wouldn't want to tell that mom with their three kids that they can't get in the pool because of social distance. So I appreciate that you've already thought about this. And I like the idea of having a young person alongside an adult um, to make sure that folks are safe in these spaces. Thank you. That's it for me, Th President Colgan. Thank you, Vice President. I'm seeing no other hands raised. Thank you, uh, staff, for the update and uh, incredible work uh, right now uh, from, from everybody, especially our, our, you know, the folks that are on the front lines doing this work and adapting to all the changing ways that we're providing services uh, is, is really laudable in such a, a, an unprecedented time. Um, with that, uh, let's uh, we move on here to our one unfinished business uh, item, uh, which is uh, resolution 2022-46. I'll ask for a motion on this resolution, which is a, a resolution approving the one-time reduction to general fund and enterprise fund internal transfers and earn internal loan repayments due to the financial impacts associated with the coronavirus pandemic. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? 
Second. I, the motion is, resolution has been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on the resolution? Uh, maybe we'll start with a, a brief uh, uh, presentation from uh, Director Wiseman. Good evening, President Cogill and commissioners. I'm just going to provide you with a quick financial update. Uh, we now have um, actual to report out through May 31st. So the first update will be with the general fund. Uh, the general fund, if you look at actuals as of 531 on the revenue side, uh, for fees and fines, you can see that we are behind um, what we collected at this time last year by over $1.2 million. Um, our bottom line in the general fund at this point for projections is uh, the same amount that we projected last month as, again, the majority of the summer time savings uh, will start to uh, show up uh, once June and July start getting reported out. If you go to the next slide, uh, we are still showing a $3.3 million deficit for the year. That is within our available fund balance. Um, we do want to have um, a remaining fund balance of around $2.5 million. So we're still looking for about a $1 million worth of savings uh, in the general fund. And we can uh, continue to work uh, through um, some information with the unions and other items that will hopefully uh, change this dial as we continue. The biggest changes uh, are being reflected in the enterprise fund. Uh, you'll see for golf operations uh, for May 31st, we brought in $1.5 million in revenue. That is a, a slight increase over 2019. Uh, we have increased our projected revenues uh, to $4.7 million. We're still being uh, a little bit conservative on the revenue projections uh, just to make sure, you know, uh, weather can shift or if uh, things shifted with COVID, um, but we are, um, we're looking forward to continuing to increase this projected year-end revenue as we, as we get actual experience uh, through the end of June. We're also reflecting um, savings within the golf operation, so that um, um, expenditure savings, and so that is, reducing that amount of loss that we had um, projected last um, during the last update. Percent event permitting, uh, we have some slight expenditure reduction. Uh, concessions is pretty much the same as what we have projected. Uh, we need to get some actual experience um, to come in in June and July so that we can better project what what will happen in the concession area. Parking revenues, we've actually adjusted parking revenues down slightly from um, our previous projections. If you see actuals are down um, by almost $200,000 from this time um, last year. And again, that's due to um, those parking uh, parking lots that receive revenue from uh, downtown businesses and the University of Minnesota, um, as well as some of the lot closure at, at the beginning of the parkway closure um, has impacted the parking revenue uh, to a little bit greater extent than what we originally expected. Um, on the positive side for ICE arenas, they have begun uh, providing social distancing lessons at the ICE arenas. 
and so we have increased our revenue projections for the ice arena. So the bottom line is we are now projecting our operating net loss to be around a million dollars. Um, and then with the capital and debt service um, expenses that we have, uh, our net loss is at a $3 million level. Um, the last time I provided this update, I believe we were still in the $5 million deficit level. So again, this is a pretty big swing. And we now are at a point where we're within the unbalance and um, we'll have a remaining fund balance in the enterprise fund. So that's the end of the financial update, if there's any questions. Thank you, Director Wiseman. We do have a few questions. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, Director Wiseman, the city of Minneapolis is receiving a disbursement from the state of uh, money allocated by Congress for coronavirus-related expenses. Do we anticipate seeing any of those funds dispersed to the park board to help us pay for things like the shutting down of parkways to allow for social distancing, um, additional staff to be able to keep things cleaner, et cetera? President Kogel, Commissioner Musich, uh, we are currently looking at that CARES Act funding and the allocation that if it's passed by the state um, that would be allocated to the city and we are preparing to have that conversation uh, with the city. So um, yes, there potentially could be things like the parkway closures, uh, uh, potentially the ambassadors program, uh, different items like that, that uh, we would be approaching the city um, to try to get, you know, some reimbursement of those expenses. But the money is going directly to the city. Right. So we would have to have city uh, agreement on allocating that money to us. Okay. Thank you. That, that was my question. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. I'm not seeing any other questions. I, I have one question, Director Wiseman. Uh, these the, the projections of our revenue losses. Do you expect um, uh, projections to to shift even more? Um, you know, we were at five million, and um, you know, down to three, one. Um, is there, I, I mean, there's a lot of unknowns, but do you feel like we have a, a stronger understanding of the rest of this year at this point, or is it still completely in flux? Uh, President Colgill and commissioners, I am feeling uh, more confident in the enterprise fund, uh, particularly with golf and the ice arenas and concessions being open, I, I feel like we have um, a really good handle on those revenue sources in the enterprise fund. I still believe in the general fund that we have, um, we have some risk around property tax collection rates, um, especially now uh, with the loss of property that happened uh, during the riot, um, and the other, you know, the other item is really watching the state and what they do uh, with their deficit um, as it is a show, you know, and with our local government aid. So I do feel like the general fund we still have some risk. And that's why I've been trying to increase our reserves in case we get we get hit with um, some other revenue item. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other questions from commissioners, uh, I'll ask the secretary to please. Oh, Commissioner Severson. 
sorry, having a little technical difficulties with my phone here. So I, I just want to I just want to make clear or, or have a question. So we are doing a much better job uh, than we have in the past um, when we're taking in the revenue from call. Correct. Uh, President Kogel and Commissioner Severson, um, right now, um, so right now we are doing better than we have that we than we did last year. We are on track. If nothing happens, we are on track potentially to meet our budgeted revenue estimate this year. And when's the last time we've done that? Um, I would, I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. I, I just, you know, like to let our board know and our staff know that this could be an absolutely integral part of funding our programs in the future. And I believe we should put more resources um, to uh, a golf in the sense that we can turn around and create or generate uh, revenue from it uh, to support programs maybe in the future, such as Rec Plus um, or other programs in our city um, that our kids, you know, specifically need. So uh, I just want to encourage folks in these crazy times to also think about how we can improve golf and, and the situation here in Minneapolis. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Um, any other questions from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-246. Commissioner Bourne. Absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. The resolution carries. Uh, we have a few uh, new business items, a um, couple of discussion items, uh, and I'll just uh, turn it over to Superintendent Bangora. We have a, an update regarding our response to homelessness, people experiencing homelessness in Minneapolis parks. Um, I will note to commissioners as a reminder, there is also a resolution uh, pertaining to that uh, resolution 2020-253 that we'll also have uh, for discussion in a bit. Uh, Superintendent Bangora. All right, thank you, President Cogill and commissioners. So um, I want to give just a brief update at the very beginning here, and then we'll, um, uh, David Hewitt is here again with us, uh, which I am grateful, and he will give a response to, he will talk uh, afterwards. And uh, of course, David Hewitt is the director of Hennepin County's Office of uh, Office to End Homelessness, and he will provide information at the very end, so I will make sure that he has a moment to speak to. So I'd like to provide uh, a quick update um, on the encampment at Power and Park, um, our response and our work with local and state agencies on a solution. Um, I believe deeply uh, that everyone experiencing unsheltered homelessness is uh, vulnerable and deserving uh, of being treated with dignity and respect. Last week, the Midtown Sheridan Hotel uh, evicted around two to 300 people who had been experiencing homelessness and had been staying at the hotel. Thursday night, um, I learned that people who were uh, experiencing homelessness were setting up tents at Potterhorn Park. Um, by Friday morning, there were at least 25 tents that were set up. I, at, you know, obviously I was concerned about the size of the encampment. We typically haven't had that size. We've had maybe seven, five, but 25 happened immediately. And I was concerned about the size of the encampment and the lack of resources in the park and, and that the encampments are not, uh, uh, you know, by all uh, health departments, CDC, the people there are not the best form of shelter. Um, whether one wants to call it dignified or 
whatever the words want to be used, it's, you know, we want shelter, housing, places for people to live. And that's what we hear very clearly about all the people that have been expressing hundreds of emails to be able to solve a solution where people can live in a dignified manner in affordable homes, not tents in a park. And that encampment posed really a serious health risk, health risk and safety risk for those staying in an encampment. And we have many examples that can be referred to that we can talk about uh, what encampments and what they look like um, and what can happen in encampments. I had a notification to be issued to those camps uh, Friday morning, um, hoping um, to work with local and human services agencies to find a solution within 72 hours. And it is my responsibility in the park board's responsibility to implement policies and ordinances and direction that's approved by this board and by the commissioners. Based on the conversation with those agencies and commissioners, by early Friday afternoon, I rescinded the notification once I realized that 72 hours was not gonna be enough time to work with local leaders and local agencies to find the resources to connect people to the housing, shelter, and services they need. And what I clearly found out by talking to the other agencies, there wasn't a lot of options out there for people to go to. At the time when I did that, there wasn't, I did not know fully what was out there, but I was hoping that we could find shelter. David Hubert, David will speak on that. 25 tents that started off with a lot of tents, more than normal. So I realized obviously that was a real concern and we wanted to make sure we weren't displacing anyone and moving them somewhere else until they had shelter and resources and a place to stay. Um, I'm committed to working with the community, local leaders, and the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness on a Solution. Since Friday, the encampment had grown from 25 tents to approximately 180 tents as of this morning. Park staff have provided the following park services to the people at the encampment. We immediately moved two existing portable restrooms near the encampment, having since brought in 11 additional portable restrooms, and tomorrow we'll be bringing in six more portable restrooms. Rental and daily cleaning of these portable restrooms is at a cost of $7,390 per week. Tomorrow we'll also be opening the standalone bathroom building at Potterhorn Park. Today we hooked up uh, a mobile shower trailer and provided a uh, trailer provided by a community group and are providing running water and electricity. We added 30 trash receptacles on site and are working with the city to provide daily trash pickup services. I heard someone say earlier in a comment that the park board is not doing anything. We are doing a tremendous amount. I am in daily dialogue with the city and the county health and human services leaders. As you know, the Minneapolis Park Recreation Board does not have the staff adequately trained to fully serve the needs of the homeless population. We are park and recreation. City, county, and state agencies, as well as nonprofit, nonprofit providers, have staff resources more fully aligned with the needs of that specialized population. Currently, there are 102 known encampments throughout the city. Through the majority are small, there are two locations with more than 50 tents. The Greenway between 12th and 14th and 13th and at 24th Street. On Monday, the Minnesota Interagency Inter Council on Homelessness held a meeting with representatives from multiple city, county, and state agencies. And that's from the state, uh, that's from the governor's uh, office. On Tuesday, the city of Minneapolis Health Department was on site to, to assess the encampment at Potterhorn Park and provide guidance for the health and safety of the occupants. The level of physical care required of encampments and associated facilities is beyond the capacity of park staff. Special circumstances related to COVID-19 suggest that the extraordinary, extraordinary maintenance may be required for some facilities 
the MPRB will rely upon guidance from the City of Minneapolis Health Department to determine cleaning schedules or facilities based on objective public health standards correlated to the encampment population. MPRB staff will provide the level of attention required to maintain uh, facilities in alignment with recommendations from the health department relying on overtime to accomplish after our cleanings. I am David Hewitt, Director of Hennepin County Office to End Homelessness to provide uh, information to the board. After that, we will answer any questions you have and ask that commissioners provide clear direction to staff. And Jeremy, Assistant Superintendent of um, uh, Operations will be also available. We can answer your questions. At this time, um, uh, if uh, David, uh, are you uh, still online and available to uh, step forward? And again, um, David Hewitt is the Director of Hennepin County Office to End Homelessness. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Bangor, and I hope you can hear me. And thank you, President Cowgill, Commissioners, and thank you to the many people who shared comments of, of such compassion and desire to find a better situation for, uh, for our neighbors, um, some of whom I know very well. I don't know if you're still in the building, uh, but Janelle and Alexis and the Freedom from the Streets group. Um, and I also especially wanted to thank, uh, there was one comment that I forget who made it, who really talked about how we need to center any response in respect and kindness, which I couldn't agree with more. Um, I mean, it's widely acknowledged, of course, that before pre-COVID-19, uh, we, our community was facing a housing crisis. And not a housing crisis for everyone, a housing crisis for people on the lowest incomes, uh, with tens of thousands of people for whom safe, affordable housing was really out of reach. Um, and that particularly impacts uh, even over and above poverty levels in our communities of color, in particular African American, Native Americans are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. Uh, to give a sense of kind of the work that goes into it, so I oversee Hennepin County's homeless and housing services. Um, from January to the end of May this year, all of our programs put together moved just over 700 people who were experiencing homelessness into permanent housing. Um, that's a lot of people, but it's barely enough to stand still because you have people becoming homeless every day as well. Uh, so that gives you a sense of kind of the, the scale of effort and the amount of people were able to move um, out of homelessness during this time. Uh, now, of course, we're not operating in normal times, and it's actually three months ago today that Hennepin County declared a state of emergency in regards to COVID-19 and immediately set the path to establish 500 new units, fully staffed, supported around the clock in hotels, people experiencing homelessness who were aged 60 and above or who had the medical conditions that the CDC identified as putting them at most risk from COVID-19. Uh, so those operations have now been in place more than three months. We continue to maintain them, primarily stretching Hennepin County staff, borrowing, begging librarians, healthcare staff, um, getting our provider partners, our nonprofits, pooling staff, pulling together whatever we can to maintain that. Uh, further conversions of shelters followed. Uh, and most recently, following the, the murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest, uh, I and others of the county and the city participated in a state-led effort to evacuate the largest encampments uh, in Minneapolis, the uh, Sabo Bridge, I was at the Stevens encampment, Cedar and 17th, um, and I'll come on to the Greenway perhaps, uh, but all of those folks were offered uh, opportunities to relocate to hotels, area hotels, being managed by non-profit providers, and a little over, I think, 130 people took up that option and moved that day. And those providers are now working getting those people into permanent housing. Uh, what I am describing here is a transformation of the homeless response system that is, is pretty incredible. Uh, this day, three months ago, we had 930-ish shelter beds for single adults. Uh, only 180 of them were 24-7. The vast majority were just in for the night, out in the morning. Um, all of them were congregate, so sharing rooms with 10, 20, 50, 130 other people. That's what it looked like three months ago. Today, uh, with all, all of what I just described, we have about 1,130 shelter rooms. Two thirds of them are individual units in hotels. 100% of them are operating 24 7, providing three meals. That's been this just incredible standing up of, of extra resource. Um, our family system, 
those who don't know, Hennepin County is the only county in Minnesota and one of only a handful of the country that has a right to shelter for families and children where we guarantee it. We have maintained that throughout this period. We have a lot of capacity in our family shelter system for any families with children um, available as needed. Uh, these efforts have, have paid off in some regards. With regard to COVID-19, so we actually did mass testing of people serving people. Um, our largest family shelter this week, we also did mass testing at one of the hotels. And we came back with zero families COVID positive, zero individuals, zero staff. Uh, in total, statewide up to the end of last week, MDH reported 114 individuals with home, experiencing homelessness who had tested positive. And that level has stayed flat. Not only have we not seen a spike, but it's actually tapered off. Uh, we have stood up an additional, what I just described, 100 hotel rooms for families and individuals who are COVID positive. And right now we have a lot of capacity in that because the number of cases has simply been dropping away. So that's kind of some good news, but there's bad news and it feeds into kind of the situation we're in now, uh, which is why I thought it was important to set up this conference. Setting up those efforts has seen uh, staff working double, triple shifts, sleeping in the hotels they're working in, like I mentioned already, begging, borrowing, stealing, staff from other Hennepin County departments, non-profits, stretching as far as they can, and often hitting breaking points. Um, on May the 13th, Hennepin County and the City of Minneapolis formally communicated to the State Emergency Operations Center that we had no further capacity to stand up additional sites. So I want to give you that sense of where we are. Uh, because what that really means is we have never been less equipped to respond to and support a large encampment as we are right now. Um, we do have health care for the homeless staff. The Hennepin County team uh, are visiting the Powderhorn Park. They can do COVID testing. They can provide other health supports. Uh, but they were already stretched incredibly thin, serving more people in more places than ever before. We do have contracted outreach providers uh, who are already in contact with Powder Home Park, who will try and make connections to openings in housing programs that we have. Um, but again, they have never been stretched more thin either. So, so I want to call that out because I don't want people to be under any illusion as to where we are. I compare it to the Lake Hiawatha, uh, the Hiawatha Franklin encampment of a couple of years ago, and we are at a comparable size now. In fact, uh, my understanding of Powderhorn is we essentially have two encampments, one in the region of 100 tents, the other in the region of 80 tents. Um, collectively combined, that's actually a little bit larger than the Hiawatha Franklin encampment was at any given point. Uh, but at the Hiawatha Franklin, we were able to, we didn't have all of these other crises and pressures pulling our staff so thin already. Um, so I want to highlight that. Uh, of course, we also weren't in a COVID pandemic environment. So that said, I want to call out the incredible intentions and compassion of the supporters and uh, the neighborhood members who have spoken today and spoken about you know, their efforts and want to support this, this effort. Um, I feel that I have to share that, especially in a pandemic environment, having so many people in such close proximity really heightens the concerns that I would have anyway uh, with regards to large encampments. Um, we did see with Hiawatha Franklin that it became increasingly dangerous over time. Um, certainly I was here before the board and spoke then. So I, I have concerns about the trajectory that we're heading on with that many people uh, in such close proximity. There is sense of a disease control guidance around encampments during COVID-19, uh, which outlines kind of 12 foot spacing for tents, uh, and other such measures, I think that's going to be incredibly hard to maintain. And of course, all of us are trying to restrict the number of interactions we have and follow social distancing guidelines. These things that have actually been very effective so far at keeping people experiencing homelessness, one of the rest of us safe from COVID-19, I have extremely elevated concerns about how effectively that's going to be managed with so many people in that space. Um, so. I mean, obviously, I absolutely believe in centering on the dignity of people, going back to that comment about kindness and respect. Um, and I absolutely believe that every single person deserves to be in safe, affordable, dignified housing. That's what we need to be working towards every single day. Uh, but I do just want to, I, I would be remiss if I didn't share uh, that I, I have concerns as to, as to what lays ahead in this space with so many people involved. Um, I think those are the main kind of points that I wanted to share out the gates, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions or uh, contribute to the discussion in any way I can be helpful. Thank you, uh, David. Thank, Thank you, you, Superintendent, uh, for that overview. Uh, commissioners, do you have questions or comments? Commissioner Severson? 
Thank you, President Cogill. Uh, thanks, David, for coming out and, and um, sharing, us, uh, sharing with us your expertise and knowledge. I have a few questions for you. Um, how many people in the city of Minneapolis are homeless? So there are a number of ways of counting it, but I'm going to use the one that is most commonly used across the country uh, that we report to the federal government, which is the point in time count. It's conducted every January. Um, our January count this year for 2020 was, I believe, 3,045. Uh, so that's a one-night snapshot. Um, there are imperfections to it, but it is a consistent methodology that's used every year, so it allows us to at least track over time. Uh, within that number, the number that we're experiencing unsheltered homelessness, uh, so staying in a place not fit for human habitation, encampment on like transit, uh, was 645, which is an increase of about 6% on last year, which was a little over 600. But this is the area where we've really seen a dramatic increase in homelessness in recent years, uh, a doubling over the space of two years to get up to that 600 number. And it's really driven by uh, single adult homelessness, uh, people aged 25 plus. We've actually seen at the same time a decreasing number of families experiencing homelessness, and in fact, up since the heights of 2014, down about 40%. So a very significant decrease in that area. Uh, but we have seen this extremely alarming trend of increasing unsheltered homelessness among single adults that's uh, driven the growth encampments that really put people at extremely high risk. Did I hear you say that we can house, there is space to house these, these individuals and families? So, well, let me separate out uh, families. Families with children, uh, there is a right to shelter policy in Hennepin, so as referencing, um, which means that we guarantee an offer of shelter. Uh, shelter is not housing, and I want to keep the two things separate. Frankly, we don't want anybody to be in shelter. We want everybody to be in housing. That should always be the goal. Uh, but we, we have a lot of capacity in our family shelter system right now for families and children. Um, within housing, there are openings. There are, I know of openings in Hamlet programs right now. Um, they have nuances to them. Um, and there are, So there's eligibility for some where housing is specifically for people with disabilities, it's specifically for people, um, uh, for veterans, say, or other things like that. And then there's, of course, this client choice. Uh, what is the best option for people? Uh, like I say, in, across all of our kind of programs, uh, we've housed, it was a little over 700 people from beginning of January to end of May. Um, and we will continue to fill housing openings with people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, but what I certainly don't want to say is, you know, when you're talking about 180 tents, potentially 250 people, that's an awful lot of people. We do not have housing available for that kind of number of people. Uh, the only way we can really approach uh, a challenge of that magnitude is really to go individual by individual and who can we get in and where and then the next person and then where and then the next person and then where and it will, and it will take time. Okay. Who is responsible to address the homelessness issue that we're dealing with? The state, the county, the city, park board, the school board? And your um, a pro a professional opinion, whose responsibility is that? Uh, well, I can give my, my personal answer is all of us. Um, the, the technical answer is we, we have a blend of responsibilities. Um, you know, at the county, we have set out very clearly strategies around our role in shelter. We're the primary funder of shelter until this recent crisis. We did not operate any shelter. We are now operating uh, more than 350 units of shelter. Um, but we have not been an operator. We've been the primary financial supporter. But even then, um, it's a partnership with the private sector, with the business sector, and with our nonprofit partners. And it's really a blend uh, to bring resources to the community that can benefit them. Uh, and, and that's kind of true across this network of uh, getting housing online. We as the county feel we have a role to play. We've set out a strategy we think is appropriate for us, given our human services role, which is to focus dollars on developing housing for people with the highest vulnerabilities that are clients of our other human service areas. So people who are in that lowest income bracket uh, and who are chronically homeless, who are medically vulnerable. Uh, but for us, you know, what we're looking at for the next 10 years is to build a thousand units focused in on those, those people with severe addiction disorders. Uh, but obviously the housing market as a whole is much larger than that. For sure, 
city, the state have key roles to play in developing a housing market that can serve our community as a whole and those poorest, you know, the people with the lowest incomes who the private market is leaving behind. Has, has the park board, school board, city, county, have, have they all received money to deal with homelessness specifically? So that Hennepin County, we leverage primarily our funding comes from state and federal sources. So we pull down, we spend about uh, $130 million a year in Hennepin County on housing homelessness, uh, more than 100 million of which is federal and state resources. Um, that supports, and that's I'm describing kind of pre-COVID time, that was to provide shelter to 9,000 people a year to help about 7,500 people with short-term assistance to avoid homelessness or get out of homelessness and to provide supportive housing for about another 15,000 individuals. Um, those are big numbers, but what is clear and what we see in our community is that the need is that much greater. Okay, last question, how can you help the park board? So, you know, we're in close contact with Superintendent Bangora. Like I say, we're going to leverage the services that we have, recognizing the limitations this time. So Healthcare for the Homeless from Hennepin County, uh, we're looking at our homeless access team, and then our contracted providers, including our shelters, but also outreach teams. What can we bring? But I'm, uh, I want to be very upfront that we have never been under this much strain from this many directions before. So it's going to be, it's going to be really tough. All right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, President Colgo. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, our, our next commissioner with her hand raised, uh, Commissioner Musich, followed by French. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, I appreciate the overview. Superintendent Bangoro, what assistance have the state, city, and county committed to addressing relocating into appropriate housing individuals currently located in the encampments at Powderhorn Park at this point. President Colgill, Commissioner Musich, um, what I can say is that um, I'm working with the interagency uh, group uh, that has been uh, put together where there's been, um, and David is a part of that, of course, um, Eric Rumdahl with the state, um, the, um, we're looking at the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Department, everybody is working on this and, and putting together a plan or proposal on how to assist and help in this. Right now, um, we've had uh, Noya from the Health Department has done assessments. She's going out there and doing by name where they identify, and we said earlier, identify each person and what, they, um, what resources they need or what help that they need. So we have to first know who's in this large encampment so we're doing that assessment. Um, there is the city and the county, um, uh, you know, the mayor, David, his, his, his group, and, and the park board are working right now to really look for how we can get assistance and help from the state. And we're working together with, of course, Eric. At this point, we haven't received any funding or any type of resources. Um, we've received some work and resourcing around um, assessment and people, boots on the ground, and really being present and, and, and helping us from the um, testing around, like say COVID or health concerns. Um, but we, we're, still, we're still trying to get to the point to where we know uh, people need housing, they need a place to stay. Park Board is not that, we, we are not that, that agency. So I'm working with my partners, um, since Friday, all weekend, every day, trying to come up with strategies and solutions to move forward and to find permanent shelter or a place for um, the unsheltered folks that are right now at Potterhorn to, um, to be able to get and to have those resources. So uh, long story short, um, Park Board has done all the work right now um, to accommodate to make sure that people are at least have humane conditions as much as we can provide. Um, and we're hoping in the next week or so here as we put together a, put together a plan, uh, we'll be able to respond accordingly and to see how we can get um, people um, the resources they need. So that's the best answer I give at this point. I'm working with this group because again, we're park and recreation. 
I'm depending heavily on the city, the county, uh, street, re um, I'm sorry, uh, St. Stephen's, um, all of our partners to help us to get to that point. The city, the health department, we're all working on it. Uh, this has exploded very quickly and it is unusual. Um, so we're working on it. But I have not, but again, right now, I've not received funding uh, or yet a place that we can a plan to uh, get people into a better situation. Okay, so I would really like to see from the state, county, and city, all government agencies that have public health and homelessness departments that focus on this issue specifically and have staff dedicated to this work, committed formally to working on a work group with the park board to address this issue. Um, up to this point, every elected official I've talked to at all levels of government have basically done this to me. We're kind of, we're, we're at our limit, we can't do anything. Um, we would never say that if a tornado tore through our city and displaced people and left them homeless. We would never say that. And right now, that is what these people are living in. <laughs> They're living in a situation where they are experiencing that kind of crisis, and government has said, eh, we don't have the resources to help you. And that is totally unacceptable. So I would like to see our fellow government agencies that do have the experience and do have the staff capabilities to support us in addressing this issue step up and do so. Um, it's been incredibly frustrating for me to, to see that sort of nonchalant, this is your problem, deal with it kind of response. It's totally uh, unacceptable. Can um, I just say, and sorry to interrupt, but it, um, yes, I, I agree. Um, that has been the work that I've been doing now. Um, trying, I've been in my role, pulling together everybody that I can. I've spoken to the mayor, Senator Hayden, City Council on Cano, uh, Margaret King from the state of Minnesota, Kristen Devine from the state of Minnesota, Andrea Simonet from the state of Minnesota, uh, Katie Topenka from Minneapolis, Donald Ryan, who is on a call from Hennepin County, Polite Foundation, uh, the St. Stephen's group, we're all meeting, we're all getting together. So I want to assure you that I have done everything I can. Uh, Eric uh, Grumdell from the state of Minnesota, who's the head of the um, inter um, interagency group, we're all together. Um, I talked to Peter Edmund today. Again, we're working to uh, get a plan and a proposal put forward. So I'm clear and I appreciate, about I appreciate so that I they're talking to you. Yeah. Um, but I my main concern is that no one is publicly committing to dedicating right. resources specifically to work with us on this. Yeah, They'll call into a conference call, but they will not publicly commit. And I think that is what we need at this point is public Correct. commitment. I'm um, working on it. That, that allows for people with the expertise and resources um, mm -hmm. to do so, helping us to find housing solutions that don't deprive stressed out and overtaxed Minneapolis residents, green spaces to recharge in. Yeah. Uh, people have been, you know, really, really pushed as part of the coronavirus response. It, everyone is a little bit at the end of their rope at this point, as, as I think we can see by the number of people out in public, not social distancing anymore. And people have told me that the, the one of the few things that helps them stay sane is city parks and knowing that there's this place that they could go and they can be safe. And clearly that's what encampment residents have felt as well, and that is why they're in the parks now. Um, but we need to help them live in a place that is humane and permanent shelter. A tent is not humane shelter. It is not permanent shelter. Uh, today it was 98 degrees. Uh, that's insane in a tent. It's not, it, it is a huge public health risk for the people living in this space. So I'm hopeful that people will step up and assist us in doing this work that we have no idea how to do. Um, and, I, and I would ask that we stay um, updated on a regular basis as part of your other safety updates that you're giving to commissioners and the public on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Musich. Oh, sorry. Um, I am working um, tirelessly. I do appreciate um, David Hewitt, you know, or David being here today, but we're working tirelessly on this, and uh, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, 
Commissioner French, followed by Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, I kind of want to mirror what uh, Commissioner uh, Mishich was saying. We, we are we are definitely in an emergency right here. We have hundreds of people who don't have housing. Uh, the park board is this is not in our wheelhouse. Uh, what happened was there's there are a number of people that was that were displaced uh, during the uprising and during COVID, and uh, the results of that was that they need a, a safe place to be and our parks became that safe place. And 15 people set up, 15 tents were set up at Powder One Park. Uh, people in the community didn't think that was okay. And so we decided that, you know, we would allow those 15 people uh, to stay. And what happened was it ballooned. Uh, it ballooned into something, and I wanna say it's not 180 tents, there's about 160, I'm out there every day. I'm out there every night. Uh, I'm out there every night. It's about four o'clock in the morning. So I know what's going on out there. I know uh, what the situation is. I'm on, I'm, I'm out there. Uh, there is a whole lot of people who are having the worst time of their life right now, and they're having the worst time in their life at the same time where the country uh, is going through a pandemic. The world is going through a pandemic, and we had an uprising, and they don't have places to stay. And the park board, like like Commissioner Mishu said, we that's not our that's not our job. Our job is to create a respite for people in Minneapolis. And uh, the folks who are standing at the encampment right now, to them this is a respite. But we need to call to bear uh, all the different agencies who who traditionally handle problems like this. We need the county to come to bear. We need to we need the governor to step in. And it's just it's just not uh, uh, powder horn. It's the commons downtown, and it's Farview, and it's other places where encampments are set up at. And I think the worst encampment that may be going right now, uh, it may be the Greenway, which we have no control of. And these are these are these are spaces in our city that we don't have uh, jurisdiction. In. We do have jurisdiction on Powder Park, Park. And, and as long as we do, and as long as that's a place that's our responsibility, I want to make sure that the people that are resting right there right now have what they need. And if that means. Uh, having electricity to charge their phone so they can go to, you know, do job interviews or check their emails and stuff like that. That's important. So uh, what's important is that they have uh, places to go use the bathroom so they're not defecating in neighbors' neighbors' yards and stuff. That Those are the things that we can do. But uh, Mr. Hewitt, I, I would, uh, I would uh, really urge you to go back to your, your, your organization and to all the other organizations that you work with and say, this is a crisis. And just like any crisis, we shouldn't be sitting here trying to figure out who's going to pay for what. Let's just get it done, and we'll figure it out later. Right now, there are about 150, 200 people living outside in our parks. Uh, it, it wasn't a problem caused by the park board, but just like any neighbor, we have stepped up uh, to make sure those folks are taken care of and treated humanely. And neighborhood, the neighborhood, the neighborhood, the neighbors have stepped up and made sure these people are treated treated humanely. And if we're asking neighbors to do stuff, we definitely have to ask our, our, our different government agencies to step up and help solve this issue that's been on the plate for years. This is not a new issue. It's not a new issue. And this is not about finding temporary housing for folks. We need to find long-term strategies for people who don't have housing. That means we need to start building a large amounts of, of real affordable housing. Not, not what we call affordable housing, real affordable housing where people can stay and live and, and have a family. And so this is a problem that was thrusted on us that we, as park board commissioners, shouldn't have to go through. Uh, the people who live in our parks shouldn't have to go through it. So uh, I, I, would urge, I would urge you, Mr. Hewitt, to go back to your, uh, to your colleagues and say, hey, we need help. The park board is not designed for this, and we got to get every resources we, we need to, to bear on this, on this issue right now. Uh, thank you, Vice President Kogo. I uh, appreciate you for letting me talk. Thank, thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. First, I wanted to just thank the superintendent and staff for opening the bathroom today and uh, setting up the electricity access. So that is something, a, a big thing that people asked for, and I'm glad that we finally got that. Um, you know, you wanted clear direction, and I think you'll get that in the resolution that was added to the agenda. Um, but and I, I think people know where I stand, but just to reiterate it, um, I feel that you know, I'm unwilling to evict somebody 
unless I can tell them where they should go. And if we don't have safe places for them to go, then I think um, you know, we need to allow um, people to be there because, of, you know, um, obviously we all want long-term housing solutions, but in the meantime, you know, tents are better than being on a park bench or on the sidewalk. Um, I also just wanted to ask about uh, the interagency council on homelessness. Do we have representation on that, Superintendent Bangor? Have you been participating in those meetings? Like, can you update us on what happened on Monday? President Covio, Commissioner uh, Meyer, yes, I'm, I'm on it now. I uh, was on it previously, but I'm on it now. Um, so I've just been part of this group um, over the last several days. And as I stated before, um, we are working towards um, a long-term solution, um, but we have an immediacy right now. So what we know is that um, with this group, we're, we're trying to find um, some help here through the state and through all of the different um, agencies um, throughout, uh, whether it's, you know, MnDOT, Med Council, you know, city, county, park board, all of us. What we realize is I think what this group and what we've been meeting about is that what happens is these things happen and there could be a tent encampment that occurs on a city property. City then deals with it and they try to resolve it and then something might happen to Mindai property then, then you deal with it and now it's in a park park property but the park park property has exploded to a size that just is you know obviously unique at this point. So we're really trying to now really bring together these organizations and agencies so that we can start to really find a long-term solution and find ways that we can help because whatever wasn't hasn't been solved or the issue on homelessness it was concerns we're trying to now find a uh, a solution a better solution here now and so yes um, i'm meeting with them um we're just really in the beginning process of this uh, we have a lot of work to do um, we know that there's an urgency to find people uh, shelter of course um so I'm working with our partners. Um, I don't have a plan laid out yet because that's in partnership with the group that I'm working with, David being a part of that. But we are coming close. We will have something to come forward hopefully soon. Um, but it, uh, right now I don't have anything where I can say, this is where people can go and have shelter because that's not my wheelhouse. That's not where I'm just trying to work to find a solution as interagencies and my responsibility as superintendent to find some uh, support and resolution and, and resources. Yep. So. Yep. I, yep, I understand that completely. And, and I think in the meantime, until our partners step up with those long-term solutions, we have to be the short-term solution. Uh, thank you, that's all for me. Yeah, thank and thank you, Commissioner Meyer. And I think that I wanna also just make sure when I said earlier in my report, and I could say at the end, but I wanna say how proud I am of the people and the staff that have responded from the park board, our people. I thank them, I'm grateful for them. They're clean bathrooms, um, they're picking up trash, they're responding, we are. So thank you to our organization and what they've been doing, I'm really grateful. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um... Uh, Vice President Vita, followed by Commissioner Severson for the second time. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I too want to thank the staff and the superintendent and our partners. Thank you, David, for uh, you know that wonderful presentation of what's going on um, you gave tonight. And thank you, Superintendent and the staff for doing all the work you're doing. Commissioner French, who is like there every day, committed, dedicated. Uh, working things out with um, this group. I've been over there a few times, and I, I mean, it's it, people seem to, you know, feel safe. Um, I, I do have some concerns, and my concerns are just mostly based around that space outgrowing very quickly. Uh, there, there was, um, I was speaking to a group yesterday that was like pretty close to the playground. Um, on, I, I, I'm really bad at direction, so I don't know which side I was on, but there's like uh, two sides and one side is, I think it's like the 10th Avenue side. There's a, a group that is growing closer and closer to the playground. 
So I, I am concerned about it being a neighborhood park. And um, I've spoke to Commissioner uh, Commissioner Meyer and President Cogill about like us thinking about other spaces within our system that may be suitable for something like this as a temporary use and not a uh, Powderhorn Park, which is like dead smack in the center of the neighborhood. I know that the neighbors are, you know, we got lots of calls from folks who are very supportive, but I also got calls from people who were not as supportive and are concerned about um, their children exposure to things happening in, uh, in the park. And they're not willing to, you know, keep their kids in the house. They want their kids to be using the neighborhood park. So I think, I mean, we really have to look at uh, the location. We really have to think about the growth of this, I mean, it, it, it feels good now, but tomorrow that number can be doubled and we have no way of controlling that. And I, I for one, don't want to go in and remove people, but if there's a, a temporary place, you know, that is better suited, uh, Boom Island comes to mind, you know, like if there's a temporary place that we can use um, that's better suited for this situation that we're dealing with right now, I, I think we should look at those things. Um, also, you know, I this is my first experience around housing, homelessness. Uh, so I, I would encourage commissioners especially to go over and talk to the people who have these experiences directly. What I found was the things that were being presented to me for over, by, on behalf of the overall group was not necessarily what I heard when I got there and started talking to the people who are actually living in the tent and who have, um, you know, spent time being homeless. So I, I would encourage commissioners to go over there and check in with staff. I mean, check in with, um, with folks living in, in the sanctuary. And then lastly, I just want to say, you know, we're, we're having these conversations about policing and rather you know, park police are beneficial or not. And yesterday when I pulled up to the sanctuary, the first thing I saw was a young kid overdosing out next to the bike rack. I, it just so happened that I was on the phone with the chief, but we had to call, I had to hang up with him to call 911 and my husband and another person, you know, were trying to resuscitate this person. He was pulled off he, he, you know, he was put on the stretcher and took off in the ambulance, but it was scary. It was very, very scary to witness that and I, and to have to like take action right away. Like I felt good about it, but I, but I also felt good that we were able to call 911 and somebody was able to come there and take care of the situation and it wasn't up to me to do it. So. I just wanted to share that story because it it was just so odd that it just happened to me when I pulled up and I and I really felt like wow I'm I'm glad I'm a person with the tools to you know to know to call 911 and to feel safe with handling this situation um, as it is that that's it for me. Thank you, Vice President, uh, Commissioner Severson, uh, followed by Hassan. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, uh, Mr. Hewitt, do you think the park board should be the responsible government unit to deal with this? I, I think it clearly falls on all of us to respond to this. Certainly, the county has a role in providing health care for the homeless, contracted outreach providers, trying to kind of connect folks to the housing programs that we have responsibility for. Um, I, the question was made about a formal commitment earlier on. Uh, we will absolutely commit those resources uh, to the extent that we can, having you know already uh, already shared how stretched they are. Uh, but we recognise this is a crisis. It's uh, you know one in a series, but um, so we certainly see ourselves having a role there. I mean, I, I do not think it is the Parks Board's responsibility to solve for this. Certainly not in isolation. I think um, Superintendent. Bangor has described the incredible work that his staff and his team have done to try and uh, support folks in this situation, as have the neighbors, and there's an incredible humanity in that. Uh, but it's absolutely falls on us as a county to step forward with the resources that we have and the others that Superintendent Bangor has already referenced that have been pulled in, uh, including the state and the city, to, to 
you know, bring resources to the table uh, in this crisis response. So um, I absolutely believe that. I, I would like to, if I may, um, also just comment on um, the previous comments and, and the description of that story with the, the overdose. And I mean, again, this is, you know, people stepping forward and doing incredible things and potentially saving lives. And that's what we've just heard described. Um, I do want to be clear that when I talk about some of the dangers presented by large encampments, uh, of course, those are heightened by COVID-19, and I have acute concerns around that in and of itself. Um, but that, what that scene that was described there um, was commonplace during the, the Hiawatha Franklin encampments, and we did have several fatalities. And um, we also had other incidents uh, that were unrelated to that specific issue and challenge, people wrestling with suicide addiction disorder. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we had a fire that could have caused far more damage, was, was incredibly scary. Um, there, there are so many heights and risks when we have this many people in close proximity. Um, but, but yeah, I, that just really brought that back to me, uh, that, that comment. So I, the steps taken, incredible. And I know that there will be people there saving lives daily, which is incredible. Um, but I, I do just want to emphasize these are, these are um, challenges and risks that really multiply what the more people that you have um, in an encampment is, is what we've seen from other large encampments in the past. Uh, but yeah, to the original question, it's certainly all of our responsibility. We certainly all need to bring resources to the table and, and lift the burden on, on the park staff. Okay. Uh, uh, Superintendent Bangor, ju I just want to be clear. I think I know the answer, but I want it on record. We have not received any funds to deal with homelessness issues within our city, correct? Uh, President Kogel, Commissioner um, uh, Severson, the Park Board has not received any money to uh, deal with this issue currently, no. And, and we don't have anyone on our staff that's an expert in this either. Commissioner Severson, no, we do not. Um, okay, uh, I think that will wrap up my questions. Thank you, President Kogel. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, Commissioner Hassan. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, uh, it has been a very challenging couple of days, week. I uh, first want to thank uh, our superintendent, all and our staff. Uh, we have never dealt uh, this uh, amount of homelessness in our park system, and I know it's an issue that affects our city and uh, our state. In our county, uh, I had a meeting with uh, with the state and uh, along with our superintendent this morning uh, and uh, Councilmember Landra Cano. I have been on the ground uh, last seven days from the first day that I found uh, uh, Powder Home, which is in my district. Uh, I was uh, it wasn't easy uh, to deal with it, but still uh, I appreciate the support that uh, that our staff are given to us and to uh, our new residents that are staying. And I understand that we have a uh, responsibility uh, to connect this residents uh, with access to uh, housing. Uh, but most importantly, I, I, I also want to put out there that I've received a text message from one of our, our large commissioners, uh, one of our large commissioners telling me, what's your plan for, you, for your uh, district since you're, the, since you're the district commissioner? And I want to put out there that this is not a district issue. You know, it's not a uh, one a particular uh, park that has been affected. It has been affected across the city, and it will be, it, and it will affect. It's in the Commons uh, Park, in uh, it's in across the city, PV Park, Powderhorn, uh, as the superintendent mentioned earlier, and they'll be they'll be bumping up, you know, more as we continue in a. But I, 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 uh, I'm urging uh, my fellow commissioners, uh, this is not a commissioner, uh, district commissioner's issue. It's a, a citywide issue. I, I don't want to put out there who, uh, that large commission that text me that message, uh, that text message. But hey, I'm working on, you know, like this, is, this is an issue that's affecting, as I said, in the beginning. And I'm really working. We're doing everything that we can. And I... Uh, I have been out there, you know, every morning, checking out every night. Uh, we, I've received some complaints in the neighbors that one of the apartments has been broken. Uh, people are doing uh, stuff in their backyard, people's backyards. But 
this issue you know existed even before the homeless came into our parks and it's not time to complain about what what's happened it's time that we reach out and seek support from our partners and uh, and and our superintendent Al has been doing that I, I trusted the work he has been updating me every single day me and him were talking back and forth and uh, I want to thank uh, superintendent uh, I would also want to thank commissioner uh, uh, Landa, who was out there with me the last couple of days. Uh, and also I saw the other day Commissioner Vita. But this work is not a district issue. You know, this is the work that we have to work with the rest of the commissioners and uh, our partners. And uh, I'm not gonna, I also received your know, calls, you know, from elected officials that say, it's in your district, kick them out. I am not, you know, I'm not kicking them out. And uh, our neighbor, the neighbors have been very nice to the people who stay in there. But I do understand that uh, that there has to be uh, a, a dignified solution for our, dignified, our neighbors that came into our park. And uh, I, I, I understand it's not, uh, I mean, when I was on the phone with the uh, council of and uh, Superintendent Al, uh, questions came up, you know, there has to be a date, give them a date for them to leave the park. I think that determines the rest of the commissioners, you know, and and I'm not willing to kick people out, you know, until we have a, uh, a dignified solution. Thank, thank you, and, Commissioner. Uh, I want to conclude that. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Uh, Commissioner French for the second time, followed by Vice President Vita for the second time. I want to uh, encourage us not to be discouraged by uh, uh, incidents of overdosing. Obviously, the people that are uh, dealing with homelessness have a myriad of issues that they're that they're that they're dealing with, and one of them is substance abuse issues, and another one is mental health or mental health issues. I'm pretty sure the overdose that that took place. Uh, one of the commissioners were there. I'm pretty sure that wasn't the over, only overdose that happened in our city or even in our parks that day. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we get, uh, I, I routinely get uh, emails about someone overdosing in our parks or a body found because they OD'd or something. This is not a problem uh, that is unique to the park board or unique to encampments. This is a problem that, this is an issue that America has, an addiction issue. and and. These, all these problems, all these issues are so far out of the wheelhouse of, of our parks and recreation board. Uh, and it seems like we have been left to deal with it. I, I, there, there are gonna be problems. There, that probably won't be the only overdose at, at, at the camp. It will probably be more there. But uh, what, what we need to do is stop being inhumane to folks. Like, like no, there's no one else, there's nowhere else to go. And so we use, we use uh, things like they overdose or somebody stole something to demonize a certain group of people. And when, it's, when we start demonizing a certain group of people, it's easy to do things like remove them from parks. They're drug addicts. They shouldn't be in our parks. Uh, they got mental health issues. They should be in our parks around kids. You know, the same issues that those folks in the parks are dealing with are some of the same issues that people around parks are, are, or live in those houses are dealing with. They're dealing with drug abuse. They're dealing with mental health issues. So let's not be selective of certain populations that we don't like. When it, when it comes to uh, certain everyday social issues that, that people are dealing with. I want us to be a little bit more empathetic to folks who are having a hard time in life right now. Thank you, President Kogan. Thank, thank you, Commissioner French, Vice President Vita, for the second time. Thank you. Um, just to clear up a couple things, I'm not sure about Commissioner French's experience, but for me, I've never walked in a neighborhood park and seen someone overdosing. So it was a very different experience for me. It's not to dehumanize anyone or anything is to talk about what was real for me. And um, just, you know, Commissioner Hassan said he didn't want to say who the commissioner was that uh, text him. That would be me, uh, at-large commissioner Latricia Vita. I text him because I feel like a, a large part of my job is to support the district commissioner in the decision making. Um, I would expect the, uh, the district commissioner to be on the ground, you know, dealing with the issue, if not as much as me, more than I do. So uh, that text message three days ago 
was meant for me to get a response to know like how to move forward with how I was talking to staff and talking to outside partners, including uh, city council member Alon Dracano, the mayor's office, on what our next steps are collectively as a, a group of agencies that's trying to work on something. And um, just lastly, you know, it is it makes it makes the job easier if a person just tells you their position on something. Then you know how to move forward as a district commissioner. When I'm over there, people are asking me questions, a lot of questions, and as to not step on the district commissioner's toes, it would be great to have, you know, uh, at least a position on where the person who is leading the decision making uh, in our parks, at, you know, to have a statement to share with folks who are over there. So, um, Commissioner Hassan, I, I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that this is a citywide problem. It, it definitely is, and it's not a park board problem. But as leaders, especially as a leader who is trying to move on to a larger body of government, I would appreciate a really good uh, conversation with you around issues and for you to take a position one way or the other so I can share it with your constituents. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President Vita. Um, I appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, thank you to the superintendent. Thank you for uh, Hennepin County uh, to being here this evening. Um, it is very clear that this uh, requires some um, state funding. It also is very clear that we, uh, as commissioners, uh, need to do all we can to advocate with our partners at other local levels of government to get uh, commitments of staffing and uh, funding as well. Um, Mr. President, I had my, uh, my hand raised. I, thank you, Commissioner Hassan. If you'd let me finish, I will call on you. Um, okay. And I uh, just want to say that the, the actions that have been taken so far, I think uh, we're, we're on a good path uh, to maintaining the dignity of folks that are in uh, the Powderhorn space. Uh, what we are not yet on a good path of is finding the solutions that are that are getting people out of the public space and into uh, dignified housing. Um, and we, we have a good amount of work ahead of us, but I'm, I'm confident with the uh, organizing that has happened that we are on a good path uh, towards uh, getting that to happen. Uh, with that, I'll uh, call on Commissioner Hassan for the second time. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for allowing me for the second time to speak. I, I, I want to point out that, uh, Commissioner Vitt, I'm glad that you mentioned that out, but I, I work with the superintendent, and so do you, and we both have a communication, and I was on the ground every single day from the day that this issue came up, and I was dealing with this issue before, and for you to say, you know, the district commissioner, for you to communicate, uh, nope, I disagree with you because you are the vice president of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. I haven't seen you making any statement where you stand. I did. I did make announcements on Facebook. I was updating to my constituents. I was responding. I was answering their calls. And every time uh, uh, my constituent calls, you have never answered their call. And for you to say I'm not doing my job, I disagree with you, and I I'm doing everything I can to communicate with my constituents and work with the superintendent. I was on the phone with him every single day. Every single, I just, today we had a meeting, you were not there. You're the vice president of the park, but you should be able to attend those meetings and find out on your own. If you want me to help you out, I'm sorry I can't. I'm done. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Um... I'm seeing no other hands. I appreciate everybody's comments. Thank you again, uh, Superintendent. Thank you um, uh, to, to the county as well uh, for being here. Uh, we'll move on now uh, to our next discussion item, which is an update on the B.F. Nelson Pioneer, uh, Park Pioneer statue. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Commissioner Meyer, did you have a comment to the discussion item? I do, and I don't know if Assistant Superintendent Schroeder was planning on presenting. I mean, I asked this, for this to be on the agenda. Um, is Assistant Superintendent Schroeder even here? Um, I am. Uh, 
uh, President Kogo and Commissioner Meyer, I am here. Okay, well, why don't you just give a little bit of background and then I'll jump in after you. In, in fact, that's what I'll do and I'll keep this um, quite brief because I'm not sure that all commissioners will have the same understanding of this, uh, of what we're talking about. This is a, uh, a, a substantial sculpture that was moved uh, into um, uh, BF Nelson Park in 2010. Um, this is a statue that's moved around different places in the city since it was first commissioned in 1936. It's, it's significant. The sculpture portion weighs 14 tons with the base it's over 500 tons. It was originally in downtown Minneapolis. It was uh, a, a portrays the pioneer family on the top, and there's a, a frieze panel that depicts Father Hennepin exchanging peace pipe, peace pipe and cross with Native Americans at Lake Pepin, Lake Pepin on the backside. Um, it was it was moved um, in 1961 when the area where it was situated in downtown was redeveloped under urban renewal and it sat on a piece of land uh, at Fifth and Marshall um, for a long time. It was tw twice struck by cars and during the 1990s the Stano neighborhood uh, began to raise funds to restore it and move it and in, in fact they did so um, with the city of Minneapolis um, art and public places, um, with the MWMO, with uh, some regional park funding, um, or parks and trails proceeds, and the park board. Um, it was moved um, to its current location in 2010. The cost was, uh, at that time, was about $100,000. The move alone was probably more than $63,000, given the, the size of, of it. Um, we started seeing issues with this, with this um, more directly uh, last year, and we initiated with the Stano neighborhood a process where we could begin talking about a better interpretation of the statue. Um, those those uh, discussions have um, been expanded into the Parks for All Comprehensive Plan, um, where there's currently, I think, 61 recommendations related to this, to, to the idea of monumentation parks and art uh, in, in the system. Um, I think it's important that the discussions we've had with the neighborhood are still in progress and the neighborhood has suggested a desire to um, keep the monument in, in its place but to provide a more complete context, a more holistic story um, that shares other perspectives about what, um, contrary to what the, the monument uh, portends. Um, and the neighborhood, as you heard earlier from Ms. Grands, is pursuing funds that will allow us to develop a design, uh, working with shareholders and the Board of Commissioners. And even today when uh, Director Swenson and I were on site looking at the, the sculpture, and actually um, I want to note that even though this had been tagged uh, as recently as last night, our staff was out there by about 11.15 before we got there, and it uh, pretty much completely cleaned up any tagging that was on the, the monument. Um, the neighborhood uh, has suggested uh, at least well, we were talking to a representative of the neighborhood board that was out there that it be um, boxed and not moved or dismantled. Um, the box would essentially create a, a canvas for um, neighborhood or, or Northeast area artists to create um, some kind of inter interim story um, that might be a, a more holistic reflection of the neighborhood's perspectives um, through murals that would be on there until we can figure out what exactly uh, would be done. That, but that's the staff perspective, and I don't want to take anything away from uh, Commissioner Meyer who brought this item forward. Commissioner Meyer? President Kogo? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't feel that interpretation, like some kind of plaque, is ever going to be an adequate remedy for this. I mean, you can't see the plaque when you're driving by, but you can see the statue, and to me, the statue evokes manifest destiny and, and conquest and I'm, I'm just not interested in continuing to host it um, on park board land and I don't want to invest any more resources into it. Uh, I sit on the St. Anthony Falls Heritage Board and will oppose uh, directing money from there uh, toward this and um, there are a number of questions that we need to answer in order to be able to know like what best options we would have uh, for removing it. Um, and so I wanted to put forward um, a staff directive 
uh, in order to um, get, you know, direct them to gather that information. Uh, that would read, uh, direct staff to investigate removal options for the Pioneer statue at BF Nelson Park and report back to the board by July 1st, 2020. Um, and as to the, the date for that, um, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, can you confirm um, that you would be able to gather information by that point? I thought that's what you thought of the last time we spoke. Um, I'll just point out that by July 1st, we'll have a chance to report back to the board unless you're going to be having a special meeting. Um, we can begin to look at what the removal options are. A lot of it has to do with um, coordination with contractors for removal and whether removal means um, in, in a construction sense, the elimination or whether it means the, the movement of it to another location. Um, that, and, and finding a, a location between now and the early part of July would be a significant task, I, I would think. Um, the other thing, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to um, make light of the, the, the urgency that Commissioner Meyer is uh, bringing to this, but planning staff is busy and you're asking us to set aside other work to take this on. And so as we do that, I, I would help hope for some direction from the board about what other projects we might set aside while we investigate this. Uh, well, I don't have a particular recommendation to, for what to set aside. I mean, I would uh, be okay with extending to July 15th meeting if that um, was helpful. But what, what I see are basically three different options. If someone else, wants to step up and pay for the money to relocate it, then, you know, then they can do that. I don't want to host it on Park Board land anymore and I don't want to put more resources into that. So it'd have to be a private person who, who would, would do that. Um, the next option is that we could alter it and try to repurpose it, try to preserve the pedestal uh, for something else, or uh, we could demolish it altogether and based on my conversations uh, with Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, it will kind of depend on the material to determine whether um, the pedestal can be preserved. Um, but I do want to gather that information. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm willing to, to change that to July 15th. Um, but after other uh, commissioners have had a chance to discuss this, I'll uh, make my motion for that directive. Thank you. Commissioner Musich followed by Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Kogel. I guess I don't quite understand how this is on the full agenda rather than coming through the planning committee. Um, I also am perplexed why it is that we are unilaterally making decisions about things in parks without letting the community complete their discussions around what they would like to tell us about this particular piece of art. Um, it certainly sounds like the Neighborhood Association is having conversations about it, and it sounds as if park staff have been having conversations with the Neighborhood Association, as well as Native American community members. So I, I feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves by sh just uh, preventing the sort of public input that we would typically expect when we are making decisions about park assets. So if uh, Commissioner Meyer, who apparently is the impetus for this being on the agenda, could help me understand why we didn't talk about this in committee and I think planning committee is under your purview and then also why we feel that community input is not important in this situation. I would appreciate that. Thank you. President Gogo. Commissioner Meyer. This is a staff directive for how to spend resources to gather the information that we would need to present to the community for those options. The staff directive is different um, from, you know, other things that we would do um, for a, a motion that might come forward specifically to, you know, um, fund or, or otherwise, you know, um, make the removal happen, that would go through committee. So, but, but first, we need to direct the staff uh, to dedicate the time 
to gather the information that they need, and I feel it is entirely appropriate for that to go directly to the board. Vice President Vita. Okay, thanks for that. I just, I, I don't feel it's appropriate for us to move forward on this until we can hear from the community that's having this discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I share some of Commissioner Musich's concerns. Like, I feel like Commissioner Meyer just gave us, you know, his opinion on these things. Like, he's talking about it, like, as Commissioner Meyer, I don't know what community members think about this. We haven't had any type of public engagement. Like, we're talking about staff direction on this, and we have two other very big pressing um, issues on the agenda tonight. You know, we, we have the Park Police Resolution, and then we have the Powderhorn Resolution. It just, it just feels like too much to just throw this in here. And I, I mean, at this point, I really feel like we could um, deal with Powderhorn tonight and, and delay the police matter to another time. Um, thank you, uh, Vice President Vita. Um, do you have any other comments? No. Okay. Com um, Commissioner Severson, followed by Meyer for the second time. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, or excuse me, Commissioner Musich, for uh, mentioning that. I, I agree fully with you. And I'd be remiss if I didn't share uh, a phrase that uh, a mother here on the north side shared with me the other day. She told me urgency is a tool for white supremacy. So I, I think we should all take a step back and, and make thoughtful decisions and, and follow the process. Uh, and, and I don't know if, if, if this is a resolution on the table or if we can make a motion to table this. Uh, at this point, this is a discussion item. Uh, Commissioner Meyer for the uh, second time. Just to respond to those comments again this is I mean a staff directive there is not a resolution um, you know it's directing staff on on how to use their time to bring back information that will be useful to a community engagement process that we can do going forward um, but right now we don't have the information that we need and we kind of need to you know decide to gather that information um, like it's going to take them some effort to figure out if, um, you know, like the pedestal can be preserved and what kind of contractors are available. Uh, so I'm asking commissioners uh, to give this staff directive so that we can have this communication. This is not uh, removing the opportunity for people to have public input on this. Commissioner Forney. Um, thank you, um, President Colville. Um, I, I guess, particularly hearing staff saying that <laughs> their plate is more than full, um, we, we are, as I say to people, we're in several war zones right now. Um, I, I would like to defer to um, the community to um, move on their decision making on this, and I do not feel that it's something that we should be um, moving on. Um, as a board, and um, I hear the concern about it, and I respect that the Spano community will um, move forward in the appropriate way. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, Commissioner French. I am to something that I'm not too uh, versed in, and I would like to have some more information, but I don't know. If this is the time right now, we have so many other pressing issues on our plate. Uh, I would love to motion to table this staff direction to a time where it's more more conducive for us to have a real conversation about it. Right now, I think our minds, our hearts are on other issues right now. So I, I would I would love to talk about this in a more in a, in a, in a greater way. But like right now, we need to, there's other business we need to take care of. Thank you, uh, Commissioner French. I'm not seeing any other uh, commissioner comments. Um, commissioner Meyer, are you making a motion? Yes. Okay. 
MS, you had comments. Commit President Kogel. No. Are you ready for my Go motion? ahead. Okay, so I'd like to move to direct staff to investigate removal options for the Pioneer Statue of the FNL Center and report back to the board by July 15, 2020. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Uh, I will second the, the motion for purposes of discussion. Um, and I'll just speak to this. You know, I I agree. I think we should move on here. Um, I, I don't. I'm not seeing Commissioner Meyer. The the will. Of the, uh, there's some confusion here, and I think there's some work that needs to be done to ex explain some of the aspects of this uh, work. Um, so uh, I I, I would encourage us tabling this, but um, uh, if if not, then uh, I will uh, allow this vote to to go forward. Uh, Commissioner Musich. I'd like to move to table this motion, please. There's been a motion to table. Second. Uh, there's been a motion and a second. Second. Table. second. Uh, oh, four seconds. All right. The motion <laughs> has been has been made. I'll ask the secretary to please take the role on tabling uh, the uh, resolution. Commissioner Bourne, absent. Commissioner Musich, aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer? No. Commissioner Hassan? Aye. Commissioner French? Aye. Commissioner Forney? Aye. Vice President Vita? Aye. President Kogil? Aye. You have seven ayes, one nay, one absent. Right, that item is, is tabled. Uh, moving on to resolution 2020-252, which is a resolution directing staff to evaluate the budgetary impacts of certain potential changes to public safety in the Minneapolis park system by July 15th. Uh, resolution, is there a motion? So moved. Resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? A second. Hearing none, uh, not have a second on this item, and we will have to move on. Commissioner Musich, you have your hand raised. If we're not discussing it, then I don't need to say what I had to say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one more item uh, that was uh, amended onto the agenda, which is Resolution 2020-253. Uh, resolution declaring the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's commitment to provide refuge space to people currently experiencing homelessness while continuing to work with the state, county, city, nonprofit organizations, and other interested parties to identify long-term housing solutions for people at the Powderhorn Park encampment and other others throughout the city. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, I will perhaps speak to this uh, briefly before um, I have commissioners um, weigh in. Uh, this is a resolution that I worked with. Point of information, yeah. Jono, could we please see the resolution? Most of us have not even seen it since it's not part of our packet. Uh, certainly, I'll ask the secretary to share it on uh, the screen. Um, the uh, resolution was sent to all commissioners uh, this afternoon. Um, the resolution. Biden? What's that? Could you restate you what said you said? It was sent to us this afternoon. I have not seen this. Jennifer sent it before the meeting. The resolution uh, states uh, really many of the aspects of what we have, uh, our staff has already been doing and what we have uh, been discussing and been clear about um, working on for 
people experiencing homelessness right now in the city. To be clear to those watching, uh, uh, it's, it's my thought, and I, I've talked with other commissioners, that, that having such a resolution this week is important uh, because of all the work that's being done right now and clarifying the MPRB's role in that work. Um, we did not have a resolution on the agenda uh, due to the fact that the, uh, we set the agenda on Friday and a lot of uh, other uh, uh, developments happened over the weekend uh, with the Powderhorn Park site. Um, I uh, would call attention to, first of all, the fact that the, the governor's executive orders have already um, prevented the removal of homeless encampments um, uh, throughout the system. Um, and uh, this resolution uh, acknowledges that while also um, acknowledging that uh, we are not going to kick people out or evict people uh, while we're trying to work towards finding a uh, true solution uh, that uh, acknowledges everybody's uh, dignity uh, in the park system. Uh, the resolved clauses include um, a commitment to pro providing people currently experiencing homelessness refuge space in Minneapolis parks. Uh, it also commits to working with agency partners to identify housing solutions for those individuals. Uh, and it commits to adhering to the encampment response protocol that's been developed uh, with agency partners that superintendent has been working very diligently with partners to develop um, and uh, as well as uh, working uh, on following all the uh, executive orders um, pertaining to homelessness that were developed uh, with uh, Governor Walls's uh, orders. So those are the key pieces of this resolution. Uh, again, I think it is an important resolution for us to state our, our commitments here um, and be able to move forward uh, with community on finding solutions that are, that are long-term for our uh, unhoused neighbors. Uh, with that, I will uh, open it up for discussion. Commissioner Musage, followed by Meyer. Is David from the county still on the phone? Mr. Musich, I think that he exited. Okay. So the be it resolved that we're committed to providing people currently experiencing homeless refuge space in Minneapolis parks as some concerns around the way that this is supported. Um, it reads to me like an invitation for every homeless person in the state to move into a Minneapolis park. Uh, I wish we had someone on the line that has extensive experience with homeless populations to help me understand whether or not we are exacerbating the problem and crisis we are already experiencing by putting a message like that out there. Uh, Commissioner um, Meyer, I think I Don, Don Ryan might be online. Uh, he's from Hennepin County. Uh, Don, are you still on uh, line with us? He works directly with uh, David Hewitt. Oh, uh, I am here. Um, I still might have somebody. One second, continue. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Um, usage. I'm just trying to find if we have anybody online. My apologies. And, and this, this is David. I am still online. Hi, David. Did you hear my question or should I repeat it? Could you repeat it, please? Sure. We have a, a be it resolved line in this resolution that says, be it resolved that the MPRB is committed to providing people currently experiencing homelessness refuge space in Minneapolis parks. And when I read that, I read it as an invitation to every homeless person in the state of Minnesota to move into a Minneapolis park. I'm wondering, with your experience with this community, if that's the, the message that will be received or if this will be read as a message of compassion and not invitation to take up residence in a park here in Minneapolis. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, I, I, I fully understand. Your point. I mean, I think you know clearly there is a message of compassion here, um, which I think is incredibly positive. Um, I mean, I I cannot speak to how this might be communicated out or conveyed, um, and the potential ramifications of that. I think it's it's a legitimate concern. Uh, 
I mean, of course, as has already been highlighted, essentially the, the executive order that currently exists under the peace of emergency um, already sets out a similar condition and applying to all public land. Um, I think it's I think it's a, a legitimate concern when people are struggling to identify places to go. If um, if the park board has adopted this position, then this this will be an option, and people make choices within a framework of options. Okay, thank you. Um, I would prefer to see that we remove this be a resolved clause. We we already can't manage the problem that we have which is the volume of people that are not housed that have chosen to now move into the park system. We do not have the resources, we do not have the staff, we do not have the expertise to be able to sufficiently help the people we already have living in parks. And if we are, are inviting everyone that has no place to be to move into a park, we are essentially further digging the hole we are in deeper and making it harder to assist the people already um, taking shelter in our space. So I'm interested in hearing my colleagues' views on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, followed by Vice President Vita. Uh, thank you. Uh, I strongly support this resolution. Um, I don't support removing that whereas clause. I do have a different amendments uh, to add to it. Um, I would add a resolved clause, second to last resolved clause to be um, MPRB calls on the city, county, state, and federal governments to substantially increase funding to address the homelessness crisis. Uh, so that would you know, just make it clear that we're calling on all of our partners to step up. Um, this makes it more direct than it is elsewhere in the whereas clauses. Um, I'll go ahead and move that as a, a motion right now, actually. So uh, I'll read it again. Resolved MPRB calls on the city, county, state, and federal governments to substantially increase funding to address the homelessness crisis. Uh, I'll a, second it. An amendment has been moved uh, and seconded. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Commissioner uh, French. Uh, so, to the amendment, Commissioner French, followed by Vice President Vita. Yeah, yep. yeah. I, I was thinking. I, I, you know, this this is a this this uh, resolution. I think we need to look at it a little bit further. I think we need to limit which parks that we are considering sanctuary, so we don't exasperate the problem throughout the city. Maybe pick two or three locations, uh, and let's not concentrate them in the same part of the town. Maybe we can. You know, maybe one of the parks are in, is in more in a more affluent neighborhood, so it spreads it out, and we're not just putting all the folks in one side of town, or and we're not just opening it up for the whole for the whole system to be utilized as a as a homeless shelter. I don't know if any of my fellow commissioners would entertain the motion like that, but I uh, think that's what we should do. Well, I think we should limit it to the amount of parks that we that we're considering sanctuary. Th thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, we can consider that uh, as a separate time. At this point, we're considering Commissioner Meyer's amendment, uh, but we we certainly can consider that. Appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Vice President Vita to the amendment. Thank you, President Kogil. I'm not sure if my question or my comment fits with the amendment, but I wanted to make sure we add uh, the partner organization that has received upwards of $200,000 in the GoFundMe account that a lot of the um, residents were talking to me about. So I'm not sure if that fits in line with Commissioner Meyer's amendment to include uh, various bodies of government, but I think we, we need to make sure that we stay connected to the folks who are also receiving funding. Um, to support these sanctuaries. Uh, go -go. Yeah. I'll, uh, I, I, I would take a friendly amendment to add you know, um, nonprofit organizations to the list. If you have a specific organization that you would like to list, 
I mean, the organization that's listed on the GoFundMe is um, IX, I think is the acronym that's used. I mean, I want to be specific. I don't have the exact name, but I want to be specific that this organization who has uh, collected almost $200,000 for a go with, a, with GoFundMe to provide resources to this community is at the table, and we're working with them um, in collaboration with other agencies. Yeah, but it's not the only one, so I, I think it'd be good to have it as just a nonprofit organization. But how do you know it's a nonprofit? <laughs> just because you said it's a nonprofit doesn't make it one. Okay. I will take it as friendly if you come up with a broad term that encompasses like various different organizations that invo are involved. You can make a different amendment if you would like to. I would like to say organizations are collecting funds on behalf of uh, the folks at the sanctuary. Sure. That has been offered as a friendly amendment. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, you accept that? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, any more discussion on the amendment? Commissioner Severson to the amendment. No, not to the amendment, to the oh. main one. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Is there any more discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, uh, I'll say I'm in support of the amendment. I'll ask Secretary Ringgold to please take the roll on the amendment. Commissioner Bourne, absent. Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Abstain. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have seven ayes, one abstain, one absent. The amendment carries uh, back to the main motion. Uh, I think I just have Commissioner Severson. Thank you, President Cogill. Uh, I can't support this this evening the way it's written. Uh, there's too many questions. I have too many concerns. Um, I don't feel like there's been enough dialogue uh, with specific communities. Um, and, and most certainly, I want everyone to know in the world, I'm unapologetic about supporting our children's safety and well-being. Uh, I was hurt tonight to hear people say that our children can pass being in our parks um, because I most certainly disagree with that, specifically uh, in North Minneapolis. Our parks are going to be uh, safe sanctuaries for our children and teens and, and people on the north side uh, throughout the summer while we have no programming happening through our parks or schools or, or through other organizations. Uh, with that, I would motion, uh, make a motion to table this uh, and so there's more clarification um, and a, a more clear understanding for uh, commissioners and, and our community. Second. There has been a motion to table and a second. Is uh, That's not a debatable item. Um, Secretary Ringgold, will you please call the roll on tabling the resolution? Commissioner Bourne, absent. Commissioner Musich? Pass. Commissioner Severson? Aye. Commissioner Meyer? No. Commissioner Hassan? No. Commissioner French? <clears throat> no. Commissioner Forney? Aye. Vice President Vita? Aye. President Cogill? No. Commissioner Musich? Aye. You have four ayes, four nays, one absent. Uh, the resolution is wait, that, that fails, I believe. Um, so back to the main motion. Is there any other discussion? It's 
there any other discussion on the resolution? <laughs> Seeing none, uh, I'll just speak to this briefly. I, I'm hopeful that commissioners uh, would support this. Uh, I do believe that we are in an emergency situation in, in our discussions earlier tonight. Commissioners um, were expressing concern about the emergency situation that we are in. I think it behooves us as a board to take a uh, stance with a statement about what our priorities and principles are. Um, I do believe that uh, this statement will help empower staff uh, to understand what our, uh, our goals are here as well as our other partners. Um, and I don't believe that this is something that can wait until early July to be uh, worked out. Now, I understand that there are concerns about some of the semantics of the resolution. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we see the forest through the trees here um, and recognize that as that, that we are all in uh, this with a goal of getting people housed. Um, and that is really the intent here. We want to do it in a humane, in a humane way. Um, so with that, I'm seeing no other discussion. I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-253. Commissioner Bourne, absent. Commissioner Musich? Pass. Commissioner Severson? No. Commissioner Meyer? Aye. Commissioner Hassan? Aye. Commissioner French? Aye. Commissioner Forney? Aye. Vice President Vita? Aye. President Cogill? Aye. Commissioner Musich? No. You have six ayes, two nays, one absent. That carries. Um, moving on to petitions and communications, I'm going to start uh, with, we have a few uh, written petitions and communications and one uh, Council Rice did re uh, request to be, uh, be able to, to read himself. Uh, so I'll start with Council Rice and then move with two commissioners. Um, thank you, um, President Cogill. I just wanted to uh, call attention and make a, it, it's in um, the letter, but on uh, June 8th, um, my law firm became uh, Rice, Walther, and Mosley. Um, one of our partners, Jim Michaels, left the firm and he took all his law enforcement clients with him. Uh, Rice, Walther, and Mosley does no longer represents any uh, police unions. Um, now or in the future, uh, myself and Ann Walth are very excited to welcome Alana Mosley to our partnership. She's a very talented person. Um, and we look forward to working together, including on park board matters. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rice. Um, Commissioner uh, French. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to have him on him, but... Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Hassan. Yes. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, there were two near drownings in my district in the past 24 hours. I am heartbroken that this has happened. I am deeply concerned that we are providing a false sense of safety to people with the plan to staff beaches with lifeguards that we don't even know exist as staff. I don't know what the solution is, but I, to, to prevent situations from like, like this from occurring, but I would just implore residents to use extreme caution when entering water, particularly water that is not guarded. To refrain from using flotation devices in swimming areas and to be situationally aware of what's going on around you. Um, yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Severson. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, we are dealing with another crisis in Minneapolis, particularly North Minneapolis, and a crisis that often falls on deaf ears, and that's gun violence. Since the Park Board is taking up uh, issues and, and we're going to find ways to fund them, I plan to put something forward in the coming weeks to fund gun violence issues in North Minneapolis. It is a crisis. I hope that all of you will support it as much as we are supporting other crises in Minneapolis. I'm not going to look for a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. We are going to solve this issue, and I'm going to ask you folks to support me with millions of dollars to address the gun violence crisis in North Minneapolis. Please look out for my phone call because I can't wait to call. Since we all want to deal with crises, I'm excited that I'm sure you will all be on board. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Um, Commissioner uh, Forney. Yes. Commissioner Meyer. Yes. Vice President Vita. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. First, I want to uh, thank all the staff that have reached out to me with positive feedback in regards to the uh, wonderful video that President Cogill and I started, uh, you know, encouraging staff during this very difficult time. There was a battle of the hair in that video, and obviously President Cogill won. I was having a bad hair day, a somewhat bad hair day, not a totally bad day. But thank you to all the staff. It, it meant a lot for you all to send messages and um, I even saw someone yesterday in the park and I introduced myself and he said, I know your name. Oh, wait, you were in that video. So that was pretty cool. So thank you all again. Um, also, I want to thank all the folks, the hundreds, maybe even thousands of folks that reached out to me about the situation in Powderhorn. I got phone calls every day for the past four days from sun up to sundown. I answered as many phone calls as I could. I have not done a great job at answering emails. I'm still uh, going through emails from a previous issue that we had regarding the park board. So thanks to everyone who reached out. I'm sorry I couldn't answer all the phone calls and speak to everyone, um, but I did my best. And lastly, um, I want to encourage commissioners to go over to uh, the worst trailhead building, Mill Valley is open now. I was there last week. It was a great dinner. I took my nephew who was visiting for dinner. We tried the bison burger. I would suggest you take a blanket. Seating was very limited, but people are doing a great job at just laying out a blanket in the park and having a family picnic. So get over there if you can and um, check out Mill Valley at Worst Park. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Vita. Uh, it's very late. I just want to say thank you to commissioners for having a discussion on an item that I know was uh, quickly uh, just walked on the agenda. I think it was important, and I appreciate the time that was spent on it. Um, I recognize it's late, and I will uh, have us move on now to our two committees. So I will ask for now a motion to adjourn the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. So moved. A second. Resolute. <laughs> and a, a motion and a second. I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Or could we, could we just do this by acclamation? Uh, are, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all those in favor of, of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? I didn't think so. If that cares. Oh, you, I mean, you. you like in other organizations, what they've been doing is the president has just been declaring it adjourned. It's adjourned. You, thank like thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Vote can't be, though. Thank you, Commissioner. Don't we have to do a roll call for all votes, including our adjournment? Per That's the why rules? it can't be a vote, but the president can just declare it adjourned. I have declared that it is adjourned, and I will turn this over to Commissioner Meyer for the planning committee. Okay. Thank the time you. Being, mm -hmm, time being 1031. Yeah, I call to order the planning committee. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Mm. Present. Commissioner French. Present. 
Present. President Cogill. Present. Vice Chair Forney. Here. Chair Meyer. Here. You have a quorum. Sorry, and I'm not able to pull up. Do we have minutes? Or sorry, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Sorry. So moved. Uh, Secretary, please take the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. Here. Here. Um, all right, do you approve the agenda? Aye. Commissioner, or er, President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Commissioner Meyer, or Chair Meyer. Aye. Aye. You have five ayes. That carries. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 20th, 2020? So moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice Chair Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. You muted. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. Or sorry, Vice Chair Forney. Chair um, Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Thank you. So do we still have uh, Carrie Christensen and, and Kathleen Mayel from the city to present to us on this? Chair Meyer, we do. We're still there. Hello. Great. Oh. So if you can keep it to like less than two hours or so. <laughs> we will try. Um, Secretary Ringles, I think you have our presentation. Thank you so much for hearing from us tonight. Uh, we're here to talk about the tran transportation action plan um, that has been a project the city of Minneapolis um, has been working on for a couple of years now. And um, I'm here to introduce Kathleen Mayel in uh, leading the effort. And um, if you advance to the next slide, we, they were, they've been very patient with us in getting on, this on, on the agenda for all of you to look at. I believe their public comment period closed, you know, sometime in May, maybe even in late April. And I'm really appreciative of them still um, opening, sort of extending um, our to be able to get our comments to them. So, so the goal of tonight's presentation is to give you a quick overview of the Transportation Action Plan, um, share a, a brief snapshot of what some of the staff comments are, um, and then just to get the sort of you starting to think about what your feedback, feedback might be. The plan is to then come back to you um, with a, a list of, of commissioner comments, um, but I'll definitely be collecting any of those either tonight in our discussion or by email over the next couple of weeks. So thank you, um, Chair Meyer and commissioners. We're happy to be here. Um, so I've been sitting on the, the technical advisory committee for the project for the last um, year or two. And then we have also had as part board staff on several of the topic specific work groups, including the walking, biking, and design. So without further ado, Kathleen, thank you so much for hanging on tonight. We're happy to have you. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me all tonight. Thank you, Chair Meyer and Commissioners. My name is Kathleen Mayo. I am a Transportation Planning Manager in the City of Minneapolis Public Works. And I'm also joined by my boss, Jennifer Hager, who's the Director of Transportation Planning and Programming. She may jump in as well. So. This is, uh, I think, officially the latest I've ever given a presentation to a committee, so <laughs> good evening. Um, and yeah, if you could advance to the next slide, please. This is um, a quick overview. Carrie already covered the role, um, and we'll just jump right in. So start with context. Next slide, please. So the draft transportation action plan um, comes out of Minneapolis 2040, the city's comprehensive plan, um, which was passed last year in December. Transportation was one of 11 topic areas, and there were really four main themes that came out of that planning effort related to transportation. 
They were a focus on environment and reducing single occupancy vehicle and greenhouse gas emissions, commitment to safety and ending traffic fatalities and severe injuries, equity and looking at equitable outcomes for all people, and increasing multimodal options within the city. So Minneapolis 2040 is our starting point that defines what we want to accomplish, and then the Transportation Action Plan defines how we plan to get there. And supporting that multimodal network. Next slide, please. Kathleen, you're cutting out. Um, okay. There we go. Like, That's better. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's okay. Um, hopefully that, let me know if it happens again. Um, okay. Next slide, please. Are you all hearing? Next yep. Slide? Okay, thanks. Oh, next slide. Mm -hmm. um, as we're advancing the slide, um, the I'll just start talking to it. And as it advances on the screen, you all can see it. Um, so the Transportation Action Plan has a 10-year horizon compared to Minneapolis 2040 is a 20-year horizon. So this looks at the first 10 years of that vision and how are we going to get there. Um, is the slide advancing for you all? We're on the slide that says planning context. Okay. For some reason, mine's not advancing, but great. That's where we should be. Um, thank you. So the plan is not fiscally constrained in order to really open up the vision of what um, we want to accomplish in light of citywide goals. And there are a number of policies that frame up the work of the Transportation Action Plan. They're Minneapolis 2040, our complete streets policy, which prior. I'm cutting out again, Kathleen. Prioritizes people walking and biking in transit. And then Kathleen, you cut out. You're going to have to start over. Okay. Um, I start over. Better. Where? Sorry. Can I ask? Maybe the framing of the other policies, I think, is where you broke up. Is that right, Commissioner Musich? Okay. Yeah, um, I heard three. complete streets, and then she cut out. Okay. okay, sorry about that. Hopefully, this is a better connection now. Um, another one is Vision Zero, um, which is the commitment to ending traffic fatalities and severe injuries on our streets and our climate action plan, which um, looks at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then all of the actions within the plan are either do or support, and the ones that are do are led by the city. Support is in partnership, so we'll get to some of that in a minute. Um, next slide, please. There are two related planning efforts um, that happen kind of concurrently, our Vision Zero action plan development and our ADA um, transition plan for public works. We collaborated with the park board on both of those efforts as well in terms of engagement and um, we had different staff supporting our advisory committee for Vision Zero. Um, Cecile Ali and Adam Arvidsson both participated in that and we coordinated on the ADA plan. Um, and, and so these plans work in tandem with one another. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. To go over a bit of the timeline and what where we've been, we used Minneapolis 2040 as our starting point. There were hundreds and thousands of comments gathered about transportation, used that as our starting point, had some light touch engagement at different city events in the summer of 18, and did the bulk of our outreach um, January through June of 2019. We partnered um, with our neighborhood community relations team and held um, specific cultural group conversations um, with different communities throughout the city. We also um, actually using the park board, uh, a park board model and um, that the planning group had used did a similar process and contracted with six different um, community organizations, artists and neighborhood organizations to help extend our reach. And they hosted over 30 events 
um, during that time as well. So um, conservatively, we think we engaged with over 3,000 people during that time. And then um, this last phase is March 9th, we released the draft transportation action plan and had a comment period open through the end of May. Next slide, please. This is a question we asked um, often, not at all of our events. This represents 300 uh, people, more than 300 people's response to what would transform transportation in Minneapolis over the next 10 years. Transit was by far what we heard the most about in terms of um, that phase of engagement and really people looking for more service, more frequent, um, safer, more affordable. So wanted to share that overarching feedback we got. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so there are six goals that frame up and align with our um, Minneapolis 2040 goals. Um, they are climate, safety, equity, prosperity, mobility, and active partnerships. And next slide, please. Um, the ACT partnership is obviously a critical one for this audience. Um, we had agency partnership throughout the development of the TAP, and we also, um, in order to reach the vision outlined in the Transportation Action Plan, certainly partnerships will be critical moving forward as um, different agencies have crucial roles in how streets function within the city of Minneapolis. Um, as an underlying baseline, we respect the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities of our jurisdictional partners. Um, we do plan on using the Transportation Action Plan and an associated uh, street design guide, which we're developing in tandem to this plan to inform how City of Minneapolis staff, um, Public Works would approach street projects within the city. And this is uh, just showing the breakup of streets. Um, so the park board has uh, just over 2% of streets in Minneapolis. Next slide, please. The plan is broken up into seven different topic areas, um, walking, bicycling, transit, technology, freight, street operations, and design. Notable is that um, transit, technology, and freight are all um, comprehensively, this is kind of the first time the city has really focused on those three topic areas. Um, and so compared to our previous transportation action plans called Access Minneapolis. Next slide, please. There were four priority networks um, developed with the Transportation Action Plan. And uh, this obviously is too small to see here, but um, our pedestrian priority network, our all ages and abilities network, which is the bicycle and micro mobility network. We identified transit priority projects and um, the truck route network. And as Carrie mentioned in the beginning, different staff from MPRB who were uh, on our work groups helped in the development and refinement of, in particular, the pedestrian priority network and the all ages and abilities network. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. I'm just gonna share 10 highlights here on the plan. First is to reach a mode share goal, three of five trips taken by walking, biking, or transit. Um, improving experience of walking and rolling, notably um, some actions around creating a pedestrian plaza program, including pedestrian scale lighting on street reconstruction projects, and really focusing on safer street crossings, realizing a city light transit vision um, as a part of that expanding. So we set a goal to expand transit coverage so that um, a lot of our residents, 75% of them are within a five minute walk and 90% are within a 10 minute walk, about a quarter mile, half mile. Um, radius there, and then that we're then looking to implement transit advantages along those corridors. The fifth one, look at street design, use street design to provide a more comfortable and healthier environment. This includes um, green infrastructure actions, as well as um, more trees within our street projects. Next slide, please. Um, so the next five and last five plan highlights are acting quickly to improve our streets, not always waiting for that street reconstruction project. The increase in our bicycle or all ages and abilities network is nearly twofold and there's a real focus on protection and low stress network for system users. We plan to update our complete streets policy to include freight, micro mobility and green infrastructure. We also plan to adopt a strong curbside management policy, looking at how that space at the curb is prioritized and valued. 
And finally, implementing a network of mobility hubs throughout the city, um, using transit as the backbone where people can connect to different shared transportation options, bikes, scooters, and cars. Next slide, please. So a bit um, more intentional focus here on actions and strategies that relate to the park board. Next slide, please. Um, the walking and bicycling strategies of note that I wanted to highlight here, um, the pedestrian priority network in general is, um, uses the trail system, many of which are park boards as critical connections to our pedestrian priority network. They're separate, but um, it's a critical connection there. Um, and then, so in terms of walking, there's a strategy around ensuring policies and practices support consistent access to the sidewalk. Um, and one action in particular there is looking at um, all the sidewalk gaps and prioritizing filling in of those gaps near parks and other public destinations. And then there's, and another, yes? Is there a question or? Okay, um, I've got five different biking strategies here. One is really completing that all ages and abilities network in the next 10 years. Um, that includes nine miles of trails, 136 miles of newer upgraded bikeways, 79 miles of protected bikeways and 48 miles of new neighborhood greenways. Um, biking, another strategy two here is looking at connections over significant physical barriers, um, looking at um, adding bike lanes on existing bridges over the Mississippi River or railroad corridors, freeways and expressways, um, partnering with others to look at a new non-motorized bridge over 94 between uh, Lowry and Dowling, somewhere along there, connecting North Minneapolis over to the river. Um, then there's the greenway strategy, um, which would include stormwater infrastructure elements and public realm improvement. Um, and I'm just going over this real high level. I know it's late and not a lot of time. So, um, and then the bicycling strategy five, um, looking at connections to regional destinations um, is one example of a, a new connection potentially would be extending the Midtown Greenway across the Mississippi River. And then um, finally, the last strategy on expanding um, education and encouragement. Next slide, please. There are four bicycling actions that refer to the park board. Um, three of them are support actions and one is due and they're uh, up on the screen. So I won't read them verbatim, but looking at um, coordinating on, with our CIP um, with your planning sorry, with your CIP work and our planning, um, looking at evaluation of one-way trail operations to potentially two ways, looking at the transportation benefits there, um, supporting the work of completing the ground rounds missing link. And then the last one is on open streets and how we can continue to evolve and sustain that effort um, of open streets. And obviously there's been work done um, with the Stay Healthy Street collaboration with you all as well since COVID began. And I think there's one more slide here, please, of strategies. Also in the design section, there's um, a number of strategies of note for the park board. Um, first, the fostering vibrant public spaces for street life. This is where we see things like the pedestrian plaza program, um, exploring opportunities for car-free streets. The strategy three is about carbon reduction design elements. And here um, really having those practices be reflected in our street design guide um, and be relating best practices of environmental stewardship within our street design um, and reducing negative environmental impacts by decreasing the amount of asphalt or concrete and in favor of increasing green space. And then the fourth one here, green the streets, um, looking at stormwater infrastructure and inclusion into our street projects, um, native plantings, reducing runoff. And then um, we collaborated with Carrie here on this 4.2 about the tree canopy coverage and achieving 40% tree canopy and supporting that effort. Um, those are those strategies. Next slide, please. 
just wanted to share two different um, metrics we're planning on using moving forward. One is that mode shift goal that I talked about. So here's 2010 to 2030 numbers and where we are hoping to um, adjust travel patterns based on these improvements. Next slide, please. And then this is the greenhouse gas reduction goal um, from the transportation sector, which currently is 24% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the city. Next slide, please. That's what I've got. There's another slide that follows this with a summary that I think Carrie's going to take over for staff comments. Is that right, Carrie? Yeah, thank you. Yep, thanks, Kathleen. Thank you um, all. Well, before we open it up for questions and comments, um, the next this slide just is a, is a brief summary of we've had. Uh, so not only the, the three staff that served on the committees over the last year or two, but um, we've had staff from across the agency review the several iterations of the draft. Um, and so with this, this formal draft review process, these are our high level um, comments. And um, so, a little bit more clarity around partnership. We are named as a partner in the beginning with a recommendation, um, support for a number of elements. It's a really exciting plan. I think it's very visionary and um, I'm very excited about it. Um, I think things like seeing the city really name um, supporting stormwater treatment in the city streets is a super exciting development. Um, we I think thinking about parks and access and the way that People access neighborhood parks, especially um, in our citywide survey. We noted recently, um, just in the last year, that so many people access our neighborhood parks on on foot or don't rely on cars to get to those neighborhood parks. And so, really trying to strengthen language around improving access to and along parks on foot and bike, um, amplifying parks as key destinations on foot and bike. Um, is something that's inter of interest to us and um, exploring the idea of safe routes to parks. Uh, we'd like to carefully consider the role and charter of the park board um, in, with the city as they explore this idea of a plaza program further, um, strengthening holding the bike and scooter share programs accountable regarding operations burden on, on agencies like ours that manage the public realm, removing or changing actions that are fully in PRB jurisdiction, um, needing to find shared language on parkway, um, periodic or temporary closures, something that we as an agency have been sort of pro prototyping during COVID, um, and that parkways should not necessarily be held to city street design standards, just making sure there's clarity around that. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, just the urban tree canopy and the right of way and that uh, MPRB jurisdiction and language need to reflect our policy. Um, and, but again, like, just, I think it's a really strong plan and we're excited about this draft and excited to bring it to you tonight amidst all of the things going on in our world. So thank you for spending some time with us on this um, long-term topic. We, I, my hope is that we can get um, you know, this before you tonight. And then uh, I'd love to bring a letter for you to review to the next board meeting if possible. So um, I'd like to open it up for questions and. Um, comments now. I think the next slide is our closing, um, Secretary Ringgold, if there is a next slide. Um, and then um, if, if you have additional comments, if there's any way to get them to me by this Friday, that would be fabulous. And I could get a letter to you at the next meeting to review and hopefully approve so that we can get our comments formally submitted to the city. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Bye. Commissioners, do you have questions or comments that you would like to see included in the letter? Not seeing any hands raised at this time, but I just want to say I agree with you, Carrie. I think this is a really outstanding visionary plan. Um, I want to, to, our letter to have some really glowing praise of what the city staff have done and uh, to tell them that it, you know, it can't be implemented fast enough. Um, I think what you have in your slideshows is um, all in the right direction um, for what we would want to uh, include in, in the letter. I think we, I want to um, support um, especially the parts that have been relevant to parks. Um, there is one that I didn't see in your presentation uh, that I, I do think is very relevant to the parks and that is 
uh, reducing salt usage. Um, and, and they do make reference to their, that in their design section, um, where they you know try to minimize it. But I, I really uh, um, appreciate having some more description of how they're going to reduce um, salt pollution, like training city employees, or or I, I don't know what other options there are, but um, that has a really big impact on the parks when they overuse salt that gets into our water. So I would like to have really strong action on that. Uh, I Great. see Great. Commissioner Corny has her hand raised. Commissioner Corny. Thank you. Oh, just had to make sure I was unmuted. Um, it, first of all, I just apologize. I'm brain dead right now. I really would like to have the whole um, presentation sent to us. And did you say, Carrie, by this Friday you want to have? That is the hope, given we're so weird. Okay. We got, because of curfew last time, we were you know, our agenda. We weren't able to come to you last time and all the other things happening in our world. So no, um, no problem. I just need to know what it was. Okay. So if you can send the presentation to us, we'll do. we can mm -hmm. review it. I'd appreciate it. Um, excellent and exciting, but uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. And thank you, uh, Kathleen, for sticking with us so late. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Thank so much. Secretary, please call the roll. Or no, wait, I'm, I'm just going to declare it adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Wait a minute. We have another meeting. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Forney, yeah, I'm giving you the planning committee is adjourned. Now you go to admin. Thank you. But I, I'm not on admin, so good night. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to call the admin and finance uh, committee to um, order. Would the secretary please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Present. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner French. Here. Vice Chair Hassan. Uh, here. Chair Forney. Here. You have a quorum. Um, I'll take I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Chair Forney, if I may. Can oh, you yes. Resolution 2020-247 before you approve the agenda. Okay. Um, uh, so minus uh, that um, item, um, Secretary, please call the roll. <laughs> Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five I ayes. That we do. Thank you. I do believe that we do have um, minutes. Um, is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the uh, minutes of I'll something move. or other. Secretary, would you please uh, call the roll? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Okay. <laughs> and I'm, I don't see the agenda or the um, in front of me, so. Um, Thank you. Okay, um, I'll take a motion to um, move resolution 2020-248, resolution approving change order number three with JPMI construction contract number COM 00009094 for the Worth Chalet Water Intrusion Remediation Project at Theater Worth Regional Park in the total amount of $17,123 for a new contract of $389,046. So moved. Secretary, would you please call the roll? Do you want to ask if there's discussion? Yeah. I am brain dead, thank you. Any discussion on this item? Not hearing any? The secretary, please call the roll. Vice Chair Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. 
Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. Five ayes. I'll take a motion then to approve the next resolution. Resolution 2020 dash, uh, I would like to move to resolution 2020 249, a resolution approving change order number three with Sheehy Construction Company, contract number COM 1922 for the 26th Avenue North Overlook and Shoreline Enhancement in the amount of $133,259.72 for a new contract total of $1,444,732.50. And could whoever's driving or in their car or whatever, please put themselves on mute. Any discussion on this item? Any questions that anybody has? Hearing none, uh, would the secretary please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. You're muted. Commissioner French. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. You have five ayes. I'll take a motion to um, move the next. It resolution. is with great pleasure that I move resolution 2020 250. It's a resolution awarding a construction contract to Custom Builders Inc. in the amount of $631,706. For Elliott Park Phase Two Skate Plaza per bid event number 961, pending approval by the City of Minneapolis Procurement Division and Civil Rights Department, and authorizing administrative use of a 10% construction contingency up to $63,170 for necessary construction change orders that may arise with the contract and amending the 2020 Capital Improvement Plan to include 237 thousand five hundred and three dollars and sixty cents from the Elliott Park neighborhood portion of the parkland dedication <laughs> any discussion on this item I, Commissioner Music thank you um, several years ago we adopted the skate park activity plan and we didn't dedicate any money to implementation city of skate really stepped up to help make sure that we were able to start making that happen. And I am so incredibly thankful to them for their advocacy and fundraising work that have helped make this possible. Um, so keep up the good work, folks. We look forward to seeing more of these show up on our future agendas. And uh, I really hope the skaters like what we're putting in place for them. So that's what I got, thanks. Any other discussion or questions? Hearing none, will the secretary please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five eyes. Thank you. Uh, next resolution we will move on to. Somebody like to move that? I'll move resolution 2020-251, resolution approving a donation agreement between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and support the courts related to construction and donation of the Morgan Avenue tennis courts located in Minnehaha Re Parkway Regional Trail, a part of the Minneapolis Park system. Any questions or discussion on this item? Hearing none, will the secretary please call the roll? Vice, Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French.
You're muted. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Moving on then to the next resolution. Is there one? That's the end of our agenda online. Is it? Thank you. I can't see the agenda. So, um, I think you can adjourn us. I will um, adjourn the Admin and Finance Committee. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good night. Sleep Thank well. Bye. Good night. Good night, all.